The darkness enveloped him as he found himself suddenly transported to a place he had never imagined. He was in hell, with nothing but his desire to live and a primal ability to hunt and consume. With each passing moment, he grew stronger, absorbing countless demons as he climbed from the first to the ninth circle of hell. Even the most powerful demons, the seven great dukes of hell, bowed down to him. After 10,000 years, he returns to Earth. Welcome to the Hell of Nine Skies, the deepest depth of hell, a treacherous landscape where only the strongest demons gather. The environment is immeasurably hostile, with an ever-burning path of fire, molten lava capable of incinerating anything, a twisted and unpredictable terrain, and a blood-red sky. The strongest demons congregate here, engaging in eternal battles, probably not the ideal vacation destination. As we observe this chaotic realm, a horned ogre like demon with an incredibly muscular and menacing physique emerges, giving chase to a red lion demon soaring through the crimson skies. The ogre demon forcefully punches the ground, causing it to rupture, but the red lion demon gracefully evades the attack. In retaliation, the red lion demon lands a devastating counterblow to the ogre demon's face, sending him hurtling through the debris and lava. I hope the demon has insurance for this kind of thing. Despite the devastating blow, the ogre demon, known as the great demon Gargas, remarkably remains standing, visibly disappointed and enraged at the red lion demon, who is revealed as the renowned figure, great demon Balak of the Ninth Hell. The stage is set for a one-on-one -on -one battle between the two great demons, Gargas and Balak, as they continue to ravage the landscape with their ferocious attacks. Place your bets, folks. We witness the fierce Balak execute a skydiving maneuver that culminates in a powerful punch sending Gargas hurtling to the ground once again. The battle intensifies, and the end seems imminent. Balak stood in the crater of his destruction when something caught his attention. Suddenly, small one-eyed demon clones of Gargas materialize out of thin air to pin Balak down, catching him off guard. That's a cheap shot, man. Gargas then unleashes his most formidable attack yet, but fails to connect. It becomes apparent that Balak cannot be held down by such petty tricks. The fists ablaze with the flames of hell itself, Fueled by hatred and rage, Balak tears through the chest of the great demon Gargas with a single strike, ending the life of one of the nine Hell's great demons. In this unending fight for the title of the strongest, they believed there would never be a victor. That is until someone else appeared, until he appeared. Wait, is there someone out there even stronger than these freaky demons? In a dark and ominous castle, a gathering of thousands of grotesque and sinister demons is taking place. These demons, trembling with fear, kneel on one knee as they gaze forward, amidst the haunting silence. We even see a familiar figure, a demon over five meters tall and had his skin covered with red fur. His muscular body was as sturdy as stone, and on his forehead, he had horns that resembled a goat. He had sharp, protruding molars and giant bat wings on his back. He, what had the typical appearance of a demon, was kneeling fearfully in front of someone. That's our boy, Balak. In the center of the castle sits the throne of the supreme ruler, beneath the skull of an incomprehensible monster. The Demon King, Zenith of all demons, resides here, having unified the previously divided seven factions of Hell. The Demon King sits on a throne made of the bones of the strongest demons he has slaughtered. He is a man wearing a terrifying helmet burning with a grim purple flame and dark armor of powerful proportions, with dragon heads protruding from his shoulders. He exudes a breathtakingly strong demonic energy. Balak, who is known to be unbeatable except for the Archdukes, is terrified as he approaches the Demon King to ask why he wants to return somewhere after conquering everything in Hell. What a badass Demon King introduction man. The Demon King responds in silence, making Balak and the thousands of demons in the castle uneasy and terrified. The demonic energy surrounding the Demon King becomes more intense as his power, the authority of predation, is released throughout the whole place. Balak takes a step back in fear of being devoured by this power. The authority of predation can absorb the bodies and abilities of any demon it touches. The Demon King has devoured all the demons of the Hell of Nine Skies, making him the peak of all evil. Damn, talk about overpowered. The thousands of lowly demons tremble in fear of incurring the wrath of their king. Would they feel the pressure of the authority of predation? The only thing in their minds is that they are about to be eaten. The Demon King, dissatisfied with his current situation, begins to speak. He has everything when it comes to the deepest depths of Hell. But he has lost 10,000 years living in this unchanging scenery, day-to-day -day life of slaughter. He slowly removes his helmet, revealing his appearance as a young man with dark hair and red eyes. We are introduced to our main character, the peak of all evil, Zenith of all demons, the Demon King, Okangwu. 
Balak, his loyal subordinate, misinterprets O Kang Wu's dissatisfaction as hunger and orders the demons to prepare food for him. The lesser demons quickly comply and carry a huge, covered plate for O Kang Wu to devour. For a show of loyalty, Balak slowly opens the cover and reveals the head of Fokaler, the one who was leading the largest remaining army of the Archduke. It was a grotesque head resembling an octopus with its tentacles and blue slime oozing around it. They could have at least cooked it, no? In a fit of rage, Okangwu threw the head back at Balak and cursed him out after seeing the unappetizing meal that the demon prepared for him. Enraged, he releases demonic energy and declared that he wants to eat kimchi stew. The surrounding demons began murmuring the words they just heard from the king, kimchi stew, and started cheering for it. Balak chimed in and offered to take the head or organs of whatever or whoever kimchi stew is made of. Okangwu cursed them out after hearing this absurd imagination, as he knew that meat was an ingredient of the kimchi stew, but probably not what the demons were imagining. Bro's about to go to war and slaughter for kimchi stew. Okangwu sighed at his rowdy demons and thought that explaining what food was to them made no sense, since they had never grasped the concept of meals. Food was nothing more than the authority you had over the loser if you won a battle. Balak interjected that O Kangwu had been bored lately because there was no entertainment. He attributed it to the fact that his lord had killed all seven Archdukes and had become bored with slaughter. The demons started cheering for their bloodthirsty king. Frustrating O Kangwu even more since all the entertainment he wanted was manwas and novels. He's just like me for real. Balak and the horde of demons started solemnly kneeling. For they could not satisfy the demon king with all their remarkable powers combined. Balak even went as far as asking Okangwu to take his life for not being enough. With a desperate expression, Kangwu muttered that if he at least had a loved one here, it wouldn't be so bad. We then hear a sultry voice from the crowd of demons, offering herself to Okangwu. The queen of Succubai and the greatest beauty in hell, Lilith, captivated every single demon in the castle. Succubai, sign me up. She expressed her dissatisfaction for Okangwu not being satisfied with having her heart. We eventually see her crying in every single one of her ten eyes, with her tentacles for hair stretching out everywhere. It was at this moment that Okangwu finally broke. Condolences, brother. Lilith insisted on finally being the Kangwu tonight. Kangwu then ordered her as the king not to come to him tonight out of fear. Lilith takes this as Kangwu just being coy and shy. Lilith stretched out her slimy tentacles and gripped Kangwu's arm. The demon king's disgust was visible in his face. But the demon horde either blush or are jealous seeing the sight of Lilith interacting with Kangwu. Kangwu's disappointment is immeasurable. The succubi that are the beautiful women from the stories he'd heard are far from reality. Kangwu does everything in his power to get out of the terrifyingly seductive grasp of Lilith. From his point of view, Lilith looked more grotesque than Balak. No eye exams in hell, I guess. He thought that outer appearance wasn't important in terms of love, but still, this is too much. This wasn't a matter of whether she was pretty or ugly. Her outer appearance just didn't fit human aesthetic standards. With all this happening, Kangwu clenched his fist with a desperate expression with only one word, Earth. He needs to return to Earth. This shocked Balak and Lilith. His decision was firm, despite his underlings having tried to convince him for 10,000 years. No, them trying to convince him only made his decision firmer. After a long 10,000 years in hell, his preparations have been completed after consuming the final Archduke, Baal. Kangwu gripped his throne. It's finally time. Here we go. The demon king is descending, or rather ascending, to earth. He stood up and walked the hall of his castle. It's time for him to reap the rewards of his 10,000 year struggle. He turned and ordered Balak to prepare that thing. Balak's doubt was apparent as he sought confirmation from Kangwu, but the demon king simply responded by unleashing his vast amount of demonic energy, staring at Balak with disdain and not bothering to repeat himself. Balak quickly kneeled to apologize for his actions, and then hastened to prepare for what was to come. Never make the king repeat himself, bro. We see Balak commanding the thousands of demons in the horde to prepare the equipment of the seven Arctuks and call on someone named Amon. The demonic horde promptly obeyed Balak's orders with unwavering conviction. In a dark and ominous cavern, a witch doctor like figure with a menacing staff emanating death stood amongst a number of horned stone statues, each of them holding an artifact in their hands. This must be the equipment of the seven Arctuks. Kang Wu, Balak and Lilith stood at the bottom of the stairs leading to a sinister altar in the middle of the stone statues. Balak informed Kang Wu that everything had been set and prepared. Kang Wu started walking towards the stairs. Lilith couldn't help but shed a tear as she knew what her demon king was about to do. And even Balak started to shed tears at the sight of Kang Wu's figure walking away. 
Come on, man. You made the kitty cat cry. We see Kang Wu removing his imposing armor and leaving it on the floor, revealing a figure of pure muscle, evident from fighting and conquering for 10,000 years. 10,000 years of hellish workout pays off. The witch doctor greeted Kang with the stairs and instructed him to push a great amount of demonic energy into the equipment of the seven Archukes, warping the boundaries of space and time and forcibly opening a dimensional fissure. This witch doctor is revealed to us as the dark magician, Amon. There's only one true dark magician. Everyone knows that. Kang took note of the instructions and immediately proceeded. In his mind, the only thing that mattered now was going home. In front of the altar, a physical manifestation of his demonic energy began pouring out. His aura took on the appearance of a menacing purple smoke. He started to feel the space around him, and his demonic energy became so condensed that it turned into a purple ocean around the space. The sea of purple oceanic demonic energy started to solidify into a sphere of remarkably pure demonic energy, Kang Wu's very own 10,000 demon energy core. After an eternal silence, a single drop was heard. Release. Kang Wu's 10,000 demon energy core exploded and a burst of demonic energy could be seen everywhere. We see Amon being overwhelmed by ecstasy just from being near and witnessing the 10,000 Demon Energy Core in all its glory. The 10,000 Demon Energy Core Flex is fire. The demonic energy emanating from Kang Wu caused the eyes of the stone statues surrounding him to glow with the same hue. Amon confirmed that the seven Archduke's equipment was reacting to Kang Wu's power, and the gate would soon open. As Kang Wu warped the boundaries of space and time, we heard his thoughts. Even if he returned to Earth, his family, friends, and lover would not be there. Writing the field's brother, but anything was preferable to the literal deepest depths of hell where he currently stood. The gate cracked open, and Kang Wu strode toward his new conquest. Before he entered the gate, Lilith and Balak called out to him, pleading with their king not to abandon them. Kang Wu simply responded with the words, do not cry, out of fear of seeing the appearance of a crying succubus. Lilith, head over heels for the demon king, misinterpreted it as a gentle attempt to ease her pain. In her excitement, she began to spurt liquid from her tentacles, screaming to Kang Wu that she wanted to go with him. Run Kang Wu, run. Without hesitation, Kang Wu jumped through the gate. Lilith shouted that she would follow him no matter what, but Kang Wu responded by turning around mid-fall and flipping off Lilith, Balak, and Hell itself with a smug smile. He never wanted to see them again or return to that place. Ladies and gentlemen, the pinnacle of evil himself. As he fell through the time and space dimensional fissure, he pondered his 10,000 years in hell. He realized he had no past he wanted to change or future he wanted to go to. He'd take anything that looked and felt like the earth he knew. I hope everything goes smoothly. As Kang Wu fell through the endless void of the dimensional fissure, he eventually landed beside a glowing blue orb in a futuristic looking room. Relief washed over him as he smiled at the prospect of finally going home. However, his joy was short-lived as the blue orb changed to red emitting electrical currents. Red is definitely bad. A notice popped up, stating that the Gaia system was detecting the fissure's nucleus. Red laser lines appeared, seemingly trapping Kang Wu in the room. He was utterly bewildered by what was happening. Warning notifications began to appear, stating that the power of the nucleus exceeded the system's limit, causing the activation of defense mechanisms across all dimensions. Kang Wu's mere existence had overloaded the Gaia system, prompting the defense system to fire a red lightning shock at him. But the system failed to eliminate the fissure's nucleus, and a prompt appeared stating that it was impossible to do so. That's an extremely tough nucleus. Throughout the process of the system trying to eliminate him, Kang Wu gritted his teeth. Eventually, the system opted to initiate a restricted sealing as it failed to eliminate the Demon King. Kang Wu screamed in anger as he was being sealed but was eventually knocked out by the system. Looks like the commute to Earth is kinda rough. As Kang Wu regained consciousness, he found himself lying on a grassy plain. Opening his crimson eyes, he saw a dense forest beyond the bushes. He felt relieved to be home, although his body ached with pain. To understand his situation, he checked his status and a window appeared, confusing him. The window showed his name, O Kang Wu, and stated that he was a level 1 of the first stage awakening. It also revealed that his first stage awakening attribute was the authority of predation, but the rank was unknown. His second stage awakening attribute would only be revealed at level 10. He had an unknown innate class and his innate stat was demonic energy. Status windows is only gonna get more and more crazy from here on out. As he pondered his situation, an unpleasant sound like scratching iron caught his attention. When he turned towards the noise, he was startled by a group of goblins wielding weapons, rushing towards him like he was their prey. 
Kangol was confused by what he saw, realizing that the Earth he knew didn't have creatures like these goblins. Where in the world did he land? We see the nasty group of goblins lunging towards Kangwu, brandishing their various weapons. Kangwu then immediately postures to utilize his demonic energy, gathering his monstrous strength towards his right hand. But to his surprise, the demonic energy he tried to gather did not materialize. The demonic energy inside the 10,000 demon core has been weakened to a staggering degree. Oh no, the nurse has come. Before Kangwu even processes how his powers have been locked away, the goblins are already within striking distance from him. He seems reluctant to use powers that he would have just scoffed at if he was at full power, but he does not have any choice. He instantly slices and dices the two goblins that were about to attack him with their blades. We are introduced to the sinister blade protruding from Kangwu's right arm, the demon Sabmax authority of the blade. Another one of the goblins tries to get close to him but meets the same fate. Authorities of demons as the MC's power system sounds so fire. A prompt appears whenever he dispatches a goblin, saying he has eliminated the E-rank regular monster goblin and that his XP has increased. He continues to move down the group of goblins until his level has increased to 4, and the grind starts. Looking at the remains of the battle, Kangwu cannot help but wonder what these monsters are, what this XP thing is, and why he actually feels stronger after defeating these goblins. He sees the aftermath of this battle and decides to start gathering information first. Finally, we see him activating his skill, the Demon King O Kangwu's authority of predation, as multiple menacing, grim, dark purple specters materialize from him. The demon pets of the Demon King must eat. Through using his predation ability, he ascertains the biological info of the goblins he just defeated, but he cannot find any more information about this world. He is alerted with a notification of his demonic energy going up by one point. This notification utterly confuses Kangwu. A type of energy that should just exist in hell exists in this place that he is in. That means there's a possibility that he did not land on Earth. This possibility terrifies and confuses Kangwu. The reason he was able to endure hell is because of the hope that he would return to Earth one day. In the middle of his mental breakdown, he hears a scream from a distance. It's not a scream that a demon or a monster would make. He realizes that it's a scream coming from a human. And it's a woman. Let's see how lucky Kangwu is. Without a second thought, we see Kangwu utilize another remarkable power to rush through the forest, accelerating to an unbelievable degree. We just witnessed the demon Valifer's authority of speed. While running through the forest like a breeze, Kangwu was thinking that for 10,000 long years. He's only ever seen monsters covered with tentacles or with multiple limbs, so he doesn't care if whoever was screaming was attractive or not. If they have two eyes, one nose, and one mouth if they're human, he would be elated. Thinking about Lilith, he steeled his resolve to detest tentacles. Tentacles are an absolute no. Don't knock it till you try it, bro. Our demon king finally arrived at where the screams were coming from. He was greeted with the sight of a horde of goblins, more than the group that attacked him, surrounding someone with long and purple hair trapped against a tree. As he got closer and closer, he's been chanting to himself to please let it be an actual human. Kangwu didn't even pay attention to the horde of goblins he's been passing by, he is only focused on the figure that's been screaming for help. When he was near enough, he saw two beautiful golden eyes full of tears, one nose, one mouth, and a body of a human woman. It was almost like a dream, she didn't have tentacles. Kang was screamed in celebration like he has never before. This guy has the tentacle trauma. He was running with tears in his eyes, almost forgetting that he is in the middle of a bloodthirsty goblin horde. A goblin postured to slash the lady with its blade, but before it could even get close, it was annihilated by Kangwu's authority of blade along with the whole horde. It only took Kangwu a second to eliminate the group. He reached his hand out to the beautiful lady leaning against the tree. The lady took Kangwu's hand, and he felt his demon king heart skip a beat. Suddenly, his 10,000 years of torment was all worth it. We are witnessing the zenith of all demons lovestruck. Kangwu is just an overpowered simp. While trembling in his shoes, the purple-haired lady was expressing her gratitude for saving her from the goblin horde, introducing herself as Han Sola. Kangwu was speechless, and he could not move from his position while holding Sola's hand. When Sola asked if there is some sort of problem, Kangwu grabbed her by the hand and eagerly asked her to get married, leaving Sola confused and dumbfounded. The Demon King has, in fact, no riz whatsoever. Han Sola was taken aback by the sudden marriage proposal from her rescuer. She had just been saved from a deadly goblin horde and didn't know how to respond. O Kang Wu, realizing that he got too excited at the sight of the first human he's seen in 10,000 years, quickly apologized and introduced himself. He asked if Saul was alright, as she had sustained an injury while running from the goblins. That's right. 
take it down a notch Demon King. Before Sala could even answer, she collapsed in Kang Wu's arms due to her leg injury. As she fell, something fell out of her cloak, a smartphone. Kang Wu saw this and was relieved to see evidence that he was actually on Earth. He sat Sala down near a tree and offered to treat her injury, which she gratefully accepted. You gotta get your own smartphone ASAP. As Kang Wu treated her injury by ripping his own cloak to make a bandage, he thought about how he and Sala were able to communicate despite his time in hell. Flashback to a few thousand years ago, Kang Wu, the Demon King, had forbidden the demon language in hell and made them speak Korean exclusively. He even tutored the demons personally. He did this so he would not forget how to speak his own language by the time he returned to Earth. Now, his decision was paying off as he was using Korean with a fellow human, a demonic battalion speaking Korean. That would certainly be something to behold. As Kang Wu finished dressing Sala's injury and handed him the smartphone, he saw the current year was 2023. We're in the same timeline, Kang Wu was certain he had adjusted his time and space warp correctly, which meant that monsters like the goblins started to show up on Earth during the five years he was in hell. He told Sala to rest before they moved on, as he thought about how much he didn't know about his current position. Kang Wu began to ask Sala why she was in such a dangerous place, and she revealed that she was hunting Sola inside an E-rank gate due to her circumstances. She had only awakened as a player the day before and realized it was a mistake to hunt Solo. Kang Wu didn't understand some of the terms she was using, but he knew everything was valuable information. He asked her what level she was, and she replied that she was only level 6 as she had recently awakened. This embarrassed Kang Wu a little, as her level was higher than his current level as the Demon King. You gotta pump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers. Seeing how strong and skillful Kang Wu was at eliminating the Goblin Horde, Saul also asked what he was doing in an e rank gate, to which he replied that he too has his own circumstances. They sat near the aftermath of battle, resting after a life and death situation. Their shoulders touched, and Sol could not help but blush. She stood up abruptly to cut the tension, disregarding her injury, asking Kang Wu to get going. As quickly as she stood up, her leg acted up and almost brought her down right then and there. Luckily, Kang Wu caught her and offered to give her a hand, causing Sala to be even more flustered than she already was, as she tried to decline Kang Wu's assistance, saying that she had already caused too much trouble. Kang Wu charmingly responded by stating that refusing help in situations of need is not a virtue, so he'd lend her a hand towards their destination. He asked Sala what direction they should go in, and Sola blushed as she pointed out where to go and accepted his help, just until they got to the entrance of the gate. The Demon King has the authority of Riz after all. We see O Kang Wu, the Demon King, let out a smile as he thought about this first conversation he'd ever had with another human in 10,000 years. Excluding his eagerness to propose marriage earlier, everything had gone smoothly, and Sala didn't seem to suspect his identity. As the two walked side by side to the entrance of the gate, Kang Wu strengthened his determination to learn and adapt to Earth's society. I have a feeling that adapting might be not so easy. As they arrive at the gate, uneasiness was visible on Kang Wu's face as he saw a portal as big as the tree it was attached to. After seeing this dimensional rift in space, he identified that this current location must not be completely Earth. After observing further, he didn't see any equipment that was making the rift, so how a gate as large as this one maintained itself was the big question in Kang Wu's head. They got batteries hidden somewhere in there for sure. Sala's injury felt better, so the two decided to step into the dimensional rift. Kang Wu was enveloped in a blinding light. As he opened his crimson eyes, a bustling area of people dressed in armor, cloaks, and other fantastical gear littered the place. Some were recruiting members for a goblin hunting party. Some were tinkering with a modern monitor, and there was even a so-called rogue begging to be let in on a party. The only thing that Kang Wu saw in common was that they had two eyes, one nose, and one mouth. Everyone here was human. He's actually back now. Kang Wu opened his eyes to the sight of a busy street, the warm sunlight touching his skin, high-rise buildings, and a vibrant urban area was displayed before him. This sight caused a tightness in his chest, and the Demon King could not help but be moved to tears that he really was back home now. Just let it all out, buddy. Seeing the side of Kang Wu, Han Sol Hall formally invited him to eat with her at her house. She said that she felt grateful and sorry for everything, and she wanted to repay Kang Wu with a meal. Hearing and seeing the beautiful Sol Ha, the only thing in Kang Wu's mind was that it really was spring. The Demon King is off to a wonderful start. As he was about to accept Sol's invitation to have a meal at her home, a firm voice could be heard asking them to wait. Kang Wu turned around to see two men who looked like law enforcement asking them to show their player cards just to confirm. This confused the newly arrived Kang Wu as he did not know what a player card was. 
Sala took out hers, while Kangwoo pretends to comply. What is this guy going to pull? As one of the men approached him, Kangwoo's eyes suddenly turned completely black with snake-like emerald irises. He activated his ability to twist the recognition of a target, the ability to manipulate the target's eyes to his will. With a phantom of a grotesque green demon with tattered rags as a blindfold and a red eye inside its mouth, this is the Demon Dentalian's Authority of the Blind. That demon authority is 100% certified overpowered. You never have to carry IDs again. Kangwoo showed his middle finger to the man, and the man approved it, leaving him in a trance state. Kangwoo's signature move. Kangwoo and Sala then proceeded to walk home to the lady's apartment. Sala apologized as the apartment didn't have an elevator, so they had to take the stairs. Kangwoo was just happy to be there as he smelled the scent of an old apartment. The narrow stairways, the cold sensation of a railing, and the dusty windows. Everything made his 10,000-year dream feel real right now, especially since he was in the beautiful Ms. Sala's home of all the places he could be right now. You deserve the dream come true, man. Everything going smoothly gave Kangwoo the optimistic boost that a happy future would unfold from here on out. Don't feel too optimistic, buddy, just don't. With everything going his way, Kangwoo couldn't help but laugh internally at his good fortune since leaving hell. Until he hears Sola calling out to her mom. It looks like our demon king imagined a very different scenario than the one he is in right now. Sola's mom quickly came to tend to her daughter, who just got back from a hunt, making sure that she was okay. Contrary to what Sola did, going hunting alone, her mother had told her to go in a party. With an awkward laugh, Sola lied to her mom that she had gone with a party so as not to worry her mother even more. Kangwu finally accepted the fact that Sola's invitation was really just for a meal. Sala promptly introduced Kangwu to her mother as her savior when she was in a pinch earlier. Kangwu politely bowed. It looks like 10,000 years in hell could not remove Kangwu's politeness. He's a good man. Sala's mom immediately took Kangwu's hand and sincerely thanked the man who had rescued her daughter from danger. Kangwu was then invited inside the mother and daughter's home, and the mom promised to prepare something as delicious as she could. Kangwu thanked the mother and daughter for their hospitality, even though in the back of his mind, he would have preferred to have dinner with just Sola and him. But thinking back to his life in hell, he quickly felt that there was plenty to appreciate and be thankful for here. As they headed inside, Sola saw the text she had received from her mom while she was hunting. Kangwu saw the smartphone and it immediately caught his attention. He remembered his mission to gather as much information as possible about the current state of Earth. He then proceeded to politely borrow Sola's mobile phone, using the excuse that he had just lost his. Sola, with her trusting nature, immediately complied. She can told Kangwoo to feel comfortable while waiting for the meal to be ready as she went to her room to change her clothes. What an angel! Do not mess this up, Demon King. As soon as Kangwoo felt the familiar sensation of a touchscreen, he was reminded of his past. After 10,000 years, everything on Earth felt impressive to him. But he had no time to be impressed. He removed his cloak and prepared for some serious research. Those muscles, though. Ever since he was dragged into hell five years ago, he had been researching news articles from 2018 to see what had happened in the world during his absence. Let's take a step back in time to February 22, 2018. The day of the calamity. The day that changed the world. Flashback alert. On that cursed day, unknown and terrifying monsters suddenly appeared from hundreds of gates, like the one that transported Kangwu to Earth. The world was thrown into chaos as these monsters were immune to firearms and even heavy artillery was no match for their hulking figures. Hundreds of thousands of military forces were massacred fighting these monsters. This calamity led to the founding of the Emergency Operation World Union, and Korea was the ninth country to join. The first player appeared in the United States of America. However, the identity of the first player is still a mystery. Starting with her, the number of players drastically increased worldwide, signaling a ray of hope for humanity in these catastrophic times. Of course, the first player is American. Back to the present, Kangwoo sat at the dining table, intently reading every article he could find regarding the past five years. He had realized that the 22nd of February, the day of the calamity, was also the day he was dragged to hell. This was a crucial piece of information for him. Nice one, Sherlock. Kang would deduce that it might be possible that one of the hundreds of gates was responsible for sending him to the place he despised for 10,000 years. However, every news article he read was based on speculation. He needed a more detailed account of everything that had happened. Sala's mother suddenly yelled that the food was ready, carrying a hot pot towards the table where Kang Wu sat. Kang Wu's expression brightened at the sight of the pot. Before he could even thank Sala's mother for preparing the meal, he stopped in his tracks as he caught a glimpse of what was inside. He couldn't believe his eyes. 
It was kimchi stew, the only thing that had kept him sane during his time in hell. Numerous side dishes were waiting to be devoured as well. Although Sala's mother wished Kang one nice meal, he was already entranced by the kimchi stew and couldn't hear anything. All that mattered was the food in front of him. He took a spoonful of stew, and Sola and her mother began to eat too. Kang Wu's hands shook as he took his first bite. The mother and daughter watched in anticipation. He swallowed the first bite and then took another, this time pairing it with rice, until he was devouring the meal. The authority of kimchi stew is the strongest of them all. We see a glimpse of Kang Wu's time in hell 10,000 years ago. To survive, he had absorbed demonic energy and transformed into something close to a demon. However, because he was human to begin with, his appetite and taste remain human. No matter how many gruesome monsters he ate, nothing could satisfy his human taste buds. The demons he had to gnaw, tear, and chew on to survive were torturous. Everything tasted terrible, like garbage. After thousands of years of consuming raw flesh and blood, any normal person would have gone insane. But not Kang Wu. He cried and fought endlessly to return to Earth. The only reason he was able to hold on to his sanity for 10,000 years of torture was his desire to return home. Now, after tasting something that tasted like home, something that felt like Earth, he cried again. He really had returned to Earth, and he was finally home. From the bottom of his heart, Kang Wu expressed his gratitude towards So La and her mother for the first real meal he had in 10,000 years. Even demon kings deserve to be happy. Sala replied that she should be thanking Kang Wu and apologize for only being able to give him this treat after he had saved her life. Yet, Kang Wu enjoyed it so much. With teary eyes and a full heart, the demon king asked for another bowl. Kimchi stew so good, he turns into a child. Sala promptly prepared another bowl for Kang Wu. She and her mother were delighted to see how much he was enjoying the meal. Kang Wu ate and ate as Sala continued to prepare bowls for him while gazing at him tenderly. She's a keeper. Suddenly, there was an explosion behind Kang Wu, shattering the door and walls of Sola and her mother's home. However, it didn't seem to bother Kang Wu. A silhouette could be seen walking through the entrance made by the explosion, spouting curses. This alarmed and distressed Sola and her mother. The man was revealed to be a yellow-haired, delinquent-looking, and angry young man. No one should get in between a man and his kimchi stew. That's the golden rule. The delinquent, Han Taeyin got into Sola's face and began berating her for entering a gate on her own. Sola was evidently angered by the disrespect that the man was giving her and demanded that he leave. Taehyun was angered by this sentiment. Sola yelled at Taehyun, warning him not to come close since she was now a full-fledged player. Taehyun responded by mocking her threats and punching the wall with a powerful force, intimidating Sola and her mother. Sola once again warned Taehyun not to come close while shielding her mom behind her. Put this man in his rightful place, the emergency room. Taehyun scoff at Sola's warning and look at the terrified mother, his mother, expressing his dissatisfaction with his parents. He complained about his dad who had died off quickly and his mom who earned peanuts. Sola cursed her brother, blaming him for the current status of their family. Taehyun then forcefully grabbed Sola by the hands and tried to drag her to his guild, the Andra's Guild. Sola fought back and cursed the Andra's Guild as trash. This prompted Taehyun to reply menacingly that he would put Sala in a very good party. Someone has to clean up this trash man. In a desperate attempt, Sala bit Taehyun's arm. He then slapped Sala across the room towards her mom. This bite truly enraged Taehyun to the highest degree. He stated that Han Sala should just comply and be his tribute. Since Sala claimed to be a full-fledged player, Taehyun wanted to face her for real. This is when her mom interjected to plead with her son. To which Taehyun replied by throwing his mom across the room and calling her garbage. Sola hurriedly checked if her mom was okay. The disgust for his family was evident on Taehyun's face, while Sola glared at her brother with rage and hatred. Forget about the emergency room, this guy should have been the one thrown to hell. He insulted Sola, saying that all she had going for her was her pretty face and that she should just come to the Andra's guild with him to be a tribute to the higher members. It was then that Taehyun heard chewing and eating sounds. It was the demon king Kang Wu, continuing his feast like there was nothing else in the world that mattered. Taehyun was confused and taken aback by this sight. Kang Wu showed no signs of stopping anytime soon. Taehyun let go of Sola to confront the man eating peacefully at the table. There he is. You gotta get your hands dirty today, Kang Wu. Taehyun called out to Kang Wu with no response whatsoever. He scratched his head as he was about to run out of patience. Taehyun then suddenly kicked the table, causing everything to fly all over the place. Rest in peace, Taehyun, gone and forgotten. Kang Wu saw bits and pieces of the thing he loved most go up in the air. 
This shocked and concerned Sola. Kang will remain in a shocked state for a moment and then let out the most grief-stricken scream there was. He looked at the floor, seeing the aftermath of Taehyun's kick. Taehyun was confused by this, even mistaking Kang Wu for a beggar with the way he looked at the food. Sol was left speechless by this interaction. Taehyun continued to call out to Kang Wu and started kicking him. That's when the demon inside Kang Wu was awakened. Taehyun was caught off guard by the strange man kneeling in front of him. The tangible bloodlust emanating from Kang Wu made him seem like an actual demon in the eyes of Taehyun. Well, he is the demon king after all. Filled with rage over the wasted kimchi stew, Kang Wu looked like an animal ready to pounce. Take even gritted his teeth at the incomprehensible monster in front of him, preparing to attack with all his might after sensing Kang Wu's ferocity. He channeled energy into his fist, causing it to burn with bright blue flames. Despite Kang Wu's ferocious appearance, Taehyun lifted his fist to strike, refusing to believe that the man in front of him posed a real threat. How dumb and arrogant do you have to be to pull what this guy is doing? But before Taehyun could land a blow, a beam of light struck him. Sala. Wielding her white staff and with tears in her eyes, had intervened to distract Taeyeon so that Kang Wu could escape. She really is an angel sent from above. However, Kang Wu was already prepared to pounce on Taeyeon, wielding the demon Sabnak's authority of the blade. The sudden attack took Saul by surprise, as Kang Wu was already within striking distance of Taeyeon. But Taeyeon underestimated Kang Wu's speed and fell victim to his critical knee strike to the chest. The delinquent flew backward stunned and in pain from the attack. And so, it begins. Taehyun recovered quickly and prepared to attack again, covering his fists with blue flames and cursing Kangwu. But his attempt was met with a solid counterpunch to the face and a painful kick to the sides from the Demon King. Despite being bloodied and bruised, Taehyun managed to catch Kangwu's legs and convince himself that the strikes he had received were that strong. First stage is always denial. It might cost you though. Kang Wu postured to fall on his back, preparing his next move with his other leg. With one leg held down by Taeyeon, Kang Wu delivered a devastating kick to the delinquent's face, freeing himself and activating the authority of the blade immediately. Taeyeon couldn't believe that he was being beaten by a man he didn't even know. Kang Wu brandished his blade, preparing to strike the injured delinquent. Taeyeon tried to counter by firing his blue flames toward Kang Wu, realizing too late that it was just another feint. This man fell for two feints in a row. A devastating punch to his side finally brought Taehyun to his knees. Extinguishing his flames, Kang Wu stood menacingly over the kneeling Taehyun, staring at him with the pressure of a demon. As Taehyun knelt, wondering who in the world this man was, Kang Wu stepped on the back of his head, not allowing him to lift his head a single inch from the floor. Taehyun suddenly felt a sharp pain in his arms as blood gushed everywhere. Kang Wu had stabbed the authority of the blade into Taehyun's arms to hold him in place. The Demon King was letting out his brutality in the name of the wasted kimchi stew. Taehyun couldn't believe he was suffering so much for a simple dish. The nerve on this guy to disrespect the authority of kimchi stew. Kang Wu grabbed Taehyun by the hair, hearing the delinquent disrespect food and calling it just kimchi stew. The unbridled bloodlust of Kang Wu was starting to infect Taehyun. The delinquent quickly tried to apologize for his disrespect, but the ferocity of the Demon King was already unleashed. Kang Wu bashed Taehyun's face into the ground repeatedly until he finally stopped, leaving the delinquent an unrecognizable, sobbing mess. Kang Wu instructed Taehyun to scream that Kimchi Stew was a sacred existence, demanding him to scream louder and breaking down Taehyun's resistance by punching his arm wound. The delinquent eventually broke down crying and repeated the mantra repeatedly, until he sounded like a believer praying to a god. He finally found the way of the Kimchi Stew. This absurd scene at their dining area left Saul dumbfounded. Kang Wu continued to torment Taehyun until he was an unrecognizable sobbing mess. Full of anger and dissatisfaction, Kang Wu resembled more of a demon than a human at this point. It was not until Taehyun screamed at the top of his lungs that Kimchi Stew is a sacred existence. Sounding like a man who had found God, that Kang Wu finally stopped and retracted his blade. He stood up in front of the broken Taehyun, warning him to never look down on Kimchi Stew ever again. Taehyun just lay there confused and defeated from what he had just experienced. What a brutal way to learn about the importance of respecting food. Sola and her mother's apartment was in poor condition after the scuffle, especially their dining area. Sola's mother finally got the chance to rest and recover from everything that had happened. Sola was still processing what had happened earlier as she dressed her mother's injuries. Take your time, Sola. We see someone washing broken dishes disgruntledly, only for it to actually be the beaten and injured Taehyun. Kang Wu was making him deal with the aftermath of what he started. 
Kang Wu had even stolen Taeyin's clothes. This man just got beaten, ordered to do chores, and his drip was stolen. The perfect tragedy. The delinquent could not help but cry after experiencing everything Kang Wu had put him through. His dissatisfaction and anger were slowly rising as he washed the dishes, questioning why he was being treated like this. I would have cried too. Kang Wu quickly shut him down by startling him with a simple banging sound of a cup. Kang Wu asked if Taeyin held a grudge against him, to which the traumatized Taeyin denied. Kang Wu diligently watched Taeyin's actions. He thought about his time in hell, where he never got to sleep, eat, or live comfortably, while fighting and devouring demons for survival every day. All of these were luxuries in life that were taken away from him, but the likes of Taeyin didn't even appreciate. Eat your vegetables, guys. Kang Wu gave Taeyin advice to treat his life preciously. Taeyin replied positively, but in the back of his mind, he secretly plotted his revenge. Kang Wu called to the delinquent after finishing the dishes. He laid it out frankly that there was no merit in keeping Taeyin alive. These words terrified Taeyin, and his mind was reeling from what was going to happen next. He's done, period. Kang Wu suddenly grabbed Taeyin by his chest and gave a sinister promise that he wasn't going to kill him. As Kang Wu's eyes turned a menacing dark purple color and a disturbing smile crossed his face, he warned Taeyin that death would probably be better than what he was about to do. Taeyin then felt like he was disconnected from reality. Kang Wu became the phantom of a disturbingly massive purple horse with white hair and three menacing dark purple eyes. This was the demon Oroba's authority of fear, another authority demon phantom. Let's go. Taeyin felt as if he was being crushed by Kang Wu's phantom. He begged nonstop for him not to come close. Taeyin was eventually swallowed by the power of the demon Arobas, driving him to insanity and causing him to pee his pants as Kang Wu just stood there, etching an uncleansable mark of fear onto Taeyin's soul, turning him into his puppet. He warned the delinquent never to talk about what happened. Taeyin walked away broken and pathetic. He needs some milk. Sala was lost in her thoughts, realizing that once again, Kang Wu had saved not only her, but her mom as well, as she looked at Kang Wu fondly. Guys, is the ship sailing? As Kang Wu was browsing through his phone, he found that his current problem was money, as he got zero balance to his name. Same brogue, same. That's when he learned about magic stones. Magic stones contained the defeated monster's power. Kang Wu asked Sola if she had any magic stones, and she quickly complied, giving Kang Wu the magic stone from an E rank goblin from the hunt. It was said that the closer a magic stone was to black, the higher its rank was. I need me some magic stones for real. Kang Wu observed and sensed the magic stone and realized that it didn't seem to have any demonic energy in it. He surmised that it held a different power than demonic energy. Thinking back to his earlier hunt, he had felt a little bit of demonic energy out there. His hypothesis that it came from the magic stone was wrong. The magic stones contained magical power, leaving Kang Wu stumped as to where the demonic energy came from. He returned the magic stone to Sol La and devised a plan to sell magic stones for cash. But he needs a player ID to do that. To be a badass hunter, you must follow the law and bureaucracy. Kang Wu asked Sola for the location of the nearest player management office, prompting her to offer to accompany him since she was headed there anyway. She explained that her family situation is not good, which is why she recklessly tried going solo hunting. Fortunately, Kang Wu was there to rescue her in a pinch. After hearing this, Kang Wu thought that after looking at demons for 10,000 years, he had finally found an angel. That's what I've been saying, man. Sola showed her determination to take the basic lessons and aim for her second stage awakening. As Kang Wu and Sola prepared to leave for the player management office, a thought lingered in the back of Kang Wu's mind. He didn't have the intention to help her just yet because moving with someone as weak as Sola would decrease his hunting efficiency. He admitted that it was a bit cold-hearted, but it was the reality. He must avoid losses as much as possible since regaining his power was his utmost priority. The grind will always be the priority. Kang Wu was lost in thought as he stared out the window. In this earth that he just returned to after 10,000 years, he needed to become even stronger if he wanted to survive, just like before, just like in hell. Sola called out to Kang Wu as he was musing about his next move. She reminded him that he did not have an ID yet, so their first destination was the district office. Let's get registered. We see the brand new citizen card of O Kang Wu as he and Sol ride the train on the way to the player management office. This ID is a reissue card that Kang Wu got from the district office without any fuss. The speed of the process makes it evident that no one has put O Kang Wu on any missing persons list in the past five years. Five years and no reports, that's rough man. Thinking about how nobody knew he was missing makes Kang Wu feel dejected. 
We catch a glimpse of Kangwu's life prior to his descent into hell. He lived alone and kept to himself, surviving on instant noodles. Just like how he survived on his own in hell, living off raw monster flesh. Nobody knew what he had gone through. Please give this man a happy ending. While Kangwu was lost in thought, Sola called out to him to look out of the train window as they were about to arrive. A view of a massive, bustling metropolitan area was visible, with an eye-catching building in the center. Solot expressed her love for this view, and Kangwu agreed, thinking about how things were going to be different this time around. Fingers crossed, buddy. After their train ride, they finally arrived at the entrance of the player management office. Kangwu was awestruck by the size of the building, which was even bigger than ancient airport. Sala then pulled out her old phone to give to Kangwu to use. Once again, Kangwu was touched by Sala's kindness and generosity. It is now required to simp for the angel that is Miss Han's Sola. He thanked Sala for the phone, and she went her own way to register for the beginner's lecture. Before they parted ways, Sala invited Kangwu to dinner once they finished their affairs in the player management office. They parted ways with Kangwu all smiles at the prospect of dinner later. Inside the player management office, Kangwu saw the massive scale of the building, realizing how important players had become. He inserted his newly acquired ID into a machine to get his waiting line number for the test room, then followed the blue line on the floor to test room 09. Kangwu saw players of all ages and statuses inside the test room. Kangwu would surely demolish this test right. He overheard other players discussing the first test results of players like Bak Huiyan and Chi Yanju that achieved the legendary S rank in their first stage and eventually became part of the five great guild masters. In Kangwu's mind, he didn't want to stand out in the early stages. Based on Kangwu's research, Kim Jae-hyun of Mer, Che Yanju of Red Rose, Bak kang of Hanel, Jung hyun Ju of Sanalei, and Che min Hyuk of Onuri are the five great guild masters. Each of these guilds was made by Korea's top five rankers. Kangwu was certain he will eventually meet these people when he regains his strength. After all, the stronger you get, the more you stand out. I'm taking notes of those names. Reading all this information just solidified Kangwu's desire to regain his strength quickly. Staring at his status window, he considered that maybe he could get stronger due to having the player title now. However, his thoughts were interrupted as his number was called for the test. Kangwu was escorted to a table and seat with one of the test representatives. The representative wearing glasses instructed Kangwu to place his hand on a white ball which would determine Kangwu's attribute ranking based on the color it changed to. The higher the ranking, the more saturated the color became. Show how strong you really are, Demon King. As Kangwu reached out to touch the ball, he worried that it was not good to stand out, and it would be a hassle if he came out too strong. The test started, and the ball lit up in a blinding light. Kangwu was ready to accept the fact that he was too strong for this test after seeing how bright the light was. Oh, Kangwu, suffering from success. After the light subsided, the representative told Kangwu his rank. He's an F rank. This was a heavy mental blow to the Demon King. I knew it. Kangwu was dumbfounded by what he had just heard. He was trapped in his own thoughts as the representative explained the guide and precautions of being a player. He couldn't accept the fact that he was the lowest of the low. He's going through it. He would be issued an E rank player card and could only enter gates of the same rank unless he had a guardian. Kangwu's mind was still reeling from the result he had just received. He imagined that Balak would probably burn down the whole building if he heard the representative's words. No one can insult the king when Balak is around. Kangwu felt his 10,000-year trauma suddenly coming back. He asked the representative for ways to raise his rank. The representative explained that he could go the route that Saul was taking and finish the basic education course to jump straight to D-rank or submit a certain volume of magic stones. Kangwu made up his mind to use the magic stone method. He was handed his very own E-rank player card and immediately refused to enroll in the basic education course, quickly getting up from his seat. Good man. Straight to the grind. The representative took this as an examinee suffering from shock after finding out how low his rank was, the perfect state to perish in a gate. As the representative felt pity for Kangwu, the ball started to show signs of dark spotting. As she noticed the state of the ball, it turned completely pitch black and eventually cracked open. This startled the representative as the last tester was just an F rank. Even in the past, S ranks had only managed to get a dark gray. She thought it would be impossible for someone to get black. I never doubted our boy for a second. Kang Wu strode through the area of a gate entrance. The whole area was crawling with players trying to form a party to take on a gate. Kang Wu once again noticed a rogue class player begging parties to let him in. What's up with rogues in this world? 
Minding his own business, he presented his player card to the law enforcement and promptly entered an E-rank gate. He stepped out of the gate feeling fine but a tad bit terrified that he might pop out of hell again. He is now in a familiar place where he fought goblins before. As he began to stretch, preparing for his monster hunt, an armor-clad man with a Herculean figure approached him. That, sir, is an absolute tank. Kang Wu even mistook the man for a bear. It seemed like the man had a hunting party. The man asked Kang Wu if he came to the gate to solo hunt and if he had already experienced his second awakening. Kang Wu answered truthfully. The man was shocked out of concern. It appeared that this ironclad giant was just being helpful. He was a friendly guy. He even invited Kang Wu to join their party for a quick field tour. But his party members vehemently disagreed. Good guy tank players, everybody loves him. The man even offered to not take any magic stones just to help a solo player out in the field. Seeing the good nature of the giant, Kang Wu politely declined the invitation. But it didn't stop the man from introducing himself as Kang Taesu. Kang Wu introduced himself in reply, trying to decline politely once again. Good guy tank players, everybody loves him. Kang Taesu insisted on using informal language since he was only 24, leaving Kang Wu dumbstruck. Ain't no way this grown middle-aged looking man is 24, he's gotta be at least 39. Kang Taesu even brought out his ID. Kang Wu casually declined the good-natured Taesu. Taesu did not insist further and just left Kang Wu with a word of advice about the goblins in the gate and that there was a large and powerful goblin out there, the Hobgoblin, a boss monster on a completely different level from regular goblins. Kang Wu expressed his gratitude, and the party went their separate ways. If Kang Wu was a noob, he would have gone with them, but being alone was his comfort zone. Kang Wu readied himself for the challenge of this gate as he activated the demon Focaler's authority of speed, scouting and scouring the forest as he flew by, until he finally found the base camp of the goblins. Kang Wu jumped in the middle of the camp, the Demon King is about to start his hunt. Goblin Slayer Hype Bingo! The smile on Kang Wu's face as he plunged the authority of the blade into his first goblin victim was the smile of a peerless Demon King. He immediately pivoted, and another goblin fell to his blade. He sliced a third goblin in half, thinking to himself that this was too easy. Let the goblin purge begin. The swarm of goblins saw the human running amok and became angry, activating the authority of the blade in both arms. Kang Wu's massacre had only just begun. Goblins wielding axes and blades could not get close to Kang Wu without suffering a tragic fate. Goblin heads flew all over the place, and goblin bodies were pierced from one end to the other. A rain of blood drenched Kang Wu. With a circular blade sweep, another small group of goblins met their maker. Kang Wu's crimson eyes were like those of a warlord tearing through enemy lines. The crudely made weapons of the goblin swarm were no match for a demon's authority. They were annihilated before a single contact. He's taking all the XP in the map. The goblin swarm fought and fought and tried their hardest, but ultimately fell short. The double edge of Kang Wu's blade was a weapon of mass destruction. With every move and sweep, he took a significant portion of the base camp. Kang Wu's eyes slowly turned to resemble those of a true demon king. He had no regard for the lives of these pesky monsters. Seeing the slaughter of the few remaining goblins, the remaining ones shuddered in fear. Seeing the number of goblins still left, the blood-soaked Kang Wu prepared for another round. Imagine how strong and ferocious Kang Wu was in his prime if he's like this with a sealed power. We could see Kang Wu retracting his blades and wiping his sweat. The aftermath of his rampage was bloody as can be. With this many monsters, even Kang Wu felt worn out. The system window caught his eye, indicating that he had leveled up four times and his demonic energy had increased by one, wiping out this goblin base camp. He was now at level eight. The grind never stops. Kang Wu started to commence his feast. He activated his very own authority of predation, summoning numerous horrifying dark purple specters to prey on the defeated foe's flesh and blood. Kang Wu sensed the demonic energy inside the goblins, confirming that it wasn't in the magic stone. It was all over their bodies. And the intensity varied based on how long it had been since the monster had passed. This only meant that by preying on monsters that had recently died, he could regain his demonic energy little by little. Kang Wu's demonic energy increased by two after using his predation skill. This way, he could still sell magic stones while gaining demonic energy. Kang Wu began running around the bones of the goblins, collecting a vast number of magic stones. All the bones in the field reminded him of the taste of chicken. Giving him the idea of going for chicken later with Sola, Kang Wu's mouth watered at this imagination, causing him to work double time on collecting the magic stones around him. Can I tattle along for chicken, Mr. Demon King? Suddenly, he heard a loud rumbling from a distance. 
As he turned around, Kang Wu saw a gargantuan figure coming out of the woods, going down trees on its way. It was the boss monster that Taesu had warned him about, a hobgoblin. It's a boss fight. With a menacing look like an overgrown goblin with a giant mass of muscle, it wielded a massive blade and savage-looking armor. When the hobgoblin caught sight of Kang Wu, it hastily and angrily prepared its blade as demonic energy started to gather around it. This utterly shocked Kang Wu, but the hobgoblin didn't give him time to process and ferociously charge forward. Demonic energy battle. Startled by the revelation that the beast could control mana, Kang Wu immediately activated his blade on one arm and started accumulating demonic energy on the other. When it came to destructive power, Kang Wu had the utmost confidence in himself. Show the monster how it's done, Kang Wu. The hobgoblin struck down with immense force, and Kang Wu was forced to dodge, narrowly evading the attack. The monster quickly prepared its mana-infused blade for another strike against Kang Wu. With his dual blades, Kang Wu managed to block the massive edge, but the impact sent him flying and left him vulnerable to another attack. As the next strike descended, Kang Wu attempted another block, but the weight difference between them made it challenging for him to handle the heavy blade above him. Utilizing the hobgoblin's weight, he redirected the force to the side. Kang Wu countered with his blades, but the hobgoblin effortlessly deflected the strike with its armor, leaving Kang Wu's defenses exposed. To defeat this beast, he needed to find a significant opening. Float like a feather, sting like a bee. Kang Wu skillfully dodged another fatal strike, then another, and even evaded a powerful swing kick from the hobgoblin. Despite the monster's massive size, its attacks failed to make contact with Kang Wu. Seizing the opportunity, Kang Wu created distance between himself and the monster, impressed by how effectively it chained its movements. The hobgoblin was a fitting boss, far surpassing the goblins he had dealt with earlier. Its pursuit even demolished trees in its path. Picking up a goblin skull, Kang Wu regarded the colossal creature as nothing more than his entertaining prey. He tossed the skull, catching the attention of the enraged hobgoblin. That's a foul right there, coach. Hatred and rage were visible on its monstrous face. With the boss in a state of fury, Kang Wu executed his plan. With a chant, a phantom figure of a beautiful woman overlapping with a monstrous form appeared. Kang Wu had activated the demon Krosol's authority of rage. New authority demon lets go. The phantom attached itself to the hobgoblin, and its effects became apparent. The unsuspecting hobgoblin was suddenly pushed to the limits of its rage, rampaging and attacking recklessly. Kang Wu knew that the fight was over at this point, a strength that the hobgoblin's blade swings multiplied exponentially. This authority served as a buff, amplifying the user's strength several times over, but it came with a fatal drawback. The price for this buff was a curse that stripped away one's sanity and ability to think clearly. The hobgoblin's irrational and disorderly attacks made it easy for Kang Wu to weave and dodge with precision. Spotting opening, Kang Wu ruthlessly pierced the beast's legs, causing it to keel over. Wielding the authority of Blade, Kang Wu met the incoming hobgoblin attack with a strike of his own. Blood was spilled. Who do you guys think won? Blood flew all over the place as the curtain for this battle closed. The mighty hobgoblin sat lifeless on the ground. Kang Wu felt disappointed with his performance as he knew he could have easily defeated the beast had he been in his prime. A single flick of a finger would have probably been enough. Suddenly, a system modification caught Kang Wu's attention. Eliminating the boss and the entire base camp single-handedly granted him a 150% XP bonus. It turned out that the Hobgoblin was a C-rank monster, leveling him up three times. Upon reaching level 11, Kang Wu's second stage awakening began. The attribute of his second stage awakening was revealed to be called Unfulfilled Hunger, enabling him to absorb even more demonic energy through predation. This revelation lifted Kang Wu's spirits as he realized he could become much stronger at a faster pace. He decided to test his newfound ability on the Hobgoblin's corpse right then and there. Activating Predation An incomprehensible dark purple specter devoured the once mighty beast's flesh and blood. Kang Wu noticed that the smoke emanating from Predation had become thicker because of unfulfilled hunger. His demonic energy stat increased by a staggering three levels, reaching a total of 19. This boost in strength greatly pleased Kang Wu. We love stats going up. Curious about the extent of his increased demonic energy, Kang Wu sent out his energy and discovered that it was now three times stronger than before. However, he remained cautious, as he couldn't determine the source of this sudden increase. Just then, Kang Wu felt as though he had been transported to a different and much more sinister world. The sky displayed a blood moon, and an endless sea stretched out before him. It was his 10,000 demon core. As Kang Wu suspected, 
the seal of his core had been weakened. Imagine being so strong that your energy has a separate world. Hypothesizing that the seal had weakened due to his second stage awakening. Can you believe that he could strengthen it further by increasing his level? He stood up, prepared to leave, and picked up the magic stone left by the hobgoblin. His next goal was the third awakening in level 20. Grind, grind, grind. A few hours later, we find ourselves in a vibrant chicken restaurant bustling with customers. Kang Wu and Saola were seated at one of the tables. Kang Wu voraciously enjoyed his fried chicken, alternating between using a fork and his own plastic-covered hands. Those fried chickens look hella good. Kang Wu devoured every piece of chicken to the bone, washing it down with some cold beer. Saola was simply happy to see Kang Wu enjoy the meal. She can playfully asked if the chicken was better than her kimchi stew, sparking a war in Kang Wu's mind. In the end, they both laughed, and Sola's kimchi stew emerged as the winner. To Kang Wu's surprise, Sola even offered him the last piece on her plate, which he gratefully accepted. Sola then asked if Kang Wu had any relatives or friends nearby. Kang Wu's downcast response revealed that he had no friends, family, or even a place to call home. Observing the change in Kang Wu's spirits, Saul extended an unexpected invitation for him to stay at her place for a while. This gravely surprised Kang Wu. Despite having known each other for a short time, Saul already felt that Kang Wu had helped her immensely. Kang Wu bashfully agreed to Sola's offer, politely expressing their mutual care and support for each other. Sola sensed that Kang Wu was going through a lot at the moment. Sola is best girl, period. Kang Wu took something out of his pocket and handed it to Sola, an envelope containing about 3 million won in cash. Once again, Saul was confused by Kang Wu's gesture. Kang Wu explained that she should consider the money as rent. This deeply unsettled Sola, as she felt that Kang Wu had already done so much for her. Aware of Sola's family's tough situation, Kang Wu reassured her not to feel burdened by accepting the money, as he would also be enjoying their home cooked meals. With tears in her eyes, Sola gratefully accepted Kang Wu's help. She promised that her kimchi stew would taste even better from now on. All Kang Wu could think about was eating kimchi stew every day and Sola had become his guardian angel of kimchi stew. Kang Wu better protect her from any danger. Curious about nearby D-ranked gates, Kang Wu asked Sola if there were any. Sola answered by telling him about the lizardman gates in the area. As he continued to savor his fried chicken, he pondered whether lizards would be tasty as well. Oh no, don't eat the lizardman Kang Wu, you graduated from eating monsters, right? We jumped to Sola's home, she showed Kang Wu his room, which her brother used to use. Kang Wu sat on the cozy bed as Sola wished him a good night, turning off the lights on her way out. Kang Wu collapsed onto the comfortable bed, reflecting on how long it had been since he had slept on something soft. The tranquility and comfort as he drifted into sleep reassured him that returning was the right decision. Being put to bed by Sola, you definitely made the right decision, bro. In the midst of the day, the bustling area around the gates remained as lively as ever. Kang Wu could be seen walking around, observing the players trying their luck at the gates, he even spotted the same rogue begging parties to let him in, as usual. Get this man a party. Kang Wu presented his new ID as a D-ranked player, miming his own business, and once again entered a gate. This particular D-ranked gate resembled a damp forest with swamps. After performing some stretches, we saw Kang Wu activate the authority of silence and swiftly move through the depths of the forest. He had prepared this power in advance after Sala had told him that lizardmen compensated for their poor eyesight with their sensitivity to sound. I might need to borrow that authority for a minute, man. Kang Wu quickly and silently approached a small group of oblivious lizardmen. Fixing his gaze on his prey, he also recalled Sola's advice that these monsters were weak against fire. Without slowing down, a phantom of a fiery owl manifested behind Kang Wu. This was the demon Andrus' authority of Hellfire. That fire owl phantom looks badass. He immediately engulfed two of the lizardmen in scorching flames. The monsters writhed in pain from Kang Wu's Hellfire. The lizardmen fled towards the nearest water source, but luck was now on their side since Hellfire could only be extinguished using mana or demonic energy, or else it would burn for eternity. Kang Wu swiftly dispatched the small group. The fire didn't just burn their bodies, but their very life essence, leaving behind corpses to be devoured by Kang Wu's predation. After using the demon Andrus' authority of Hellfire to deal with the lizardmen, he remembered that Han Taeyin's guild name was also Andras. But Kang Wu simply shrugged it off. There might be a connection here. We witnessed Kang Wu using his predation to consume the lizardmen until nothing remained. Another group of lizardmen witnessed this and immediately prepared to confront Kang Wu. They charged at him with rage in their eyes, only to be reduced to charred remains like the previous group. Once again, 
This group of lizards became food for Kangwu's predation. He activated the authority of silence to mask the screams of the burning lizardmen, ensuring they wouldn't attract more attention. That is brutal Kangwu. Sometimes I forget that you were a demon king. After dealing with these two groups, Kangwu's level only increased once. It became evident that leveling up was becoming slower. As Kangwu devised a plan to hunt more herds, someone called out to him. The voice pointed out that he looked like a complete newbie based on his equipment. They proceeded to invite Kangwu to join their guild. It was revealed to be a party of five players. Kangwu asked for the name of their guild. The man in the middle, wearing a necklace with an insignia, proudly answered that they were the Andra's guild. Kangwu simply stared at them disinterestedly and walked away. As soon as Kangwu walked away, the group immediately began badmouthing him behind his back. Their fragile egos bruised. With sinister looks on their faces, they plan to teach Kangwu a lesson and use him as a means of stress relief. We'll see who will teach who a lesson. Deep in the d rank swamp gate, obscured by dense trees, hellfire blazes, burning groups of lizardmen brightly. Some are still being scorched, while others are consumed by the specters of O Kangwu's authority of predation. Fried lizard for lunch, anyone? Believing he had consumed every lizard man in the area, Kangwu contemplates playing it safe or taking risks to level up more quickly. However, he's interrupted by the Andra's guild members he encountered earlier, posing as Kangwu's seniors. Fried guild members sounds good right now. One look and Kangwu knows that the party leader likes to prey on the weak. He dismisses the party's call, stating that he's hunting just fine. But the party leader doesn't believe him, seeing no corpses and Kangwu in pristine condition. Kangwu explains that he's resting now, but the party leader calls him out on his disrespectful attitude. Tired of being annoyed by the group, Kangwu curses the guy out. The authority of trash talk is strong. The party leader is further provoked by Kangwu, who asks if he wants to fight it out right then and there. Another member tries to confront Kangwu, but the leader stops him, claiming he will teach Kangwu a lesson. The leader insults Kangwu, thinking he should only be a B rank at most. Kangwu finds this development amusing. The leader draws his blade and bangs it against his arm guard. The members look down at Kangwu with contempt, reminding him that lizardmen are attracted to loud sounds. Amused by their plan, Kangwu chuckles. He finds the leader's sword banging to lure lizardmen. Cute. He's like a little drummer boy. As the swamp began to rumble with the approaching horde of lizardmen, the Andra's guild leader ordered his party to prepare their magic barriers. He arrogantly taunted Kangwu asking what he would do when the dozen or so lizardmen arrived. He even offered to help Kangwu if he kneeled before the beasts arrived. Kangwu laughed in response and asked the party if that was all they had in mind. As the leader became confused by Kangwu's response, Kangwu prepared his hands. Suddenly, Kangwu's eyes transformed into a demonic appearance, and he clapped his hands with overwhelming force. He warned the party that if they're doing something, they should go all the way. He activated the authority of Deafening Roar to clap so loudly that it echoed throughout the entire d rank gate area. We love Kangwu's pettiness. The party was left dumbfounded by this sight. Kangwu then proceeded to stomp on the floor with such force that it caused the ground to shake and the trees to sway. The leader called out to Kangwu to stop, calling him a psychopath. When Kangwu finally stopped, he looked at the party with a mischievous expression. The leader continued to berate him while the members huddled together in their small barrier unnerved by the sudden onslaught of sound. Rest in peace, you won't be missed. Nearby, a swarm of lizardmen started to creep closer and closer. Coming from the water, trees, and every nest, the lizards began to follow Kangwu's deafening noise. The party was terrified at the sight of the countless lizardmen surrounding them, relentlessly attacking their small magic barrier. They had never seen so many monsters before and were quickly losing hope. The leader cursed Kangwu for being so reckless with his use of sound, but Kangwu just laughed and jumped onto a nearby tree branch, taunting the leader that he, too, knew how sensitive lizardmen were to sound. These guys really picked the wrong newbie to mess with. The swarm of lizardmen began their assault, attacking the magic barrier relentlessly to get to the humans inside. The leader told Kangwu that they would all die because of his actions, but Kangwu responded that he wasn't going to die there, only the Andra's guild party. With that, Kangwu activated his authority of silence and the lizardmen rushing from all directions just passed by him, as if he didn't exist. The leader was left stunned and terrified, witnessing someone with the ability to control sound in such a way. Does this mean he can fart loudly or silently depending on his will? With a savage strike, the small magic barrier shattered, leaving the Andres' guild party vulnerable to the swarm of lizardmen. 
The party leader was about to call for another barrier when he turned around and saw their mage brutally impaled by a lizardman's blade. The mage pleaded for help as the lizardman opened its jaw to make her its lunch. That's one down. As another member of the party was devoured by a lizardman, the leader fell in horror, trying to muffle his cries to avoid attracting attention. Suddenly, he noticed Kang Wu watching the scene unfold. He meekly asked for Kang Wu's help, apologizing for doing the Demon King wrong. But Kang Wu simply replied with a cute wish of good luck. He's the king of taunting. The leader's rage boiled over as he screamed curses at Kang Wu, blaming him for luring the lizardmen to the area. The sound of his screams attracted the lizardmen, who proceeded to feast on the Andres Guild party leader. Bro, you literally started your own downfall. Kang Wu watched apathetically as he contemplated his principles, fight evil with larger evil, and murderous intent with even greater murderous intent. In philosopher Kang Wu we trust. Soon, he unleashed Hellfire, scorching groups of lizardmen into oblivion. After extinguishing the Hellfire, Kang Wu activated his predation skill, increasing his demonic energy by one point. He learned that the Gaia system protected players, but he didn't care about consuming their special abilities. All that mattered was his demonic energy, which had now reached 30. Kang Wu was thrilled with the significant boost in power from his authority of Hellfire. Summoning the demon Andrus Phantom had resulted in a larger and brighter blaze, and even the quality of his demonic energy had improved. All he needed now was to level up. Bigger fires, bigger desires. Picking up a mana stone, Kang Wu became excited for his third awakening. He had been hunting relentlessly for the past few days, and he knew the third awakening could be far off. He left the remains of the Andrus Guild party that had tried to cross him and walked away. Three days later, in Saul's apartment, Kang Wu was shoving a pot of kimchi stew like it was a drink. Once again, he didn't leave a single drop of his favorite dish, praising Saul for her remarkable cooking skills. The food in these panels is making me hungry. When Saul asked if he was going to hunt again that day, Kang Wu confirmed that he was. Sola expressed her concern that he had been pushing himself too hard and hadn't taken a break in the last few days. Our angel is so thoughtful. As she poured lemon tea for Kang Wu, he asked when she would finish the basic education course. She replied that she would finish soon, and that they were going for a goblin hunt the next day. Sola expressed her wish to achieve her second awakening soon, but Kang Wu reassured her that she would get there soon enough. Sola graciously offers Kang Wu tea before he heads out again, and he can't help but see her as an angel taking care of him. Even our MC agrees that she's an actual angel. During their conversation, Sola mentions the rumors of chaos players lurking around the gates. While it might just be hearsay, she reminds Kang Wu to be cautious nonetheless. As Kang Wu hunts in the Lizardman Gate, he reflects on the rumors of chaos players. Could it be because of what he did to the Andres Guild party? But the absence of any witnesses and the bodies looking like they were eliminated by savage Lizardmen suggests otherwise. Kang Wu can't be too sure if he's the one being rumored about but he knows he must prepare for anything and focus on leveling up quickly. Just as he devours the last of the Lizardmen, Kang Wu reaches level 20 and unlocks his third awakening. This time, the surge of power is even more incredible than before. Testing out his newfound strength, he summons the authority of Hellfire, and a massive blaze burns brighter than ever. With each awakening, the seal on his 10,000 demon core weakens, allowing more demonic energy to leak through. The Demon King in his prime must be a menace to society if he's already this strong. As he looks at a magic stone, Kang Wu feeds it to his predation specter, and to his surprise. The magic stone melts seamlessly into his ability. Kang Wu stared intently at the description of his third awakening special ability, Mana Craving. It was a powerful skill that allowed him to convert mana from magic stones into demonic energy. With a single magic stone, he fed his specter, and the increase in demonic energy was apparent. It was surprising to see that it gave the same amount of demonic energy as a monster. This meant that he could easily double his progress, although, he would have to give up earning money from mana stones. This man keeps on getting booster packs. Fortunately, Kang Wu had already earned a lot of money over the past few days, so he didn't need to hold back on consuming mana stones for the time being. He wanted to test out his abilities even more, so he tied his jacket around his waist and prepared to run wild. The muscle gains, though, he's built different. With a burst of force, Kang Wu jumped higher than the trees in the damp forest. He deactivated his predation and activated the authority of Sky, which took the shape of six threatening purple wings, giving him the ability to fly. As he scouted and scarred the forest, Kang Wu regretted not having enough demonic energy to use the authority of observation, which would have allowed him to see through the dense foliage. This is like Tokyo Ghoul, but he can fly. 
Suddenly, he heard an agitated voice in the distance. The voice sounded familiar to him, and as he approached, he saw Kang Taesu, the good guy tank player he had encountered at the Goblin Gate. Taesu was gritting his bloody teeth as he confronted two men hurling insults at him. Kang Wu sneaked around in the background to get a feel of what was going on. He knew that this was not a good situation. He saw the real guy who had been constantly looking for a party outside the gates sprawled on the ground, unconscious and injured. If they bother our boy Taesu, it's on sight for real. Taesu confronted the two attackers, furious that they had harmed members of their own party, but the sinister duo just laughed off his anger. Kang Wu saw that Taesu had been betrayed by these men and suspected they were the infamous chaos players from the rumors. Suddenly, when the chaos players charged towards Taesu with a manacle look in his eyes, but Taesu, using his massive shield, was able to block the attack, sending himself flying with the raw force of the strike. The Chaos players were surprised at how resilient Taesu was for a second stage Awakener. Our MC is not the only person built different in this forest. Taesu proudly stood with his shield, determined to never go down without a fight. His shield began to glow with a magical light, and he strengthened his defense even further. But the Chaos players knew that, without undergoing a third Awakening, Taesu was no match for them. As the Chaos players prepared to finish the fight, Kangwu was torn between curiosity and concern. He remembered his encounter with the good-hearted Taesu and wondered if he should intervene. That's a potential gym buddy for life, dude. As the Chaos player prepared his next attack, Kangwu emerged from hiding, surprising the axe-wielding attacker. But Kangwu was even more shocked to see that these attackers were using demonic energy. The Chaos players taunted Kangwu, warning him that he wouldn't make it out of there in one piece now that he had seen their faces. But Taesu recognized Kangwu and called out to him with respect. It's Operation Saving Taesu. The Chaos players, meanwhile, continued to talk amongst themselves, planning to dispatch Kangwu. They reminded each other that they had already fulfilled their quota with Taesu and the Rogue. The axe wielding Chaos player laughed as he prepared to brandish his demonic energy coated weapon, relishing the chance to kill for the first time in a long while. But Taesu hurriedly shouted at Kangwu to get back as the savage wielded two axes filled with demonic energy and charged towards him. But Kangwu stood his ground, responding with a loud slap across the face before the savage could even touch him. He's the definition of mess around and find out. The Chaos players were confused and afraid, asking each other what was going on as the savage was knocked out cold on the ground. He didn't even know what hit him. Taesu couldn't believe what he was seeing as Kangwu repeatedly slapped the guy on the ground. The other Chaos player charged at Kangwu with his sword covered in demonic energy, but Kangwu remained indifferent. With a single palm strike, Kangwu activated the authority of Destructive Void, and the guy was left writhing in pain as he flew and crashed into a tree, unconscious and with his internal organs in shambles. Kangwu just introduced that guy to his new internal decorator, Chaos and Destruction. The savage watched in horror as Kangwu pulled him up by his red hair and coldly demanded to know where they had obtained the demonic energy. Before the savage could respond with curses, Kangwu forcefully bashed his face into the dirt of the swampy forest. The Demon King got a real hands-on approach to interrogations, doesn't he? Kangwu remained cold and determined as he asserted that he would be the only one asking questions. He asked the defeated savage once more where they obtained their demonic energy, but the man simply responded that he couldn't say. Hearing this response, Kangwu's own demonic energy began to surface. A phantom of a three-eyed malefic demon horse appeared before the man as Kangwu activated the authority of fear. It's really horsing around with that guy's fears. The man was enveloped in horrors he had never experienced before. Under the grip of Kangwu's power, he screamed in terror while Kangwu stood before him in a threatening stance. The man started to mutter the word Guildmaster repeatedly, and the other Chaos player, who had been injured, urged his companion to stop. Seeing the other man get up, Kangwu began to gather a terrifying force of demonic energy once again in the palm of his hands. He hurled the attack towards the man, ordering him to stay out of this. That's what happens when you lack manners. Kangwu continued to press the savage for answers regarding the so-called Guild Master. To his surprise, the savage confessed that they belonged to the Andrus Guild. He explained that the Guild Master had bestowed this power upon them through a ceremony known as the Ritual. Kangwu persisted in his questioning, but the man hesitated to answer. Observing that the man had not yet fully recovered his senses, Kangwu once again activated the authority of fear, invoking an indelible mark of fear upon the man's soul. As the man began to divulge details about the ritual, his body convulsed and trembled, with veins bulging out all over. He was barely able to finish speaking before he started foaming at the mouth and losing his sanity, ultimately spewing a copious amount of blood.
Kangwu found this development frustrating, as it appeared that a device had been implanted in the man to eliminate him if he revealed any information about the ritual. We just stumbled upon the ultimate anti-snitch device. A few moments later, Taesu cautiously approached Kangwu and asked if he was the same Kangwu he knew. At that moment, the rogue regained consciousness. Taesu introduced Kangwu to the rescued rogue, Taehyun, as their savior. Taesu questioned why Kangwu had been in an E rank gate not long ago if he possessed such formidable strength, but Kangwu merely shrugged. Taesu concluded that Kangwu must not have been a novice in the first place. He expressed his sincere gratitude to Kangwu for saving them from the Chaos players, and even Taehyun offered his thanks in a meek voice. Taesu had returned to his cheerful and boisterous self, showering Kangwu with compliments about his immense strength and pledging to repay his debt. Kangwu was unaccustomed to Taesu's upbeat demeanor. Kangwu's strength is causing a Taesu Nami of compliments. Changing the subject, Taesu remarked that he already knew the Andres Guild had a poor reputation, but he found it unbelievable that they would stoop so low as to collaborate with Chaos players. He pulled out his phone, determined to report the incident to the Huarang squad. Kangwu, who was oblivious to this organization, inquired about its nature. Taesu explained that the Huarang squad was a player squad that operated under the direct jurisdiction of the government. If they reported the Andres Guild's activities, the squad would commence an investigation. However, Kangwu urged Taesu not to report what had happened, stating that he would personally take care of the Andres Guild. This surprised both Taesu and Taehyun. Kangwu was a one man army after all. Kangwu confidently declared that he would handle the Andres Guild alone, and Taesu was taken aback. He respectfully acknowledged Kangwu's decision and suddenly kneeled before him, catching Kangwu off guard. Taesu made a solemn vow, stating that he owed his life to Kangwu, and that he would support Kangwu's cause. Together, they would wield the mace of justice against the villains of the Andres Guild. Taesu's words echoed the chivalric spirit of the Murim world, and he claimed to have fallen for Kangwu's passionate sense of duty. As Kangwu looked on awkwardly, not knowing how to respond, all he could think of was how much Taesu resembled his loyal subordinate, Balak. Who else thinks that the two might be twins? The rogue, Taeyun chimed in and expressed his gratitude towards Kangwu, sincerely promising that he too would repay his savior one way or another, even though if he was a RSA, Kangwu was unfamiliar with this term. Taeyuan explained that it means rogues should shut up and apply bandages as bandits are known to be bad at dealing damage or tanking. It's a term coined because people like Taeyuan aren't normally welcomed in parties. How unlucky do you have to be to awaken as a rogue? Taesu suggested building a team right now with the goal of repaying Kangwu. The emotional Taehyun was frustrated that he couldn't do anything against the Chaos players. He feared that he would just hinder Kangwu and the team. He declared with dignity that he wants to become strong enough to assist Kangwu. Taehyun's about to go on his very own training arc. Kangwu was dumbfounded at the quick development of this simple interaction with Taesu and Taehyun. The rogue promptly bid his farewell to the two. Kangwu convinced himself that it would be good to have people indebted to him. But the problem is that he didn't know what to do with the enthusiastic Taesu. He asked the ironclad tank what level he was, and it turned out that he was only level 12, just reaching his second awakening not long ago. His first awakening ability was C rank, so he had an easy time leveling by hunting. Also, his second awakening was classified as A rank. Kangwu was pleased with the potential of this giant. That's a Giga Chat tank in the making right there. When asked about guilds, Taesu just replied that he was considering joining one, but he no longer needs to join one now. He clenched his fists and proudly declared that he made up his mind to follow Kangwu, his image reminiscent of the demon Balak. Kangwu will probably create the best guild by accident. Kangwu saw the potential in Taesu, as a player who receives a high rank for their second awakening, is said to have a higher likelihood of receiving even better abilities in future awakenings. He thought about Sola, who was supposed to have her second awakening soon as well. Kangwu agreed to take the tank in from now on, causing Taesu to joyfully celebrate, thanking his newfound brother, Kangwu. They exchanged contact information so that Taesu could come to Kangwu's aid any time. Kangwu asked for a favor from the Herculean man, which Taesu enthusiastically agreed to without hesitation. Kangwu planned to have Taesu and Sol form a party to hunt and become stronger together. Taesu was happy to oblige, especially after learning that Sol is a healer class. With their affairs settled, Taesu asked Kangwu if he was ready to head to the Andra's guild right now. Kangwu contemplated his next move. Let him cook. The remaining Chaos player lay unconscious and injured in the forest bushes. Kangwu woke him up with a chokehold against a tree and began to interrogate him. 
He warned the man not to lie and began his questioning. The man's name was Kang Chilho. Kang Wu asked Chulho what they meant by capturing players alive and bringing them back. Chulho replied that he didn't remember, and Kang Wu responded with a swift and sharp kick to the face, sending the man to the ground in pain. Looks like Chulho's memory needs a little kickstart. Kang Wu grabbed Chulho by his hair and repeated the question. He fearfully confessed that they captured players alive to offer them as sacrifices. The trembling Chulho couldn't predict Kang Wu's next move. Kang Wu threw Chulho away like trash. Frustrated with the number of lunatics he had encountered, he even recalled the delinquent Han Taehyun saying the same thing a few days ago. Birds of the same crappy feather flock together. With a devious smile, Kang Wu grabbed the bloody Chul Ho. Resembling a demon more than a human, Kang Wu menacingly asked the trembling man for a favor. In the depths of the night, a man can be seen pulling some luggage in the sea part of the city. The neon signs of establishments are his only source of light. It's Kang Chul Ho. He is stopped by another man who shines a flashlight on his face. The white-haired man confirms Kang Chulho's identity and asks what took him so long. Upon seeing Chulho's battered and bruised face, he expresses incredulity that he sustained such injuries from a simple D-rank gait. He also asks about the savage man named Taeho, to which Chulho hurriedly informs him that Taeho is dead. As they say, snitches get stitches. The skeptical white-haired man continues to question Chulho incessantly. Chulho answers that there was a high-level player among the sacrifices, and that's why Taeho was eliminated, and he barely escaped. He opens the luggage revealing the bloody, dark-haired sacrifice. That sacrifice looks like it's seen better days. The white-haired man confirms the condition of the sacrifice, but he's still skeptical about Chulho. He reassures Chulho that it's better to have fewer people, and since Chulho wrought the sacrifice, he will get baptized, obtaining all the demonic energy for himself. Chulho looks distressed as the man accuses him of killing his companion to monopolize the demonic energy. Chulho leaves the sacrifice and runs away from the man and the luggage as fast as possible. The fear in Chulho's face is evident as he dashes as far away as possible. The white-haired man brings the sacrifice inside a suspicious building. Inside the suspicious establishment lies a large hall adorned with the insignia of the Andra's Guild. An altar is located at its center, and multiple figures donning robes stand around. This is the headquarters of the Andra's Guild. I'm not an expert on cults, but that's definitely a cult. The guild leader reprimanded the man for being late, but the subordinate tried to explain. However, the masked guild leader only cared about the sacrifice and beckoned his underling to bring it forth. The luggage was opened, and robed figures chanted praises for the great Andra's as the sacrifice. Kang Wu was carried towards the altar. MC is about to win Oscars with how good he's acting in this. The guild leader mused to himself that it had been a year since his conversion, and his followers were steadily increasing in number. He's been enticing players, preying on their thirst for power through demonic energy. Removing his mask, the guild leader revealed an unhinged expression as the ceremony commenced. He ordered for the magic stones to be prepared, and the followers hurriedly complied. A treasure box filled with countless magic stones was seen being prepared at the altar. Free magic stones? Don't mind if I do. That's probably what our boy is thinking. The leader continued to revel in his plan to become more demonized and eventually become a complete demon. He asked the servants who would be baptized that day but Chulho, who was supposed to be baptized, had already fled and refused to partake in the ceremony. As the followers became confused about who would be baptized, the guild leader banged his staff and demanded silence. He lectured that those who do not work do not deserve to be baptized. He continued, stating that they would not be present at the ceremony to become stronger if it were not for him. Therefore, this ownerless sacrifice would belong to him. And with that, the ceremony would begin. This man is not only crazy, he's also a bad boss. Give some for the people man. The guild leader crushed a magic stone in front of the altar, releasing its magic throughout the room. He's pleased with the number of magic stones his guild had amassed, allowing him to hold more and more ceremonies to grow stronger than ever before. A sinister crack in the fabric of reality appeared above the altar, and demonic energy poured out. The deranged leader was ecstatic at the sight of the magnificent demonic energy surging. He wished he could immediately absorb it into his body, but demonic energy was too dangerous for humans to take in. Only death would follow without a medium to absorb it. However, if he let the sacrifice absorb demonic energy until they could no longer, he could drink the power through the blood of their corpse and effectively absorb refined demonic energy. So they're basically glorified mosquitoes. He masterfully directed the cascading demonic energy towards the body of Kangwu, letting it engulf the ceremony's sacrifice. 
He continued to direct the demonic energy towards Kang Wu, impressed with how much the sacrifice was absorbing. He became overjoyed at this discovery since the longer the sacrifice lasted, the more demonic energy he could obtain. Free demonic energy. What great deal. He frenziedly reveled at this sacrifice absorbing five times more than a normal human, then ten times fifteen, and celebrated what an incredible sacrifice this human was. He could not wait to know how much demonic energy he would obtain after absorbing it from Kang Wu. He manically laughed at the prospect of his sacrifice pathetically screaming as he injected him with demonic energy. The amount of energy absorbed by Kang Wu was astounding. 17 times more than a normal human. 20 times, 30 times, 40, 50. However, as the demonic energy continued to swirl around the altar, the terrifying hue it did not show any signs of stopping, and the guild leader began to suspect that something was wrong. If only my bank account could absorb money as well as Kang Wu absorbs demonic energy. The guild leader panicked, slowly realizing what was happening. He repeatedly screamed for the ceremony to stop, to no avail. Even the followers were starting to sense that something was wrong. The manic guild leader looked like he was going insane as he screamed at the top of his lungs to stop the ritual. And that's when the rift above the altar dissipated. The guild leader kneeled in defeat at what had just happened. He could not believe what had transpired. That's when Kangwu started to get up from lying down on the altar. It turned out that the boost from the sacrificial ceremony had allowed him to level up 20 stats. The leader looked incredulously at the supposed sacrifice, slowly standing up from the altar. Kang Wu mocked the leader by saying that they should do this ceremony thing one more time. The playful Kang Wu infuriated the guild leader. Imagine robbing a whole demonic guild while pretending to sleep. The leader trembled in anger, denying what had just happened. The followers could see how insane their leader looked. He charged at Kang Wu while spouting curses and gathering demonic energy in his staff. He cast his spell, which resembled Kang Wu's Hellfire, and the amused Kang Wu simply dodged to the side. The Hellfire spell landed and exploded on the ground as Kang Wu praised it as not bad. That's not Hellfire. That's cute fire. The enraged leader cast even more small Hellfire balls around him, intending to burn Kang Wu alive. Five Hellfire balls locked onto Kang Wu would promptly converge to wipe him out. With a massive explosion, Kang Wu's figure was engulfed by the brightness of Hellfire. Contrary to what the guild leader expected, his small hellfire balls were deflected all over the place. He couldn't believe what had just happened to his spell as he looked at his supposed sacrifice, sensing pure demonic energy. Kang Wu emerged clad in a sinister, imposing half-armor fitting for a demon king. He had activated the authority of Iron Wall. Kang Wu smiled cunningly as it had certainly gotten more convenient for him to pull this off with more demonic energy. New armors looking sick as hell, literal hell. The frustrated leader hurriedly ordered his followers to start attacking the armored Kang Wu. The mob of rogue Andra's guild members charged towards their target, brandishing different weapons and shouting their war cries. Kang Wu stood steadily as demonic energy swirled around him. When one member wielding a sword got inside his striking distance, he activated the authority of Blade and took the first blood by cutting off the member's hand that was holding the sword. That's one way to disarm your opponent, literally. Kang Wu followed it up with a forceful kick in the stomach, sending the amputated member towards his guildmates. The relentless Kang Wu didn't stop and charge towards the mass of road figures. He readied his blade and promptly stabbed another member in the shoulder. That's when the guild leader beckoned his underlings to get out of the way. Catching Kang Wu's attention, this guild leader really thinks he's him. The members made space with utmost confidence for their master, Chu Duk Yun. Duk Yun confidently laughed as he urged everyone to watch his next move. He maniacally chanted his spell, which consisted of flames that could incinerate all life forms. The authority of Hellfire. Kang Wu looked at the proud Duk Yun intently and couldn't help but laugh at the pathetic, try hard guy. Duk Yun continued his villainous tirade while looking insane, confident that the man in front of him could not surpass his power. That's when Kang Wu activated the real authority of Hellfire. A massive and fierce hue of Hellfire blazed in the hall, towering over everyone. It dwarfed the tiny hellfire that Duk Yun had managed to conjure with all his power, and Kang Wu did this effortlessly. Duk Yun looked on in shock. This wasn't how he had imagined the scenario would go. He stood there, terrified of the gargantuan mass of hellfire that Kang Wu had conjured out of thin air while holding his own paltry fireball. His brain could not process that this was really happening. I personally think that it's not just the size of the hellfire, it's how you use it. He looked into the face of the devil and knew that he could not beat something like that. With that in mind, he decided to extinguish his spell. The Andra's guild leader, Duk Yun. 
kneeled in front of the massive hellfire-wielding Kangwu. When Kangwu asked what he was doing, he screamed at the top of his lungs, praising Kangwu as the incarnation of the great Andres. This dude did a 360 so smoothly. Kangwu could not believe what this guy was saying. Tokyun continued, saying that they had been waiting for Kangwu's descent, calling him the king, god, and the messiah himself, the tyrant who should rightfully rule the world. He scolded his followers to get on their knees and bow their heads to Kangwu. Kangwu caught on to what the leader was doing and praised him for his quick reaction. Dukyun continued to sing his praises to the highest degree, even to the point of trembling while on his knees. Haters turn around when they see how big your hellfire is. That's just life. Kangwu considered that at least this guy wasn't completely worthless, as he understood his place and was groveling before him. Kangwu extinguished his hellfire and decided to play along. He activated the authority of Sky and the six sinister wings appeared behind him. Kangwu did his best evil laugh as he rode along with what Dukyun had set up. Kangwu psychotically introduced himself as the great Andres, the king of hellfire, and the king of all demons. This man is the most versatile actor in the world. Dukyun groveled like he'd never groveled before. He vehemently worshipped the name of the man in front of him. With a knowing smile, Kangwu ordered Dukyun to dismiss all his subordinates, as he would love to have a discussion with him. One-on-one, -on -one, man to man conversation, nothing more. Kangwu began his discussion with the guild leader by allowing him to introduce himself as Cho Dukyun. Kangwu sat at the altar holding the magic staff while Dukyun knelt in front of him. As Dukyun was about to praise Kangwu once again, he ordered him to drop the act. Both of them knew that he was not Andres. Dukyun felt awkward, but quickly dropped the act and asked Kangwu who he really was. This duo should consider a career shift into showbiz with how good they act. Kangwu responded by grabbing him by his cloak and forbidding him to ask any questions. The look of disdain and contempt in Kangwu's eyes frightened Dukyun. Kangwu asked Dukyun how this ceremony was possible and how he learned to create a crack with magic stones. The mighty Dukyun shivered in fear as he confessed that he learned how to make cracks after being preached to. One day, a man wearing a demon mask approached him and said that eternal life could be achieved by following the demonic religion. This is why our parents warns us to never talk to strangers. Kangwu threw him on the floor, calling him crazy for accepting the deal without knowing what he was getting into. Dukyun revealed that he had no choice, as the masked man was too powerful. He remembered how the mysterious figure had overpowered his entire guild in an instant and commanded them to follow orders or die. He continued that they had to accept the preaching and follow orders. Kangwu pressed the mumbling Dukyun about the masked man. Dukyun hurriedly denied knowing anything more about him, as he had not seen him since that day, and they received orders by mail. Seems like demons haven't discovered the internet or texting yet. Kangwu poked the guild leader with his own staff as he mocked him for following orders so blindly. Kangwu concluded that they might have been forced to do so in the beginning. But under the sweet temptation of power from demonic energy, this man started to initiate ceremonies of his own. Kangwu contemplated hard about the identity of this masked man. This demonic religion seemed to be just another unremarkable cult. But these scoundrels knew how to get to hell. This was something he could not overlook. The haughty Kangwu ordered Duk Yun to retrieve the letters containing their orders. The guild leader handed him a single letter, and Duk Yun's phobia of the man in front of him was growing by the second. It turned out that the orders were straightforward. Accept the demonic energy and become a demon, and recruit as many players as possible. So basically, it's a demonic pyramid scheme. Kangwu continued to ask if Duk Yun was the only one who was preached to, but the guild leader was not too sure. Kangwu got up, concluding that this wasn't an isolated incident. Unless they were fools, they wouldn't have pinned this mission on Dukyun alone. This was a plan to increase their forces. Lifting the leader by his collar, Kangwu's rage was building as he learned about these villains who dared to turn Earth into Hell. Kangwu resembled a seething demonic creature as he once again summoned the Phantom of the Authority of Fear. He told Dukyun that he was going to list down three things to remember. The first thing was an order to investigate this demonic religion. The second was to never perform any of these ceremonies again. And third, Dukyun must keep everything that happened between him and Kangwa secret. Three simple rules, no demonizing, no evangelizing, and no compromising. The once mighty leader was sobbing and gagging in fear as he complied with Kangwu's demands. Kangwu let Dukyun go, running away from him. He reckoned that even if he were to stop these activities from occurring again, the damage made by the Andra's guild was already done. They had already sacrificed too many people. He contemplated that since the government forces had been paying attention to this, they might catch him conducting his investigation into the demonic religion. But it was worth looking into it. Kangwu felt confident in the authority of fear, 
so there was no chance of information leaking. He planned to discard this guild when they had served their purpose. With a sigh of exhaustion, Kangwu realized that it had been a rough day. Now, it was time to get some healing. A few moments later, Kangwu beamed with a bright smile as he greeted Sola upon arriving home. She had been worried sick as Kangwu had not contacted her for a long time, so she rushed towards him in exasperation. All of us need a Sola in our lives. Kangwu looked at his phone, filled with missed calls from the beautiful lady. He sincerely apologized for worrying her and Sola let out a sigh of relief to see Kangwu safe and sound. Thanking Sola for her concern, Kangwu promised to contact her next time. She blushed at this adorable interaction. The ship is sailing. Now that Kangwu was home, it was time for dinner, and his favorite dish, kimchi stew, would be served. Sala already knew Kangwu's cravings, so she prepared the dish with high-quality meat. The Demon King thanked the angel from the bottom of his heart for making him delicious dinners every night. Kangwu was out here living the life. As Sala put on her apron, she mentioned that she had finally achieved her second awakening. She confidently boasted to Kangwu that she had achieved a B-rank and gained the special ability called Blessing of Light. Kangwu thought that at this rate, they were going to make an amazing party with the addition of Taesu, a high-rank healer and tanker. If these two work together, they would have the strength beyond other parties. The Demon King party is shaping up nicely. It turned out that Sala was being invited to join multiple guilds. Kangwu asked her which one she would join, but she revealed that she did not want to join a guild. Instead, she wanted to be of help to her savior, Kangwu. He thought that this woman might really be an angel from above. We agree, Kangwu. We agree. However, Kangwu told Sola that, even though she had awakened to a high-ranking ability, he did not think it would be a good idea for her to join him. Sola was taken aback by this. She looked down sadly as Kangwu told her that her current abilities would not be a great help to him now. Seeing Sola's reaction, he mused that maybe later, but not yet. Our MC is too addicted to the grind to see what's in front of him. He's too strong, much stronger than those at his level. If he formed a party now, he wouldn't gain enough experience or engage in serious battles. To train properly, he needs to form a party with high compatibility. That's why Kangwu suggested introducing her to the A-rank tanker, Taesu. Kangwu proposed that Sola should team up with Taesu and Hunt, gaining more battle experience with a skilled tanker. Sola agreed, albeit with a hint of sadness. But Kangwu promised that once she gained enough experience, they could form a party for higher rank gates. Sala's spirits lifted, and she confirmed that she would form a party with the tank. Where can I send my application for this party? Kangwu reassured her that since both she and Taesu have high ranking abilities, leveling up would be a breeze. Sala was thrilled to hear this as she really wanted to level up quickly to join Kangwu's party. Kangwu even offered to sponsor everything Sala needed until then. For him, it was all an investment. Can you sponsor me as well? As they chatted, the kimchi stew was finished and served in front of Kangwu. He gazed at his favorite dish with pure joy. A piece of heaven itself. Sala suddenly stopped him just as he was about to dig in, urging him to try with something different today. The sight of her adding ramyo noodles and toppings to his favorite meal evoked priceless joy in the demon king's eyes. The pot shone brighter than ever in his eyes as he reached out for the chopsticks and thought about the demonic religion. He didn't know who they were, but he vowed to protect this earth with ramyun toppings and kimchi stew, no matter what. Kang Wu has the best motivation to save the world, kimchi stew with ramyun. The next day, Kang Wu visited the player support center under the bright sun. He eagerly inquired about his C-rank player card, only to be informed that he would have to wait until the following day to receive it. Disappointed but understanding, he learned that his card required a process magic stone identification which couldn't be provided immediately. As Kangwu left the center, he felt a bit lost in thought. Since returning to Earth, he had not taken a proper rest day. Knowing he couldn't act against the demonic religion now, he decided to take the opportunity to rest and enjoy his time. Get some much needed vacation time, bro. Strolling amongst the bustling crowd, Kangwu wondered what he should do on his day off. He recalled spending most of his time reading webtoons and novels before his descent to hell but he knew things couldn't be the same as they were 10,000 years ago. He's actually just like me, for real. He had worked too hard to get back to Earth and needed to enjoy everything he could. That's when he spotted a PC cafe, which he had never seen before. The idea of renting a PC and ordering food seemed like heaven on Earth. He rented a nice gaming chair and ordered some ramen. As he heard, it was best enjoyed in a PC room. Surprised by the experience, Kangwoo clicked on the most popular game at the time, which had an ongoing event. 
The game offered various classes such as support, tanks, and required players to form parties with different roles, just like real-life hunting. This man is playing League of Legends after crawling back from hell. You are out of your mind. Kangwoon decided his role would be a merciless killer and picked the cuddly-looking raccoon. Of course, he plays the devil himself, Timo. As the game started, he was amazed by the immersive experience of killing monsters and gaining gold. However, his teammates started trash-talking him for stealing gold. Kangwoo effortlessly clapped back at his teammate during a classic trash-talk battle, while his ramium was served and ready. He chomped on his delicious meal, and as luck would have it, his in-game teammate died. This did not bother Kangwoo, who continued to enjoy his food, even munching on some pickled radish. Meanwhile, his teammate raged in tilt mode on the in-game chat. Kangwoo relished the amazing flavors of his ramen and pickled radish, washing it down with soda, deciding that he will have it again next time. It was like heaven to him. But suddenly, someone in the room started screaming and cursing, complaining about getting a stupid teammate right before ranking up. That's a real gamer right there. Perplexed, Kangwoo looked around, trying to identify the source of the commotion. Suddenly, a fierce woman wearing a cap yelled at him, asking him to look elsewhere, as she was in a terrible mood. When she realized that Kangwoo was her in-game partner, she walked towards him, warning him to stop eating in the middle of the game. Help him. He's being harassed by an e-girl. The angry woman threatened to take Kangwoo outside with her, but he had no clue what she was talking about. This only fueled her rage, and she accused him of trolling her. Suddenly, she tried to grab Kangwoo by his collar without warning, but he quickly dodged her attack. Calmly, Kangwoo called the woman out for bullying and lashing out at him out of nowhere. The woman made several attempts to grab Kangwoo, but he remained calm and managed to dodge each time. As he watched her movements, he began to wonder what her deal really was. With a serious expression and radiating intense pressure, the woman attempted to grab Kangwoo again, but he quickly stood up and dodged to the side. The woman repeated the same moves, slowly increasing her speed with each attempt. Her hands moved so quickly that they became blurred, but Kangwoo was still able to keep up. After a final, full force strike, the woman's relentless assault came to a stop. She stared at Kangwoo, who was unscathed. Imagine going beast mode inside a PC cafe. In an ardent tone, she asked the mysterious man in front of her if he was sent by the Mer Guild. Kangwoo only knew the Mer Guild as one of the top five guilds, but when his woman talked about it, he denied being part of any guild. She clenched her fist, suspecting he was lying. How could someone like him not be in a guild? Kangwoo asked her what guild she was in. Proudly, she boasted being in the most infamous and top five guild in the country, but she stopped herself from revealing its name. She remembered to keep her affiliations secret, but the excitement got the best of her. She does look familiar, doesn't she? As she kept talking, Kangwoo politely checked out on the register. He was already over her, finding it annoying to deal with her. The woman demanded him to stop fooling around and give a serious reply. She assumed he was an A-rank without a guild, which was unheard of. To shut her up, Kangwoo presented his D-rank player card. The woman could not believe he was an actual beginner. Kangwoo reminded her to be nice as he nearly died earlier. She just got wrecked by some noob. The woman knew she would have easily dealt with Kangwoo if he were a beginner, but what she saw was not a newbie's technique. Kangwoo strode off, leaving the woman in shock. Something was not adding up. Kangwoo walked out onto the streets, lost in thought once again. He reaffirmed that he was still weak, but he had fighting reflexes from 10,000 years of hellish combat experience. He hadn't expected to meet someone who was on a similar level so quickly. He thought back to the barrage of attacks the woman had unleashed. The final move particularly haunted Kangwoo. For a moment, the woman had left his field of view, leaving him vulnerable. Kangwoo wondered who in the world that woman really was. At the same moment, someone was sneaking outside a window. With a tall leap downwards, the woman from the PC cafe took cover in the darkness of an alleyway. Ensuring that no one was nearby, she started contacting someone with her phone that had the insignia of a rose. The voice on the other line recognized her as Chai Yan Ju and connected her to HR. A man wearing glasses named Park Yoon Woo picked up. He was the Red Rose's HR leader. It was revealed that this woman was the Red Rose's guild leader, Chai Yan Ju. I knew it, she's an OP character. She promptly ordered Yoon Woo to investigate someone extremely important. She thought that this might or might not be related to the demonic religion worshippers. She warned Yoon Woo that this man was very suspicious. The man known as Okangwoo was a mystery. She thought that since it was a D-rank player card she saw, it could be easier to fake compared to the succeeding ranks with a mana discerning device feature. 
The HR leader asked if it was possible that this D-ranked player was going around attacking players of the same rank. But Chai Yanju was certain that this guy didn't belong in D-rank as he was skilled enough to predict her movements. This shocked the man on the phone. Even if Yanju didn't go 100%, there had been no demonic religion follower skilled enough even react to her movements. Yanju had faced many challenges in her extensive investigation of the demonic religion, but none had given her as much trouble as Kangwu. His godlike reflexes had left her struggling to even touch him. And now, based on his skill level, she couldn't help but suspect that he might be the actual leader of the demonic religion. She's not entirely wrong, right? Kang Wu is the demon king after all. As the threat of the demonic religion grew, Yan Ju and her team knew they couldn't ignore any possibility. They had to investigate Kang Wu thoroughly and immediately. The call ended with Yan Ju pondering whether Kang Wu was part of the demonic religion or not. She looked down at the single button she had managed to rip from his jacket. Kang Wu had been annoyed at losing it but had walked away, disappointed at his interrupted break. He knew he had to get stronger to prepare for the future, starting with a visit to his C-rank gate as soon as he got his card tomorrow. In both of their minds, a thought lingered. They were certain of one thing, the other person was stronger than themselves. Yanju knew that if Kang Wu really was a D-rank with that level of talent, it would be disastrous for her. Her position as a high-rank player was no longer guaranteed with Kang Wu in the picture. As Yanju returned to the PC cafe, she was reminded of what had triggered the incident in the first place. Her rank in the game they were playing had been demoted, and her rage boiled as she cursed Kang Wu's name, vowing to find and kill him. This is the sanest Lee player. Meanwhile, as Kang Wu walked down the streets, he felt a sudden chill. It's a new day and we find Kang Wu among the bustling crowd of players near a gate once again. Armed with the knowledge he's gathered, Kang Wu prepares to tackle the Mokdong C-rank gate, which is filled with dangerous C-rank trolls. However, before he can enter, uniformed officers stop him. It appears that solo play is forbidden, and only parties of five with a C-rank license are allowed to enter today because the chief troll has appeared inside. Despite this setback, Kang Wu counts himself lucky that the boss monster spawns so soon after he obtained his license. As the surrounding players group up to strategize, Kang Wu notices a stark contrast between this C-rank gate and lower-ranked ones. The equipment is better, but the inspection process is stricter, posing a challenge for Kang Wu who wants to monopolize the rewards by going alone. Boss loot alert. Some parties are enthusiastic about the hunt, while others are hesitant about facing the chief troll. Kang Wu observes and senses it all, including the uncertainty, restlessness, fear, and expectation among the players. In the face of this, Kang Wu malevolently smiles and quietly activates his demonic energy, knowing that a spoonful of rage is the perfect addition to his plan. He knows he doesn't have to approach this like the hobgoblin boss last time. He knows that humans can be pushed just an inch, so he'll give them a tiny boost. He silently taps one player on the shoulder and Kang Wu activated the authority of rage, infecting the unsuspecting man. The player immediately displays his anger, calling out to his confused party members, recalling how they used to get beaten up by thugs and were in their own type of hell. Then the gates open, and they are given the power to not have to crawl around like weak worms. He ragefully screams that what they're doing now is just like the past, and he doesn't want to bend to the will of monsters anymore. As the party questions the raving man, Kang Wu executes another quiet touch infecting another player with rage, and then another one, and the rage of the players slowly starts infecting everyone. It comes to the point that almost every player around the gate is screaming in anger, itching to hunt down the boss monster inside the gate. He just created the angriest player party ever. The officers are confused at this development, but the mob of players relentlessly storms the entrance of the gate. The rage in their faces and voices is palpable. Everyone runs for the biggest and angriest hunt of their life, as the officers are distracted by the tsunami of players. They call for backup. Meanwhile, Kang Wu easily sneaks past security with the authority of Sky. He lands at the entrance of the gate, pleased with the results of his power. He's about to reap all the rewards in this gate. The gate takes the form of a desert with ruins scattered all over the place. Kang Wu walks the vast wilderness and brutal terrain of this gate. He knows finding the boss mob will be a problem. He wonders if he'll have to use the authority of Sky to scout the massive desert. That's when an idea popped into his mind. Kang Wu quickly checked his status window and saw that his demonic energy had reached 53, which should be enough for a better plan. He jumped towards the highest altitude he could find and landed, putting his palms on the surface. He activated the demon Astaroth's authority of observation. A phantom of a demon with a blood red, all-seeing eye appeared in the sky, and its observation power quickly covered the massive area of the desert. 
Kang Wu was overwhelmed by the information from everything within his power's reach, but he pushed through the pain of harnessing Astaroth's power as he spotted countless trolls. Who needs Google Maps when you have Kang Wu and his demon powers? Eventually, he found the chief troll among his underlings. Kang Wu deactivated his draining power and began to plan how to take on the chief troll and its soldiers. From above, Kang Wu spotted a mob of players thirsting for a hunt. He decided to use this group to his advantage. He quickly jumped from one area to another, planning to use the player mob to take care of the smaller trolls as he took on the chief troll by himself. Work smarter, not harder. For now, Kang Wu wanted to lure the trolls away. He gathered an immense amount of demonic energy in his hands, preparing for the onslaught. His demonic energy took on a sharp aura as he formed a dark and terrifying spear. He brandished the remarkably sharp spear and spun the shaft around, trying to gather momentum. With a bloodthirsty look in his eyes, he prepared to throw it at his target. The spear traveled like a bullet towards the horde of trolls, and forcefully struck the heart of the giant chief troll. Kang will receive a notification that he had successfully defeated the B-rank boss chief troll. The already dumb soldier trolls were even more dumbfounded as they saw their chief lying on the ground with a massive spear through its chest. That's what you call a heart-stopping victory. Kang Wu received triple the XP for eliminating the boss, and he leveled up four times. He was even more dumbfounded than the trolls, he hadn't expected to one-shot the boss. Kang Wu was so caught off guard that he even doubted if this was really the boss monster. Although it was indicated in the notification, he could not believe that a C-rank gate boss would be so weak. But no, it wasn't weak. It was a boss mob with strength befitting that of the gate. It's just that Kang Wu had become much stronger than he initially thought. He had planned to hunt as safely as possible. But at this rate, he might as well go all out. He jumped down towards the troll horde, activating the authority of the blade. Our boy looks like that one Bane meme. With how strong he had become, he knew he needed to change his plan. The trolls began their angry charge towards the man that killed their chief. But Kang Wu stood confidently in the face of the monster's charge. A sly smile began to form on his mouth as his expression morphed to his usual look when he's about to begin wiping out hordes and monsters. In the blink of an eye, he was already outside of the troll horde encirclement, and the trolls stopped in their tracks completely as a sharp glint could be seen. Kang Wu's blade glowed in a mysterious hue, and the trolls started to feel that something was amiss. With a single slash, every single troll was left with a wound that emanated the same mysterious energy from Kang Wu's blade. If the trolls could talk, it would have said, ouch, in unison. A bright energy began to pour out from the wounds of the clueless trolls. It brightened even more, until all of them were eviscerated from the inside. Sharp blades started to grow from where Kang Wu slashed them, lacerating their internal organs. Kang Wu stood in glory as if he was an artist that just made his masterpiece. The trolls screamed in pain as a bloodbath covered the desert sand. With the amount of demonic power that he currently possessed, it was now possible to use the authority of the blade to cause internal explosions. After dispatching a decent chunk of the troll horde, Kang Wu immediately gained two levels. He even acquired an A-rank skill, Terra Blade, which he seemed to have gained after repeated use of his blade. This was amazing news for Kang Wu, as skills that have been registered can be utilized with greater precision and detail. He planned to test out his new skill right there and then. His fingertip took a demonic form and opened, as a vile liquid started to pour out. Kang Wu needs a manicure badly. A single drop of the liquid reverberated throughout the whole area, creating bigger and bigger circular patterns on the ground around Kang Wu. The clueless and terrified trolls didn't know what this man was going to do to them. One troll stepped on the circular pattern and a blade suddenly protruded, stabbing him on the foot. It's like stepping on Legos, but more deadly. Realizing what was happening, the trolls tried to make a run for it. But Kang Wu was not going to let that happen. He activated his skill, and a forest of sharp blades appeared around the area of the circular patterns. The trolls ran in fear as every single one of them was slaughtered in the sharp hellscape. Kang Wu was extremely pleased with the efficiency of his new skill as he stared at the blood-stained sand of the desert. Now, he would indulge in his reward. He activated the authority of Purgation spawning his vile specters to devour the flesh and blood of the monsters. He cleared the area, but only increased his demonic energy by two. He even devoured every magic stone of the monsters, but it only increased his demonic energy by such a small amount. It really was harder to progress the stronger he got. All the hunting had rapidly increased his level. Now, there were only four more levels until he could have his fourth awakening. With that in mind, he decided to hunt some more. We see a mob of anger-infected players who are frustrated and complaining that there wasn't even a sign of the boss monster. They didn't even see regular trolls, let alone the chief. 
All they saw was a bunch of trolls running away in fear, and a massive boss-sized crater with no corpse in it. The disappointed Mega Party decided to call it quits and reluctantly decided to leave the gate. They are looking to blame the government for misleading them with the boss hunt. Kang Wu sees this scene while in hiding, as he plans to join them slowly outside and make his escape amidst the commotion. Outside the gate, the enraged players demand accountability from the officers, demanding the government to compensate for their wasted time. Kang Wu just stood in the background, pleased with how much chaos these guys are spreading. That's when someone silenced the crowd with a dignified voice. We see the prestigious red uniform of the Huarang Corps. The player crowd was confused that the powerful Huarang Corp appeared in this area and why there were so many of them. They quickly fell in line as it wasn't worth ruining their life even though they were angry. Kangwa was thinking how this is such a waste of time as he just wants to go home. That's when a lofty figure of a woman with white hair strode amongst the Huarang Corp officers. The crowd immediately recognized this woman as the commander of Hua Rang Corps Unit 3, Beck Huayan. That's a dummy mommy right there. Beck Huayan demanded the attention of everyone present with her grand presence. She informed the players that there have been reports of Chaos players appearing at D-Rank gates. Therefore, they will conduct random inspections on all players that have achieved their third awakening. She demanded the players' cooperation in this case. Kang Wu doesn't have a good feeling about all of this. The third unit started to inspect the player cards of everyone present, as Beck Huayan stood majestically in all her glory. Huayan made it clear that the checking process wouldn't be complicated, providing some relief to the players. However, Kang Wu had some concerns given his recent actions that could put him in trouble. He wondered if the Huarang Corps was specifically targeting him. Kang Wu recognized the danger of standing out and drawing attention from the officers, with vigilant eyes watching his every move, especially Commander Beck Huayan's. He knew it would be difficult to escape unnoticed. As he pondered his next move, a polite voice interrupted him, asking for his player card. To his surprise, the elegant Beck Wei and herself was conducting his inspection. Kang Wu complied, feeling increasingly paranoid. Maybe Kang Wu got some militaristic riz? As chaos players and a demonic religion began to make their moves, Kang Wu realized he needed to be more cautious. He saw this as an opportunity to gather information from Wei and herself and devise a plan accordingly. Kang Wu expressed his gratitude to Commander Huayan for conducting the random inspection herself. She explained that leading by example is essential to maintain her prestige as a leader. Impressed by Huayan's resolve, Kang Wu steered the conversation towards the Chaos players. Huayan confirmed that the inspection was in response to their increasing numbers. After examining Kang Wu's card, she returned it and he thanked her for her diligent work. Kang Wu feigned innocence, remarking that killing for money is a scary thought. Huayan replied that money is, indeed, frightening. Huayan's reply just sprung Kang Wu's trap. It revealed that the government was concealing the true intentions of the Chaos players and pursuing the demonic cult. As Huayan bid Kang Wu farewell, he asked which Chaos players they were investigating, offering to report them if he encountered any. Huayan thanked him for his initiative, but insisted that protecting players was their duty. She advised Kang Wu to raise his level in D rank gates for his safety, since he was still relatively new to C rank. She praised his kindness and expressed hope to see more players like him in the future. I personally would fold it if she praised me like that. As Wei-Yan walks away, Kang Wu can't help but wonder if this was a secret investigation. With the government cracking down on demon worshippers, he decides it's best to lie low for a while and calls his tanky friend Tae Su to meet up soon. A few days later, Kang Wu, Tae Su, and Sola are sitting in a cafe. Kang Wu introduces the two, and Tae Su, being his usual enthusiastic self, makes Sola a bit intimidated. Taesu notices Sola moving closer to Kangwu and teases him about it, but Kangwu reminds him of the favor he promised to take Sola hunting in D rank gates. Excited at the prospect of having a healer like Sola, Taesu asks her about her abilities. She explains that her blessing of light not only heals but also buffs strength, health, and dexterity. And to everyone's surprise, she can use attack spells too. Taesu is impressed and says that even a high tier guild like Hanol would take her in immediately. Kangwu is amazed at the extent of Sola's abilities. Throughout the conversation, Taesu repeatedly calls Sola sister-in-law, making Kangwu blush and Sola smile. Kangwu is over the moon at the thought of having such an amazing lady by his side. Taesu is full of energy, declaring his intention to make history with Kangwu. Kangwu can't help but find Taesu's enthusiasm a little overwhelming as he watches him gulp down his coffee like it's beer. When Kangwu asks if Taesu has anyone in mind for the party's damaged dealers, Taesu immediately has two people in mind. They're talented players who just completed their second awakening, yet they still haven't joined any guilds. 
Taesu boasts that he has a good eye for people, but Kangwoo is skeptical, remembering the chaos players that Taesu was involved with. Despite Kangwoo's concerns, Taesu insists that the damage dealers are trustworthy, having met them during his early days of goblin hunting. Kangwoo asks Sola if she's comfortable with the suggestion, and she's eager to increase her level and be around Kangwoo. Kangwoo reminds her that her safety is the most important thing, and Taesu can't help but be happy to see his brother in a lovey dovey conversation. Taesu is the best third wheeler. The plan is settled, and they agree to meet near East Inshin the next day. Kangwoo wonders why they're going to a farther gate instead of a nearby one. And Taesu explains that the closer gates have had a lot of incidents lately. Instead, they're going to take on trolls in a D rank gate, as they're stronger than lizardmen, but still a good stepping stone. Kangwoo praises Taesu's plan, realizing that there's more to him than just muscles. He could not find a better subordinate than this gentle giant. With that, Kangwoo bade his farewell to Sola and Taesu. When asked where he'll be heading after this, Kangwoo answered simply, He's going to level up. Kangwoo is just one step away from his fourth awakening, at level 29. With the authority of observation activated, the all seeing eye phantom reappeared in the sky, and Kangwoo quickly spotted a group of eight trolls lounging in the sand. With lightning speed, he raced past them, his blade leaving a glint in its wake. The unsuspecting trolls were quickly reduced to a bloody mess on the desert floor. As Kangwoo wiped his blade clean, he couldn't help but wonder how many more he had to hunt to level up. Suddenly, the smell of human blood hit him like a ton of bricks. It was strong, too strong to be from a mere hunting ground. Kangwoo raced towards the source, knowing that a massacre of five to six people had taken place. As he thought about who could have done such a thing, he realized that the chances of a Chaos player being involved were high. His instincts proved right as he stumbled upon the lifeless bodies of a party of c rank players. He knew the demon cult wasn't behind it, as they needed living sacrifices. Kangwoo was stumped as to who could have done this, but he knew the culprit had to be nearby since the smell of blood was fresh. As he pondered this, he saw something that made his blood run cold. The Hellhound, and demonic monster from Hell, was devouring a whole human with its countless teeth. That's a weird-looking dog. The Hellhound let out a deafening roar as Kangwoo stood in shock. In an instant, the monster lunged at him with its jaws wide open, treating him like prey. But Kangwoo was quick to dodge and counterattack with his blade, only to be forcefully deflected by the beast. He knew this was an authentic Hellhound, given the sturdiness of its skin. As Kangwoo prepared for another strike, the Hellhound began amassing sinister energy in its mouth. With a thunderous release, a molten mass of energy resembling a meteor hit the ground, exploding like a nuke. The Hellhound eagerly awaited the sight of Kangwoo's destruction. But Kangwoo was already in the air, effortlessly dodging the debris. He knew his blades were no match, so he turned to another weapon in his arsenal, the authority of Dark Spear that had slain the chief troll midair. Gathering demonic energy in his hands, Kangwoo spun around and descended upon the unsuspecting Hellhound like a tornado. All the monster could see was the sharp glint of the sinister blade. With a swift strike to the monster's back, Kangwoo caused it to growl in pain as blood spurted from the wound. As the Hellhound fell to the ground, Kangwoo landed with an exasperated sigh, thinking the fight was over. But he quickly realized it had only just begun. The Hellhound charged relentlessly at Kangwoo, swiping its claw and sending him flying. Dodging the beast, Kangwoo kicked it in the jaw, creating distance between them. As the Hellhound continued its pursuit, Kangwoo channeled demonic energy in his hands and activated the authority of Earthquake, decimating the landscape around them. Caught and disorientated by the tremors, the Hellhound was an easy target as Kangwoo conjured his trusty dark spear, stabbing the beast in the head with all the force he could muster. But the tenacious creature was too strong, leaping out of the hole and sending Kangwoo flying with a powerful claw strike. Frustrated, Kangwoo faced the Hellhound once again with the spear lodged in its head. He knew this was far from over and anticipated the beast's strongest move. A blood-red aura quickly enveloped the Hellhound's body, increasing its power multiple times over. Oh no, that's Super Saiyan Dog. But Kangwoo was ready, activating the demon Baphomet's authority of divine power. Dark energy surrounded him as a phantom of a manticore appeared, giving him the strength of a divine being. The Hellhound charged towards him like a crimson meteor, but Kangwoo knew it was just a mutt that didn't know its place. The primal hellhound trembled at the sight of the man's newfound power, which was accompanied by the phantom of a mighty demon. Kangwoo launched himself at the beast with a powerful uppercut, fueled by his determination to vanquish demons. The colossal hellhound was sent flying through the air, 
its body crumpling onto the hot sand as it hit the ground with a resounding thud. The hellhound struggled to its feet, barely clinging to life, while Kang Wu ruminated on how much easier this fight could have been if he could use both of his authorities at once. But he was no stranger to taking down hordes of these hellhounds during his time in hell, and he knew how to handle them. With a confident taunt, Kang Wu beckoned the beast to attack, but the hellhound fell to the ground, lifeless. A wave of relief washed over Kang Wu, finally free from the clutches of the annoying dog. Kang Wu just has that dog in him. Suddenly, Kang Wu received a notification that he had defeated a C rank Fisher Fragment, an unfamiliar classification to him. The victory boosted his level by 5, causing his Fourth Awakening to trigger. As a result, he acquired the Fourth Awakening trait, Ruler of Demonic Energy, a rank A trait. Now Kang Wu could control demonic energy more naturally and at an accelerated pace, and he could also conceal his demonic energy from other beings. Looks like the Demon King just leveled up his stealth game. Kang was notified that he defeated a C rank Cracks Fragment, a term he was unfamiliar with. He had heard of Core Cracks before, which he believed were the system's term for beings from Hell. Does that make the Demon King the toughest crack of them all? He wondered why there was a Hellhound in the gate in the first place. He knew that Hellhounds could not use the weapons of the Seven Artukes of Hell as he had done. He can't help but be intrigued by the concept of these cracks. He put it out of his mind for the time being as he had no idea where to begin. Kang Wu just wanted to rest and check his notifications first. That's when he noticed a particular notification. He had received his fourth awakening, and it was an A rank. Now that he had reached his fourth awakening, he would no longer be bothered by trivial matters. He decided to start feasting on the Hellhound. The authority of gluttony spawned countless grim specters that tore through the lifeless Hellhound's body. Kang Wu sinisterly mused that if he could restore the state of his myriad demon palace, he might even become stronger than he was in hell. He was becoming addicted to leveling up. All I can say is let him cook. A sunny day greeted Kang Wu as he left the security checkpoint outside the gate. He had such a fulfilling day that he was all smiles when he thought about the perfect way to end it. Some kimchi stew at home. Kimchi stew and grinding levels. He's living the dream. But then he heard a familiar voice calling his name. When he turned his attention to a corner, he saw the woman who had harassed him at the PC cafe, wearing the same look and the same baseball cap. She greeted him. Is she trying to 1v1 right now? Kang Wu was not pleased to see this annoying woman. He told her that they were not even close enough to greet each other, as they had not even introduced themselves. The woman introduced herself as Chai Yan Ju. Kang Wu vaguely remembered hearing this name at the support center. The big five guilds were Mir, Anori, Hanol, Sanara, and the Red Rose. He now realized that this woman was the guild master of Red Rose. Suddenly, it all made sense why she was so strong. Kang Wu asked Yan Ju what she wanted with him. It turned out that she had investigated him. Oh Kang Wu, born in 1995, currently 28, raised in the Chongsong Orphanage without any history of adoption, and lived by himself for most of his life. For five years, there was no trace of him, but he had recently registered as a player. Bro just got opened like a book. Kang Wu became apprehensive when he heard how thorough and extensive the research had been. She found it absurd that he had only registered three weeks ago. Kang Wu recalls his F-rank awakening test as Yan Ju continues to list down his information. She finds Kang Wu's rise odd and suspects that he is a criminal who purchased a fake identity. But everything was legitimate, down to the fingerprints. Kang Wu could not believe that this guild had such deep influence that they could obtain his fingerprint records. Yan Ju knows that Kang Wu is not a player using a false identity. This leads her to the conclusion that he is a player with immense talent that could even surpass her own. He just has that dog in him. He might even have more talent than Beck Kang Yun. Kang Wu thanked her for the high praise but urged her to get to the point of her visit. In a turn of events, Yan Ju wants to sponsor Kang Wu with her authority as the Guild Master of Red Rose. Kang Wu was visibly taken aback by this proposal as he was expecting this conversation to take a different turn. He thought that he was being recruited. Yan Ju explained that she would not simply allow someone dubious to join her guild right away. Yan Ju believes that Kang Wu has been hiding his power to avoid guild requests. But Kang Wu is not actually hiding his powers. She went on to say that this would simply be financial support to help him level up faster. Kang Wu jokingly asked if she needed a boost in the last game they played at the PC Cafe in return, enraging the gamer that is Xia Yan Ju. She repeatedly muttered to herself that she's a guild master as she calmed herself down. Kang Wu laughed it off and explained that he was a noob at the game. So they had a misunderstanding. But Yan Ju was still salty that she couldn't advance to silver because of Kang Wu. She's just like me. For real. 
Kang Wu mocked her for being a low-tier bronze, and she was quick to reason that it was all her teammates' fault that she couldn't promote. She has the mark of a true gamer. Kidding aside, Kang Wu inquired why she was trying so hard to sponsor him. Her simple reason is that Kang Wu will continue to get stronger. He was a newbie two weeks ago, but has grown a monstrous pace within such a short time. He had managed to solo hunt an E to C rank gates. She knows that Kang Wu is just getting started. Her first offer is a gate pass that will grant Kang Wu entry to A rank gates and below without any restrictions. The deal is already sounding good to Kang Wu. She continues that they'll match him up with their guild members for hunting parties if he wants to. He'll also be exempted from magic stone taxes if he directly sold to the Red Rose. They would even lend him equipment. Unique rank and above equipment will require a deposit, but anything epic rank and below is free to borrow. They even propose a house and a car. Kang Wu worries that this deal might be too good to be true, but Yanju reassured him that all the extravagance is an investment for the future. All of this would not come for free as the guild will allocate him various tasks. Kang Wu weighed the deal in his mind. They'll probably need his help for a particular task. He asked if he could get the details of the commissioned request, but Yanju stonewalled his inquiry, which is fine with Kang Wu. He thinks that if it's a ridiculous request, he'll just refuse. And with that, he reached out his hand, agreeing to the terms proposed by Yanju. Yanju let out a faint smile and reached her hand out to Kang Wu's, for Kang Wu. This was a chance to connect with a big guild and gain an insane amount of support. It was too good to pass up, and the PC Cafe rivals have joined forces. Kang Wu was out here securing his bag. With her deal finalized, Yanju praised Kang Wu for making the right choice. He once again asked what the commission request is, but she will only tell him when the time comes. She assumes that there's nothing Kang Wu can do at his current level. However, he begs to differ in this assumption. He insists that he is much stronger than she thinks. She is almost impressed with how arrogant and brazen Kang Wu is. So, she continues that his strength is not the reason why she cannot reveal any details yet. It's just that they do not have all the evidence yet. This makes sense to Kang Wu. Yan Zhu shoves her phone in his face asking for his contact details. The year Kang Wu is already asking when he can get his equipment while entering his contact details into Yan Zhu's phone. She proposes that they should grab them now, and Kang Wu complies. He will need the equipment if he wants to save demonic energy. She beckons him to follow her as they head over to the guild house. Yanju reveals that their guild headquarters is in the bustling Seoul Station. People of all ages in the streets cannot help but turn their heads at the sight of a prestigious car on the road. It is the Porsche 918 Spider. They did not even have this model in Korea. But the guild leader of Red Rose has it. She is calling out to Kangwu to hop in. Yanju is so rich that she does not even know how much this car is even though she just bought it. She didn't have to go hard on the flex like that but we love a rich queen. She just casually throws out the 10 million won figure, and the greedy Kang Wu's eyes light up in the prospect of so much money. She cannot believe that a person that dresses so casually while playing at the PC room is this flush with cash. Can I just hunt and gain tens of millions as well? The car accelerates as they start heading into their destination. Kang Wu remarks how smoothly it drives when Yanju offers to get him one as well. She did say that a car is part of their deal. With this offer, Kang Wu starts referring to Yanju respectfully as his big sister. Just hearing those words from this man's mouth causes such a visceral disgust in Yanju's face. She warns him to never call her that. Yanju continues to drive as she warns him to stick to their deal or she will immediately confiscate everything. He mocks her for being such a petty ranker, but she retorts that she has a lot of mouths to feed. Kang Wu just shuts his mouth for the rest of the drive and they eventually arrive at Seoul Station, Red Rose's guild house. He is awestruck seeing the massive scale of this guild. It is as big as a player support center. This is the influence of a big guild. His awe is interrupted with Yanju inviting him in. He was reaffirming that he really made the right decision to get connected with a big guild when they are greeted by two people in the lobby. The team leader of the personnel management team, Park Yun Wu, politely reaches out his hand to shake Kang Wu's as he introduces himself. Kang Wu also introduced himself as a threatening aura catches his attention. He looks at the other man in front of him, the commander-in-chief, Moon Yangho, eyeing him down intensely. This imposing man is glaring at him aggressively. You better fix your eyes, young man. The gentlemanly Park Yun Wu thanks Kang Wu for accepting their proposal, as Kang Wu jokes that he would have taken it even if it's coated in poison. Yun Wu presents himself to escort Kang Wu to the equipment storage, but Yan Ju insists that she will accompany Kang Wu personally. That's when Yun Wu politely takes his leave and the commander-in-chief Moon Yan Ho proposes that he will tag along. When asked why he wants to come with Kang Wu and Yan Ju, he replies that he wants to see for himself what kind of human Kang Wu is. 
Spoilers, man. He hasn't been a human in the past 10,000 years. Kangol was amused by this as Yanju allows it since they will be seeing each other often after all. After arriving at the 15th floor, Yanju points out their guild's item storage. She accesses the security door and a multitude of bright lights welcome Kangwoo. She reiterates that Kangwoo can borrow any equipment up to the epic rank, while unique ranks will require some deposit. Kangwoo is like a child in a candy store as he browses through the myriad of weapons. He asks if there are any legendary or mythic items in here. But those would not be stored here, as that equipment rank would just be used by the high-ranking guild members. Yanju bragged that she herself has a legendary rank equipment. Kangwoo asks how much deposit he will need to borrow something like that, and the figure is a whopping 50 million won. Kangwoo was dumbfounded that he cannot even afford that with all the funds that he has. So he opted to look at the epic equipment first, and that's when Moon Yanho caught their attention with a slam. Yanju and Kangwoo were confused by this stunt. Bad move, my friend. Bad move. Commander in Chief Yang Ho stood before Kang Wu as a menacing and raging aura surrounds him. He angrily scolded Kang Wu to use honorifics. The clueless Kang Wu was annoyed by this giant in front of him. Yang Ho repeats himself, ordering Kang Wu to use honorifics and pay respects when talking to the guild master. The fury in his face was so evident that his veins might pop. Kang Wu finally caught on to what the deal is with this man. So he donned his most mischievous grin and playfully answered that he doesn't want to. He's S rank when it comes to taunting people. Hearing the disrespect in Kang Wu's voice, Yang Ho drew his great sword, but Kang Wu remained unbothered. He's just asking for a spanking at this point. Yang Ho brandished his weapon, but his strike was abruptly stopped by Yan Ju's scolding. The guild leader asked the commander in chief what in the world he was doing. The angry Yan Ju was more fearsome than Yang Ho himself. She continued to demand an answer from the hot headed giant as he stumbled on his words. She continued that he should mind his own business with regards to how Kang Wu speaks to her. That's when the Hafed reluctantly retreated his sword. Yanju also scolded Kang Wu for instigating and taunting. She warned that if he messes with Yang Ho, he could end up disabled. The nonchalant Kang Wu admired that even though Yang Ho is a Hafed, at least he's loyal. Kang Wu and Yanju continued their conversation, during which Kang Wu addressed Yanju as older sister once again. This caught the attention of Yang Ho, who stopped in his tracks. Kang Wu was greedily asking the guild leader to get a piece of unique equipment instead of a foreign car. Yang Ju gave in to Kang Wu's demand, but that's when Yang Ho's massive fist struck the weapon case behind Kang Wu. The commander in chief was once again seething in anger after he heard this man refer to their guild master as Big Sister. The unimpressed Kang Wu was once again the target of a massive great sword strike as Yang Ho has seemingly lost his sanity and rage. The strike shook the entire storage room as the force of the great sword exploded. Yang Ho was shocked and scared at what he seen on the other side of his blade. It was his beloved guild leader, staring at him with bone-chilling eyes, admonishing him for not listening to her barely a moment ago. Kang Wu watches all of this with his signature mocking grin in his mouth. The authority of smugness is out of control. He tried to shift the blame onto Kang Wu's disrespectful behavior, but was met with Yan Ju throwing him to the side with his great sword. She ordered Moon Yang Ho to get out of her sight. She warned him that if he oversteps his boundaries one more time, disciplinary action will be taken. Yang Ho apologized to Yan Ju as she lectured him to live up to his title as commander-in-chief. Yan Ju apologized to Kang Wu as the giant man prepares to take his leave. The two continued their discussion regarding the unique rank equipment Kang Wu needs. Kang Wu requested an armor that is easy to move around in with great basic functions. As Yan Ju was thinking what equipment would suit Kang Wu's demand, the voice of Yang Ho once again interrupted them. The persistently angry giant got in Kang Wu's face and proposed a duel with his personal armor on the line. This armor fits all the criteria that Kang Wu needs. It was the third strike from her subordinate, so she called him out angrier than before. She reiterated her orders for him to get out of her sight as a savage and sharp energy started emanating from both of her hands. Yang Wu backs off in fear, but Kang Wu stopped her. He thinks that the sparring is a decent proposal. Yan Ju could not help but feel that this guy was up to something. Good armor in exchange of a little exercise, that's a good deal. He knows that Kang Wu will become stronger than her someday, but Moon Yang though is level 67. He's overcome the so-called wall of efforts to gain his sixth awakening and became the strongest of the strong after obtaining his seventh awakening. Even with Kang Wu's potential, he's not quite a match for Yang Ho yet. That's when she tried to break up the fight before it even starts, but Kang Wu just reassured her that it will be fine. The sinister Kangwoo really wants the armor, so he's going to accept this challenge. Yang Ho was pleased with this development, 
he intends to make sure that Kangwu never disrespects the guild master ever again. Yanju frantically tried to talk some sense into Kangwu, but he's already made up his mind. At this sight, Yangwu remembers how his master became his savior, how he has sworn his loyalty to Yanju, and the day that he's given his heart to her. He looks at Kangwu, the man that dares to get close to his beloved guild master. He could not accept the sight of Yanju and Kangwu casually interacting with each other. He intends to show Kangwu the difference between them. The Simp Commander-in-Chief versus the Giga Chad Demon King. The three stood inside the Red Rose's training facility as Kangwu admired how high quality it was. Kangwu started his casual stretch, as Yanju is still trying to talk him out of this duel. The more she thinks about it, the crazier this seems. With a final reassurance to Yanju, Kangwu was called out by the giant to start whenever he's ready. Yamho pridefully offered Kangwu the first three seconds of the match to attack him as much as Kangwu wants. Kangwu just finds this cliché proposal amusing. Brother thinks he's Vegeta or something. He called out the man to quit acting like a pompous fool and take his sword out, but this giant just stood his ground. Kangwu seriously warned the guy to hold his sword, but Yangho arrogantly declared that he has no intention of using his full power against a brat like Kangwu. Kangwu accepted the provocation as he started gathering demonic energy on his feet, catching the attention of Yanju. He activated the authority of speed rushing towards the giant in less than a second. A taunt and a solid kick met Yanho's stomach. He was sent flying from one part of the facility to another, destroying the powerful walls in his wake. Yanho almost lost consciousness right then and there as he foams at the mouth of Kangwu's demonic kick. I hope he has the Red Rose Guild Premium Health Insurance. They landed on the ground at the same time, but the giant was on all fours. Even Yanju could not believe what she just witnessed. Yanho couldn't help but think what just hit him. If it weren't for the capabilities of his gargoyle armor, things would have ended here. He started to grab onto the hilt of his great sword, and as he takes it out, he finds this situation unbelievable. How can someone who's only been a player for three weeks be this strong? Kang will grimly mock the giant for taking out his sword and not giving him the promised first three seconds. Yang Ho struggled to maintain his balance, leaning on his colossal sword for support. He angrily demanded an explanation from Kang Wu, questioning what trickery he had just employed. Kang Wu nonchalantly dismissed it as a mere disparity in their strength, but the commander-in-chief remained skeptical. He couldn't comprehend how a player who had only been in the game for three weeks could possess such formidable power. It's just skill diff, brother. To divert the conversation, Kang Wu reminded the giant of their three-second wager. He taunted Yan Ho for underestimating him, thinking he was just another inexperienced player, boasting without substance. He continued his mockery, highlighting Yan Ho's failure to fulfill his end of the bargain, labeling Kang Wu a liar and whining after receiving a harsh reality check in the form of a powerful kick. Growing tired of the Commander-in-Chief's petty behavior, Kang Wu issued a warning, commanding him to cease the nonsense and stop being childish. Yan Ho felt embarrassed, gritting his teeth in pain while his esteemed guild leader observed the battle from the sidelines. Determined not to endure further pummeling, he graded his great sword, invoking the spell known as the Blade of Unreserved Slaughter. A surge of energy coalesced within his blade. Unfazed, Kang Wu sneered in front of him, openly ridiculing the giant for chanting a skill name that reeked of cringe. He mockingly laughed at Yanlo's display of an embarrassingly named skill, believing it to be cool. Imagine being beaten and then roasted right after. Yanlo's anger intensified as he prepared to unleash an attack emanating an immense force from his sword. He charged towards Kang Wu with malicious intent, displaying his might and speed. Recognizing that the Commander-in-Chief was still a formidable opponent as the leader of a top 5 guild, Kang Wu knew he didn't need to confront him head-on. In that moment, Kang Wu activated the authority of Shadow. Sinister shadows crept along the ground as the giant swung his colossal sword downwards. The shadow traversed through Yanlo, leaving the guild leader with a sense of unease, prompting her to issue a warning. Kang Wu took delight in witnessing the Commander-in-Chief lose his composure in a fit of rage, once again insulting him for his foolishness. The descending sword was aimed at where Kang Wu was supposed to be, but he had already teleported to the other end of the Shadow's path. That's a literal Shadow clone Jutsu. Yang Ho was taken aback by the sudden disappearance of his target. With a light tap on the giant's shoulder, Kang Wu confidently declared that Yang Ho had already lost. Kang Wu just teleported behind and executed the Nothing Personal Kid maneuver. Activating the authority of Shockwave, Kang Wu propelled the proud Commander-in-Chief of the Red Rose Guild towards the facility's walls once again. Mid-air, Yang Ho lost consciousness, while the reverberating force of the Shockwave shook his very core. As the giant fell, 
Yanju looked at Kang Wu with astonishment. Kang Wu merely reaffirmed what he had already established. He was much stronger than Yanju had anticipated. He's just the goat. Apologizing to Kang Wu for the day's events, Yanju expressed her regret, assuring him that the commander in chief would be swiftly expelled from the guild. She promised that Kang Wu would never be treated disrespectfully within the guild again. Kang Wu's attention wandered as he flashed a wide smile, proudly displaying his new armor. The gargoyle armor, a unique rank equipment with impressive stats, possessed the ability to double defenses for 10 seconds through calcification. Greedy and elated, Kang Wu couldn't help but think about how Yang Wu had gone as far as defying orders and betting his cherished armor, only to lose it all to him. Contemplating the situation, Kang Wu questioned whether this was what it felt like to be blindsided by love. He sternly warned Yan Ju that if a similar incident were to occur again, he would reconsider their cooperation. In response, Yan Ju promised him earnestly that every member of the guild would treat him with the utmost respect moving forward. Finally, some respect to the Demon King name. Complaining that the massive armor didn't seem to fit his body well, Kang Wu expressed his frustration. In the meantime, Yan Ju suggested that he temporarily display the armor in a case and assured him that she would take care of the necessary adjustments. Trusting his new armor to the guild leader, Kang Wu began making plans for the rest of the day. With a farewell, he left the room, leaving Yanju to exhale a sigh of relief. She couldn't help but wonder if that guy was truly human. Yanju wasn't just some ordinary mob, so she was utterly perplexed as to how a player of merely three weeks had managed to overpower him so effortlessly. At this rate, Kang Wu could become Korea's first world ranker. Among the top eight players worldwide, none hail from Korea, there were rumors that Baek kang Yun, likely the number one player in Korea, had a shot at it, but even he fell short. We're going worldwide. Let's go. Lost in thoughts about kang Wu's potential ascent, yan Ju's contemplation was abruptly interrupted by Park yun Wu. They exchanged updates on the day's events. yan Wu expressed his discontent about yan Wu's impending expulsion from the guild, but yan Ju reassured him that it was necessary to prevent similar incidents in the future. Nodding in understanding, Yun Wu shared another piece of news. The government had successfully infiltrated the demonic order with a spy. With luck, valuable information might come to light this time. Intrigue, Yan Ju urged him to gather as much information as possible. Kang Wu stood in the middle of the bustling street, engrossed in checking his status window. His eyes focused on the continuous growth of his demonic energy alongside his other crucial stats. Strength, dexterity, and stamina. Strengthening his body through these stats would help reduce his consumption of demonic energy. Intelligence and wisdom were of no use to him since his magic was non-existent, and they didn't make him any smarter anyway. No need for intelligence if a single punch works. However, Kang Wu had heard that after his second awakening, stats related to his special abilities would experience exponential growth. As his other stats continued to increase, Kang Wu noticed that the amount of demonic energy he gained remained stagnant. He speculated that this might be because his demonic energy had reached an exceptionally high level, surpassing his other stats. He recalled being able to accomplish feats that even high-level players couldn't. Realizing that his demonic energy stat, which had significantly increased, could no longer be boosted within the level 30 range, Kang Wu didn't mind. He had already surpassed the threshold he aimed for when he defeated the Hellhound. If his progress continued, he would soon reach his fifth awakening, and time was on his side. With that in mind, Kang Wu decided it was time to meet Sola and Tae Su. On a beautiful sunny day at the East Inchon Gate, Kang Wu spotted the muscular and ironclad Tae Su loudly trying to catch his attention. Feeling a bit embarrassed, Kang Wu walked over to Tae Su with the lovely Sola by his side, amidst a bustling crowd of players. Tae Su immediately introduced two individuals to Kang Wu. The handsome guy was named Kim Si Hoon, while the short girl was Choi Yu Bi. Kang Wu was taken aback by Kim Si Hoon's stunning appearance, straight out of a K drama. Choi Yu Bi complained to Tae Su urging him not to introduce her as a brat. She teasingly referred to Tae Su as an old man in his 40s and cheerfully introduced herself to Kang Wu. Before Kang Wu could inquire about their abilities, Yun Bi was already engrossed in conversation with Sola. She eagerly requested to take pictures with the beautiful Sola, wanting to show them off to her friends. Kang Wu couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by Yun Bi's vibrant and energetic personality, like Tae Su's. The polite and well-mannered Kim Si Hoon extended his hand for a handshake and introduced himself as a level 12 warrior with an A-rank special ability. Yoon Bi, on the other hand, was a mage with a B-rank special ability. Si Hoon apologized for Yoon Bi's behavior, causing Kang Wu to consider how polite, formal, and sensible Si Hoon seemed. 
With a second awakening and enough talent to achieve an A rank, Stifum exuded a main character vibe, reminiscent of characters from Manwas. Taesu sought validation from Kangwu for his choice of trustworthy party members. Kangwu pondered the question, realizing that he didn't sense any sinister intentions from them. Unlike the fools at the Andra's Guild, Taesu continued to boast about his keen eye for people. However, Kangwu swiftly reminded him of the time he was betrayed by his own party. Taesu brushed it off, believing it was fate that brought them together. Kangwu looked at Taesu skeptically as he shifted the conversation back to their new party members. Kangwu assessed the arrangement and concluded that it was more than just an ideal setup. With Sihun and Taesu as A rankers, and Sola and Yunbi as B rankers, this party was a force to be reckoned with. A hard carry party. Can I please get invited and boosted by this party? Kangwu informed them that he would personally join the hunt. He would provide guidance and support, intervening only if things became dangerous. He didn't plan on quickly leveling them up by carrying them. It was important for their growth and potential to shine through. Though he might need to keep a watchful eye on them. He believed they had enough potential to nurture. They are about to become the Demon King Generals at this point. In a dense forest, a horde of trolls charged mindlessly, brandishing their blunt weapons with aggression. They closed in on their target until they reached the party. Taesu, the mighty tank, countered their advance with a powerful shield bash, sending several trolls flying backward. The relentless trolls stumbled around, disoriented by the impact. Taesu grinned, satisfied with his strength. That crowd control goes crazy. The immobile and injured trolls trembled on the ground when UB unleashed a devastating lightning shock spell, finishing them off. She quickly warned Taesu of five more trolls approaching from behind. Yunbi retreated while Taesu readied his shield once again, firmly standing his ground. He confidently faced the incoming horde, his shield gleaming brightly, temporarily blinding the monsters. Taunting the horde, Taesu provoked them while Sola cast the Spirit of Light, bolstering Taesu's strength and visibly enhancing his muscles. Where can we get a girl that can buff muscles like Sola? Taesu thanks Sola, affectionately addressing her as his sister-in-law. At the same time, Sola released a radiant light arrow. Striking the nearest troll, taking charge. Taesu charged forward, bashing his shield like a moving train, sending trolls flying in all directions. The monsters, battered and bruised, fell victim to Sihun's swift blade. He sliced through the group of trolls with expert precision. Each step and slash fell another foe. Sivam is just Kirito from Sword Art Online. Confidently standing amidst the defeated trolls, Sivam received praise from Taesu for his impressive display of skill. It turned out that Sivun had trained in Kendo as a hobby before becoming a player. However, his level far surpassed that of a mere hobbyist. Perched on a tree, Kangwu observed the battle unfolding below. Taesu eagerly sought Kangwu's evaluation, and Kangwu, after careful contemplation, jumped down from the tree. He began pointing out areas for improvement, not just a few, but a lot. Get ready for some brutally honest battle feedback. Kangwu started with Taesu, recognizing his good senses and excellent ability. To distract monsters. However, he noticed that Taesu relied too much on brute strength, which led to unnecessary energy expenditure and exposed vulnerabilities that a tanker should not have. During the battle, Taesu was throwing trolls around, but Kangu questioned how he would handle a boss monster that might appear afterward. Kangu reminded him of his role as a tanker, emphasizing the importance of enduring attacks and diverting attention. Taesu took this criticism to heart, less damage dealing more tanking. Next, Kangwu turned his attention to Sola and praised her decision to buff Taesu, acknowledging her accurate judgment and enhancing the tanker's strength. However, Kangwu pointed out that her choice to use Arrow of Light to defend herself was incorrect. He explained that healers already attract enough attention from opponents, and if they choose to attack, it hampers the tanker's ability to divert attention effectively. Sola sincerely apologized for her shortcomings, but Kangwu assured her that they would work on improving step by step. Do not make our angel cry. Moving on to Yun Bi, Kangwu noted her enthusiasm and desire to deal with the fallen monsters. However, he advised her against using powerful spells with high firepower. Instead, he suggested using weaker attacks to conserve power since Sihun, as the main damage dealer, would handle most of the damage. Yun Bi embraced the criticism and responded with conviction. This girl is literally just Thunder Megumin. Regarding Sihun, Kangwu took a moment to think but found nothing to fix. Sihun was fulfilling his role flawlessly impressing Kangwu with his natural talent and ability. The entire party praised Sihun for his impeccable performance, and Kangwu saw him as a diamond in the rough. That guy is literally Kirito. I'm calling it now. 
As Kangwu contemplated Sihum's potential for growth, he encouraged the party to venture further into the gate, incorporating the feedback he had provided during the hunt. A few moments later, they witnessed Su effortlessly dispatching a single troll with a simple move, followed by Yunbi and Sola, using spells of appropriate proportions. Stihun showcased his skills as he swiftly jumped into the horde of trolls, dealing killing blows with each slash of his sword. Perched on a tree, Kangwu observed their progress and acknowledged that everyone was performing well. With their current pace, they might even attempt a C-rank gate in a month. This party is a bunch of fast learners. The party successfully completed their task, and Taesu asked Kangwu for his evaluation. Kangwu admitted that they had performed admirably this time, and the party thanked Kangwu for his guidance, which had significantly improved their performance. However, their attention was suddenly drawn to a monster approaching them. As they tried to identify the monster, Kangwu was taken aback, recognizing it as the demon wolf. This massive canine creature, with white fur, dark horns, sharp teeth and claws, and bloodthirsty eyes, rushed towards them relentlessly. Kangwu knew they were facing a formidable opponent. Taesu, initially clueless, hesitated to raise his shield as he confronted the fearsome monster before him. The demon wolf closed in, roaring at the party still trying to identify the creature. Preparing to intervene with his blade at the sight of yet another demonic monster, Kangwu noticed something astounding. Sihun had already engaged in battle, matching the monster's speed and slashing through its body. Taesu called out to Sihun, and Sihun promptly ordered the party to step back. Sihun was forced to retreat and create distance as the demon wolf continued its relentless assault. A mysterious energy emanated from Sihun's hands and sword as he attempted to strike the monster's stomach. However, Sihun struggled to draw blood from the savage monster. He was quickly met with the monster's counterattack, a claw slash that grazed him, causing him to lose his balance. The demon wolf, relentless as ever, lunged forward for a final blow on Sihun. Just as the handsome Sihun was about to become the monster's meal, Kangwu leaped into action, coming to his rescue. Unleashing the authority of Thousand, he concentrated an immense force into a single fist. With a mighty punch, Kangwu put an end to the ferocious charge of the demon wolf. Insert one punch man opening here. Sihun was awestruck, witnessing Kangwu's display of incredible strength. Kangwu's bleeding fist, stained with a mix of demonic essence and his own blood, marked his victory over a fragment of a D-rank crack, earning him a level up. He carried Sivan by his waist, asking if he could stand. Concerned, the rest of the party hurried over, inquiring if everything was alright. Amidst the worried voices, Taesu fervently praised Kangwu's formidable might, applauding his ability to obliterate the monster in a single blow. Taesu also commended Sihun's unbelievable performance, considering it was only his second awakening. Sola promptly cast a healing spell on Sihun, ensuring his well-being. Sola will always be the MVP. Kangwu was impressed by Sihun's ability to confront a demonic monster, even for an A-ranker in his second awakening. Sihun possessed abnormal power. Kangwu couldn't help but think that there was more to it than just talent. Observing someone like Sihun, Kangwu began to understand Commander-in-Chief Moon yang -ho on a deeper level. He offered his shoulder as support for Sihun, who gratefully accepted. Unbeknownst to the others, Kangwu secretly activated the omniscient power. For a moment, his eyes took on the appearance of the demon Astaroth, but he concealed it with his Ranke ability, ruler of demonic energy, that new abilities already paying off. With the omniscient power active, Kangwu swiftly scanned every aspect of Sihun and was left stunned by the revelations. Initially intending to check for any hidden powers, he discovered that he could even determine whether Sihun's skills had been upgraded by examining his status window. As Kangwu delved deeper into Sihun's status, he couldn't believe what he was reading. It turned out that Kim Sihun's first awakening rank was SSS tier, possessing the special ability Descendant of the Martial Arts God. In their midst, Kangwu had discovered the hero destined to become the protector. The revelation left Kangwu in awe. Kim Si-hoon was, quite literally, the main character. Are we following the wrong guy in this man want the whole time? The martial arts god, the protector of the world, Kangwu couldn't help but wonder if that was the reason behind Si-hoon's extraordinary swordsmanship. He contemplated the implications of encountering the main character and considered his next course of action. While Kangwu maintained a friendly demeanor with everyone around him, inwardly he couldn't ignore the fact that Si-hoon's presence might pose a threat. However, he couldn't pass up the opportunity to nurture such raw talent. The move is obvious, raise the protagonist as a pet, recalling how Cheyanju had approached him in a similar way. 
Kangwu decided that building a friendly relationship and providing full support would be the best approach. Nevertheless, he knew that people often turn against you when the going gets tough. He needed a plan that wouldn't backfire. Merely relying on a friendly relationship wouldn't be enough to guarantee success. Observing Sihun's selfless act of protecting Su from the demon wolf, Kangwu realized that Sihun possessed a strong sense of chivalry and purity. To put it kindly, Sihun was incredibly noble, but to put it bluntly, he seemed like a bit of a loser. Classic Kangwu, trash-talking the hero at his early chapters. A sinister smile played on Kangwu's lips as he contemplated the future. He began devising a plan to manage the situation when someone called out to him. The angelic Sola approached Kangwu with genuine concern, inquiring if he had been hurt. Kangwu assured her that he was fine, he's just preoccupied with his thoughts. Meanwhile, in the background, Taesu and Yunbi engaged in an unusual activity, with Yunbi electrocuting the giant. The party pondered the appearance of such a monstrous creature in a D rank gate. It was a creature they had never seen or heard of before. Without Kangwu's intervention, they would have been in serious danger. They commended Sihun for his bravery, and after being healed by Sola, advised him to take it easy for a while. With sufficient rest, he would recover quickly. Sihun expressed gratitude to Sola for her healing and politely thanked Kangwu for intervening and preventing a more severe injury. He's such a polite boy, you sweet clueless child. Sihun's eyes gleamed with admiration as he looked at Kangwu. While Taesu had already praised Kangwu's strength, they had no idea he was this powerful. Joining in the praise, Taesu declared that he had never encountered anyone as strong and chivalrous as his brother Kangwu. Yu Bi watched the two fanboys with a blank expression, and even Kangwu felt that the praise was a bit excessive. Curious, Taesu asked Sivun why he hadn't joined any of the major guilds yet. He mentioned that the Mir Guild was actively recruiting new members and wondered if Sihun would be interested. However, the mention of the Mir Guild seemed to change Sihun's demeanor. He firmly stated that he had no intention of joining any guild, particularly the Mir Guild. Su sensed the shift and awkwardly backed off, inquiring if Sihun had any issues with the guild. Sihun brushed it off as something not worth mentioning, and Su bowed, apologizing for prying into Sihun's past. It looks like we just found the late game boss of Sihun's story. When Sihun suggested continuing the hunt, Kangwu intervened, declaring that they were done for the day. He insisted that Sihun needed to rest, reminding him that there would always be another hunt tomorrow. Taesu fervently asked if Kangwu would join them for tomorrow's hunt as well, but Kangwu declined, stating that they would have to handle it on their own. Taesu resembled a disappointed child, but Kangwu sternly lectured Taesu explaining that he couldn't always be there to look after the party. He reassured them that if they remembered the lessons from today, they would improve in no time. Taesu really is just an overgrown child with perfect facial hair and muscle. Fired up by Kangwu's words, Taesu pledged to put all his effort into leveling up so he could eventually join Kangwu. The giant's mood shifted quickly, and he was determined to become stronger. As they exited the gate, the evening had already fallen. Kangwu and Solo walked together while Kangwu checked something on his phone. He informed her that something urgent had come up, which meant she might have to go home first. Sola, ever thoughtful, asked if they could still have dinner together. Kang Wu admitted that he might end up being late, so he advised her to eat without him. Can I get the dinner spot with her instead? Her disappointment was evident, but she reminded Kang Wu to take care of himself and mentioned that she would reheat dinner for him when he returned. Kang Wu blushed at her unwavering kindness. She truly was an angel. They bid each other goodbye, even though Kangwu longed to have dinner with her. However, circumstances didn't allow for it tonight. After parting ways with Sola, Kangwu's mischievous plan was set into motion. Sihun stood by a bus stop, engrossed in his phone. He sighed, his thoughts drifting to the Mir Guild, when Kangwu called out his name. Curious about the matter at hand, Sihun inquired about it. Kangwu simply replied that it was something important. As the bus arrived, Kangwu suggested they find a more private place to talk, and Sihun, Trusting him agreed without hesitation. Unbeknownst to Sihun, Kangwu led him to an eerie, abandoned, dark alley. When Sihun turned to Kangwu innocently, asking what they needed to discuss, he was struck with a powerful blow to his abdomen. Reality hit Sihun as he was thrown to the ground, realizing he had been ambushed in the desolate alleyway. That took an unexpected turn. Before he could even comprehend what was happening, Kangwu pinned him down with his full weight. Kangwu revealed his intention to ensure their future by making Sihun stronger, surpassing all other players. He ominously smiled, explaining that he wanted them to be true comrades. 
Confused and bewildered, Sihun asked why Kang Wu was resorting to such methods if that was his desire. Kang Wu, already gathering demonic energy in his hands, didn't hesitate. He pierced Sihun's chest, directly targeting his heart, an act that symbolized the establishment of their bond. Utilizing the authority of subordination, Kang Wu unleashed a surge of demonic power through Sihun's body, causing him to scream in horror, desperately trying to stop it. Did he just brand the hero? Amid Sihun's torment, Kang Wu reassured him that he needn't worry, as he wouldn't remember any of what transpired in that dark alley. Sihun's heart became tainted, its essence imbued with a demonic color. Kang Wu continued, stating that when Sihun opened his eyes, everything would return to normal. He would continue hunting, developing his powers just as he had been. Sihun's transformed heart now harbored a demonic presence, a grotesque manifestation with eyes and mouths filled with teeth. Confident in Sihun's potential, Kang Wu believed that, together with Taesu and Sola, they would form the strongest party ever. As Sihun became Kang Wu's subordinate, he would gain access to a portion of his powers, greatly aiding his development. So it's a kind of loan, but it's forced, and you pay with your soul. Classic Demon King shenanigans. Hours later, Sihun regained consciousness, his body drenched in a cold sweat as he lay on the floor of the abandoned alley. Clutching his chest, he tried to piece together what had happened to him. However, his memory was hazy, and he couldn't recall anything beyond waiting for the bus earlier. Glancing at his phone, he realized it was already 8 p.m., and he couldn't recollect what had occurred in the intervening time. A throbbing headache pounded in his temples whenever he attempted to remember. Frustration and confusion welled up within him as he struggled to understand how he could have blacked out like this. Stephen blamed his own weakness and vowed to become stronger. Thoughts of the mere guild, particularly its vice master Kim Yeonhoon, consumed his mind as he imagined confronting the contemptible scoundrel with his blade on his throat. Go get your revenge, kid. You're the Demon King's subordinate now. It turned out that Kang Wu had been secretly observing Sihun as he woke up and limped away from the alleyway. He reveled in the success of his soul's subordination. As Sihun was now registered as his subordinate, the system asked Kang Wu if he wanted to issue a command to his new subordinate. He just turned the hero to a slave. Deciding to save it for later, Kang Wu was pleased that he had secured his insurance. All that remained was for Sihun, the hero, to grow stronger. For now, Kang Wu had no intention of exerting his authority over Sihun. He had done all of this purely for insurance purposes. He knew there was no reason to control a dog that didn't bite its owner. You have the potentially most powerful dog there is. Once Sihun's abilities strengthened, his power would be on par with Balak's. This hero's existence was crucial for Kang Wu. With his myriad demon palace still partially sealed and the mysterious demonic order to contend with, Kang Wu couldn't predict when demons might appear at the gates again. He would support Sihun as much as he could. Sihun just had to train hard and become stronger. As he observed Sihun departing, Kang Wu received a call from Cho Thak Yun, the leader of the Andra's guild. Thak Yun had some information to pass on to Kang Wu. Unsure if it was related to the demonic order, but noting the presence of demonic energy. Finally, some good food. According to Thak Yun, it seemed unintentional and not created by a human. Kang Wu's thoughts immediately turned to demons upon hearing this. He asked Thak Yun where he had found it. Thak Yun promptly replied that it was at the rank B gate in Weijiang Bu. Kang Wu rose from his position, contemplating the increasing frequency of demons crossing the gates. This was the turn of the B rank gate. The prospect of a demon stronger than Hellhound appearing. A demon from the second hell made Kang Wu lick his lips. Even the Hellhound alone had helped him level up significantly. So this next demon might provide the boost he needed to achieve his fifth awakening sooner than expected. Counting XP before they hatch, aren't we? The following day, a train could be seen accelerating towards Weijiang Bu Station. With Kang Wu among the passengers, he realized that he needed a car soon. After finishing his business in Weijiang Bu, he planned to ask Yan Ju for the promised car. While walking, he started researching the monsters inside the b rank gate he was heading to. Overhearing other players complaining about the gate's strange and restricted access, Kang Wu's attention was caught when they mentioned a mutation. Is this an X-Men crossover? At the heavily guarded b rank gate, players and the media gathered, expressing their frustration over the entry restriction. The military personnel explained that an unknown monster mutation had occurred, making the gate temporarily inaccessible. The crowd grew more agitated, and the personnel revealed that 10 players had already died due to the mutated monster. The information about the fatalities made the players hesitate to enter. They do not want the smoke. Kang Wu stood at the back, contemplating the alleged monster mutation. 
He knew what it truly was, a rampaging demon inside the gate. He wondered what kind of demon it could be for the government to take action and forbid entry. The media pressed the security personnel for more information about the monster, but they remained tight-lipped. Eventually, they revealed that the monster resembled a lion, and they were still analyzing it. Kang Wu instantly concluded that it's a viewer, a powerful five-legged predator from the second hell. It had distinct traits, including its full stomach ability that prevented it from striking preemptively if it consumed five preys a day. A monster so OP, it had to be nerfed with a cooldown. If there had already been ten victims, the viewer must have appeared approximately two days ago. Kang Wu found it surprisingly easy this time around. He just needed to toss five random monsters to the viewer and kill it when it was full. With the thought of entering the gate, Kang Wu dialed Yan Ju's number. She answered the call, clearly annoyed as she was in the middle of an intense workout session. Kang Wu wasted no time and asked for a favor. He explained that he wanted to enter a B-rank gate, but the government had imposed restrictions. Yan Ju realized he must be in Wei Zhang Bu's gate already and reluctantly listened to his request. She can beat me up any time. Yan Ju caustically questioned what Kang Wu needed this time. Kang Wu assured her that he would pay in full for this favor. Yan Ju, concerned for his safety, warned him not to repay her with his death via a mutated monster. Kang Wu confidently reassured her that he wouldn't die easily, which was precisely why she was sponsoring him in the first place. Reluctantly, Yan Ju agreed to help and instructed to hand the phone over to the guards. Kang Wu handed his phone to the security personnel at the gate, who was surprised to see the guild leader of a top five guild on the line. The crowd and the media took notice of this unexpected turn of events, their attention now focused on Kang Wu. After the call, Kang Wu was granted entry as an investigator of monster mutation. He was required to provide information on the mutated monster if he managed to defeat it. Kang Wu accepted the condition, stating that he would start the investigation immediately and do his best to reassure the uneasy citizens. He truly has that good guy speech perfected. However, before he could proceed, a stern voice called out from the back of the crowd, demanding Kang Wu to wait. Kang Wu turned to see an impressive-looking six-member party led by a confident blue-haired man. It was Kang Sung Su from the Mir Guild, a rising star in the field who had been entering B-rank gates just three months after becoming a player. Curious if his ponytail guy was famous for something, Kang Wu was surprised when Sung Su asked if he was the one being sponsored by Red Rose. Sung Su noticed Kang Wu's gargoyle armor, confirming his assumption. He taunted Kang Wu, questioning the quality of Red Rose's sponsorship since Kang Wu didn't have a party. This guy clearly hasn't read Manwa's with solo hunters and levelers. Maintaining a bright smile, Kang Wu calmly explained that he preferred to work alone and hadn't accepted offers for party members. The Mir party mocked him, stating that he had only been dealing with c rank gates until recently, and that he was underestimating the challenge of a B-rank gate. Sung Su leaned in, insulting Kang Wu and claiming that he was destined to die quickly. He belittled Kang Wu's desire for fame in capturing the mutated monster, reminding him that Fourth Awakening players were not supposed to interfere in other people's business. He should really listen to his own advice. Unfazed, Kang Wu looked at Sung Su with hidden malice while maintaining a genuine smile. Sung Su laughed, thinking Kang Wu was mute or scared of him. To their surprise, Kang Wu accepted Sung Su's proposal for their parties to enter the gate together, with a bloody glint in his eyes. The Mir party found Kang Wu's willingness to be strange and lacked self-respect, expecting more resistance. But little did they know, Kang Wu was already calculating the number of heads in the party. One, two, three, four, five. He needed five heads to feed the Bu Air and trigger its full stomach state. He counts Sung Su as six, so there seems to be one left over. Concealing his insanely twisted expression, he invites the party to proceed. Five for the demonic beast one for the Demon King. A few moments earlier, we find Sung Su hidden in an alley, engaged in a phone conversation with Kim Young hoon the Vice Guild Master of Mir. Sung Su excitedly relays the information that he has spotted the player directly scouted and sponsored by Chae Yan Ju. On the other end of the line, Kim Young hoon orders Sung Su to seize the opportunity to humiliate Kang Wu in front of everyone, establishing the superiority of the Mir Guild over the Red Rose Guild. Isn't this the same guy that Si despises? It seems that the Demon King and the hero have something in common after all. Returning to the present, Sung Su is puzzled by Kang Wu's lack of resistance in allowing them to enter the gate. He had planned to humiliate Kang Wu while cameras and reporters captured the scene, but if Kang Wu continues to act friendly, Sung Su himself might be seen as the villain. Caught in a dilemma, Sung Su realizes that provoking Kang Wu further would only damage the image of the Mir Guild. 
Consequently, he decides to instruct his party to enter the gate without causing any further commotion. The crowd is taken aback as they witness the unexpected cooperation between the Mier and Red Rose guilds. Internally, Sung Soo ridicules Kang Wu for his apparent cowardice. He fails to comprehend why the Red Rose Guild would sponsor someone like Kang Wu. Meanwhile, the media has already decided on the headline for the day, two rival guilds collaborate to capture the mutated monster. Sung Soo sneers at the idea of the man in front of him being merely a pushover. However, Kang Wu's menacing smile is both absurd and terrifying. As they enter the gate, a long and dimly lit hallway stretches out before them. Kang Wu politely suggests merging their forces to capture the mutated monster together. Sung Soo, Discarding all pretenses, spits in front of Kang Wu and questions whether he even has any self-esteem. Trash talk is all good, but spitting is a new low. The party members are unable to determine if Kang Wu is pretending to be foolish or if he genuinely is stupid. They had expected there to be something special about someone personally chosen by Che Yan Ju. But instead, they see Kang Wu as just another loser. Their derogatory comments about Che Yan Ju and the Red Rose Guild continue. They assert that the Red Rose Guild leader is currently inactive. Unlike their esteemed Vice Guild master, Kim Young hoon who possesses immense wealth, looks, and talent. Now that's a different level of glazing. They revel in the achievements of the father and son duo from the Mir Guild, the cornerstones of their organization. Comparing them to the Red Rose Guild that recruits individuals like Kang Wu, whom they consider worthless, which highlights the stark contrast. In the background, Kang Wu silently listens, Contemplating the Mir Guild, he recalls how five years ago, the guild master and owner of Mir Electronics, Kim Jae-hyun, awakened alongside his son during the gate incident. With financial support from Mir Electronics, they swiftly ascended the ranks as a ranker and established the Mir Guild. While large guilds are known to generate immense profits, Mir, already a successful conglomerate, stands at the pinnacle of wealth. Imagine if Bill Gates started fighting monsters and leveling up to establish the Microsoft Guild. Given this context, Kang Wu entertains the idea of pinning Mier against Red Rose, waiting for both guilds to destroy each other so he can reap the rewards. However, he dismisses the thought for now, recognizing Chai Yan Ju's continued value to him. There is no point in killing the goose that lays golden eggs, only a fool would do such a thing. Above all, Kang Wu understands that Red Rose will remain useful. If you must cut something open, the choice is evident as he mischievously gazes at Sung Su and the party standing before him. The arrogant Sung Su rose increasingly annoyed by the absence of the monster. Kang Wu suggests initiating area searches to locate it. Seizing the opportunity, Sung Su insults Kang Wu as they walk aimlessly without any results. Kang Wu, however, laughs it off lightly, unfazed by the insults. As the party continues to engage in Red Rose and Chai Yan Ju slander, Kang Wu devises his plan from the shadows. He decides to gradually search the area, activating his omniscient power which rapidly extends throughout the dark hallway, unnoticed by the others. In an instant, he detects the presence of the Buer lurking just behind the nearby wall. He literally activated wall hacks to find mobs. Realizing that the demonic beast is still on the move and hasn't consumed its prey limit, Kang Wu breathes a sigh of relief and sets his plan in motion. He activates the authority of temptation, causing a white form of demonic energy to permeate the surroundings. Even the party members in front of Kang Wu sense an inexplicably appetizing aroma. Confused by the smell emanating from the labyrinth-like environment, the perceptive tank urges everyone to remain quiet for a moment. Kang Wu knows that the Buer should be able to smell the temptation from afar. The party members quickly notice something approaching, its footsteps far from those of an ordinary monster. It's just a kitty cat, nothing to worry about. They swiftly assume their battle positions ready to confront the mutated monster. Sung Su sternly reminds Kang Wu to stay in the corner, warning him not to interfere while they capture the monster. Kang Wu mocks Sung Su, remarking on his expertise in attracting death flags. Sung Su glares angrily at the once meek Kang Wu. In a twisted and mocking tone, Kang Wu reminds Sung Su that scoundrels like him are bound to meet their demise swiftly. Just as Sung Su is about to confront Kang Wu, the wall beside them shatters, and one of the party members is impaled by the monster's massive, razor sharp blade. The formerly cocky Sung Su can hardly believe his eyes. The Buer exudes a savage and menacing aura as their teammate was impaled, drenched in blood from the vicious attack. Frozen in fear, the party members are petrified by the incomprehensible monster before them. A thunderous roar resonates, leaving no doubt that the Buer didn't come here to play. That's more than just a kitty cat. Meanwhile, Kang Wu stands comfortably in his position,
pleased with the progress as the viewer's meal count increases. Sung Soo quickly regains his composure and commands the party to focus and assume battle formation. They unleash a barrage of powerful arrows and spells at the monster, but the viewer adeptly evades every attack. Panic sets in as Sung Soo orders everyone to hold their positions once again. Just then, another party member falls victim to the viewer's lethal blade, and Sung Soo helplessly stares into the monster's eyes. The cloaked party member becomes the viewer's second course. It's the Mir Guild Buffet. Just bring your own blade. Kang Wu watches patiently from a higher vantage point, relishing the ongoing count as the viewer claims two more lives of the attacking members. The remaining party member, excluding Sung Soo, pleads for help, gazing helplessly at the brutality of the monster. Meanwhile, Kang Wu remains unmoved, fully aware that his count has reached four. Sung Soo clenches his teeth and confronts the monster. It has come down to this. He channels every ounce of energy in his body, unleashing his final, desperate attack on the beast. With a blink of an eye, he closes in on the demonic creature, surrounded by purple lightning crackling from his body and spear. He unleashes his most powerful attack, the single flash. Yet, the formidable viewer nonchalantly counters his desperate onslaught. Sung Su is sent hurtling into the walls, defeated by the hellish force that is the viewer. Better luck next time, buddy. You're not Zenitsu. Kang Wu's satisfaction reaches its peak as he counts five lifeless bodies inside the viewer's stomach. The last surviving party member becomes the monster's dessert, concluding its substantial meal. The viewer savored its final dish while Sung Soo lay in an embarrassing position against the wall, traumatized by witnessing his squad effortlessly wiped out by the monster. Kang Wu celebrated as the viewer reached its full stomach state after devouring its fifth meal. Sung Soo, defeated and flabbergasted, couldn't believe what he was seeing. Walking atop the monstrous beast that had consumed five promising rookies of the Mir Guild, Kang Wu appeared to have tamed the monstrosity itself. He didn't have to go so hard on the flex like that. He explained to the traumatized Sung Soo that the viewer only needed to consume five preys in a day to reach its full stomach state. Once that happened, it would remain still unless provoked. Sung Soo couldn't believe he was hearing this from someone he had initially dismissed as another loser. Kang Wu explained the next step, activating the authority of the Dark Spear in one hand and the authority of Hellfire in the other, launching a powerful attack to kill the beast in one shot. With Sung Soo watching in disbelief, Kang Wu forcefully merged the two demonic energies in his hands. He needed to concentrate harder to use multiple powers simultaneously. Slowly but surely, the two energies began to coalesce and form something new. It's a more badass Rosingen. Kang Wu successfully merged his powers, witnessing the fusion of the heat of Hellfire and the sharpness of the Dark Spear. It resulted in the creation of the Biden, a two-pronged Dark Spear with a Hellfire Blade materializing in Kang Wu's hand. Pushing his demonic energy to the limit, Kang Wu sensed that he had acquired the s rank skill Biden, granting him more precise control of the registered skill. With determination, he plunged the beautifully mixed demonic weapon into the massive viewer, causing it to growl in pain and wake up from its slumber, writhing in agony. An explosion erupted, launching the already defeated Sun Tzu into the air. Confidently, Kang Wu walked through the aftermath of the explosion, informed that he had successfully defeated the B-Rank Cracks Fragment, raising his level by 6. Now at level 40, Kang Wu's fifth awakening had been unlocked. His level up bonus stat limit had been reached, increasing his demonic energy stat by 7. As Kang Wu stood before the lifeless corpse of the Buer, his demonic energy stat reached 60, fulfilling one condition for the extreme demonic delay. Reading the term extreme demonic delay, Kang Wu couldn't help but feel like he was in a martial arts novel. The description indicated that it was the first stage toward becoming a demonic god, and he had already fulfilled one of the three conditions. Kang Wu knew that this would grant him enormous strength in the long run. Despite spending the past 10,000 years in literal hell, he had never heard of these terms before. He realized that if he continued leveling up his stats as a player, he could surpass his power as the demon king of the ninth circle of hell and even become a demonic god. Though Kang Wu believed his greed for power was over, old habits from his demon days died hard. With that in mind, he proceeded to consume the Buer's corpse, activating the authority of gluttony as his specters of power wrapped around the gigantic body of the beast, manifesting massive limbs that seemed to drag it to hell. As an investigator, Kang Wu should have preserved the monster's corpse, but the allure of the demonic energy in front of him was too tempting. His demonic energy increased by four. Satisfied with the substantial amount of demonic energy obtained from the demonic monster, Kang Wu was interrupted by the pathetic Sung Su, he really is a talent nurtured by a top-tier guild for surviving. Cockroaches are truly resilient. 
Kang Wu assures Sung Soo that he has no intention of killing him, mentioning that he still has a role to fulfill. Kang Wu then questions Sung Soo about who has been ordering him to provoke him, suspecting that someone else is behind these actions. Sung Soo initially remains silent, but Kang Wu resorts to physical force by kicking him in the stomach and pinning him against the wall. Sung Soo eventually confesses that it was Kim Young hoon who ordered him, driven by his resentment towards the Red Rose Guild after being rejected by Che Yan Ju. Kang Wu is taken aback by the pettiness of the situation. Sung Soo reveals that the Mir Guild wants to establish superiority over the Red Rose Guild. Kang Wu asks for a photo of Young Hoon and notices his striking resemblance to the hero Kim Si Hoon. Sung Soo apologized for involving him in his boss's scheme for revenge. Kang Wu reassured him that it was in the past and that Sung Soo still had one more role to fulfill. With a bright and wholesome smile, Kang Wu playfully told Sung Soo that it would be difficult and might even be good for him. When Kang Wu smiles, bad things happen. Exiting the gate, Kang Wu assisted Sung Soo on his shoulders, attracting a swarm of players and media. Reporters bombarded them with questions about the monster, their party, and the gate. Amidst the incessant inquiries, Kang Wu acted out a plea for help, screaming for an ambulance for the injured Mr. Sung Soo, whose face was even more battered than before. Gently laying Sung Soo down, Kang Wu began conversing with the reporters. He claimed that Sung Soo had fought the mutated monster and, when asked about the other party members, he wore a pained expression and revealed that only the two of them survived. The revelation shocked the media, considering involving the Huarang course. However, Kang Wu dismissed the need for further force. As Sung Soo tried to scream for help, Kang Wu silenced him, praising him as a hero and declaring that he had saved Kang Wu's life by defeating the mutated monster. When asked for more details, Kang Wu complied, recounting their entrance into a dungeon-like area filled with stifling, murderous intent. They noticed the monster lurking near the gate's entrance, which didn't belong to a B-rank gate. They initially thought about fleeing but decided to stand their ground, realizing the monster would harm civilians if it escaped. The Master Storyteller himself Kang Wu confirmed that the initial reports accurately described the horrific beast that swiftly eliminated their party. When the situation grew dire, Sung Soo pleaded for Kang Wu to run while he faced the mutated monster alone. Unable to flee, Kang Wu stayed until the battle concluded, emphasizing its brutality. After the fight, Sung Soo continued muttering the names of his fallen party members until he lost consciousness. Kang Wu gestured for Sung Soo to save his breath, assuring him that help was on the way. Reporters questioned why Sung Soo had behaved aggressively toward Kang Wu if he was so chivalrous. Kang Wu cleverly twisted it, suggesting that Sung Soo was overly concerned about him as a newly selected player of the Red Rose Guild. To conclude his performance, Kang Wu shed tears and proclaimed the battered Sung Soo as his savior and the true hero of their time. Get this man an Oscars or something. Countless newspapers covered Kang Wu's heartwarming story, leading to 30 million won in donations from civilians. However, Sung Soo was labeled as the hero who never woke up, as his cerebral hemorrhaging left him in a vegetative state. It's the loss of another star. You either die a villain or become a vegetable hero. Chai Yanju can be seen sitting in a meeting room as she reads the news article about Sung Soo. No matter which way she looks at it, the injuries sustained by the guy were more consistent with a beating rather than a battle with a monster. She wonders what in the world Kang Wu was doing these days. She might just be raising a tiger cub. It's already a full-grown tiger boss. A beautiful older woman can be seen sitting across Yanju. She remarks that Yanju's rookie is cute while being sly as a fox in front of the reporters. This is the Sanara Guild master, John Kangju. Add her to the mommy list. Yanju clarified that Kangwu is not a rookie at all as she tried to drive away Yumju, calling her an old woman. This enraged the beautiful guild master. They discussed that the appearance of this demonic monster is probably the doing of the demonic order. It's only a matter of time before the public catch up with this information as the order is becoming more active than ever before. After the day of the cataclysm, peace was only possible after the establishment of the Big Five Guilds. If the masses find out that a cult that does human sacrifice threatens that peace, civilization will once again be plunged into chaos. When asked about the Red Rose's stance on the situation, a hint of bloodthirst can be seen emanating from the fierce Yanju. Kangu barged into the room, surprised to see that there was a guest over. The Sanara Guild master just introduced herself as Yanju's friend in a carefree manner. She postured to leave as Kangwu assured her that he'll just come back later so they should continue their chat. Since she's already done with business, she started to head out, and Kangwu felt some pressure as she walks by him. She lightly admonished Kangwu for calling her a lady as if she's old, to which Kangwu tried to apologize. 
The Sanare Guild Master left the room with a worried look painted on her face. Yanju just shrugged off the lady as someone she knows when Kangwu asked who that was. She slid an S-rank gate permit that Kangwu requested earlier. He was extremely pleased with the power of Red Rose for processing this so quickly. S-rank speed run record secured. Yanju warned Kangwu to not even think about hunting in an S-rank gate. Kangwu changed the subject by revealing that he heard the previous conversation that Yanju was having earlier. Even though it's classified information, she might as well just inform Kangwu anyway. Kangwu tried the tea as they continued discussing the demonic order. Yanju described them as mentally insane villains who offer up live human sacrifices, and they're becoming too active as of late. The guilds still don't know when the order was formed or how big they are, so the guilds and the government are cooperating to find out more regarding the demonic order. It seems like the rest of the five guilds know of this existence, but the Red Rose is the only guild that is heavily invested in the investigation. When Kangwu asked why that is, Yanju explained that this is not volunteer work. They are guaranteed a handsome reward in exchange for defeating the Order, but it's not solely because of that. The numerous guild members she has sent to investigate the Order have been sacrificed. There is no way that Yanju would leave such a vile organization alone. Just based on her hatred alone, Kangwu can already deduce that the damage done by the Order is massive. Kangwu is witnessing a true rancor. You can sense the palpable, murderous intent just by looking at her. He knows that this woman in front of him is incredibly powerful. It's enough to make him want to fight her right now. Kangwu got straight to the point and asked if this was his mission. Yanju confirmed, they may not have enough details, but the order is too powerful to be considered just a cult. Yanju's going to need strong players going forward. She gave Kangwu the opportunity to back out now if he wants, but she urged him to join her crusade. Kangwu picked up the s rank player card as he reassures her not to worry. Since she helped him out immensely already, he's at least going to fulfill his duty. Yanju lets out a rare smile at Kangwu's reply. Hit her with that revenge riz. Kangwu was celebrating inwardly to himself, is truly hit the jackpot. The more traces they find, the more demonic energy he can consume. Yanju informed him that they'll keep an open contact regarding any information about the demonic energy as Kangwu will start assisting them with the investigation. Finishing the conversation, she reiterated once again not to hunt in the S-rank gate. A few moments later, we can see Kangwu driving off with his new car as he's bound for Wasio. He's enjoying the convenience of his new personal vehicle. S-rank and a new car, he's living good now. He looked at his status window displaying his fifth awakening special ability, the rank S, Master of Demons. With this skill, he can summon a demon from another dimension. Depending on the demonic energy used, a powerful demon can be summoned. The summoned demon will recognize the caster as its master, and the skill has a three-month cooldown. Let's pray to the Gacha Gods for a five-star pull. Kangwu needs to make sure to summon a powerful demon given the long cooldown. If his hypothesis is correct, the gates act as a bridge to another dimension outside of Earth. The higher the rank of the gate, the more powerful beings can cross. This was the case with the demons of hell known as Cracks Fragments. To put it simply, the higher the rank of the gate, the more powerful the summoned demon will be. That's when he arrived at his destination. The place where he'll be using his ability is obviously what's in front of him. An S-Rank Gate. This is the tightly secured Uwon S-Rank Gate entrance. The Warang Base Camp Number 1. Kang Wu's new player card was verified at the security check. And the personnel started the process of opening the gate. Kang Wu was sure that without the help of the Red Rose, he couldn't even attempt to enter this gate. After the extensive procedure of opening, Kang Wu entered the legendary S-Rank Gate. He was transported to a beach facing a vast ocean with beautiful rock formations and mysterious rune engravings. He remarks that this place would be a great vacation spot if it weren't for the S-Rank monsters. This is a very different kind of beach episode. He finds a good spot in the middle of the beach and took a seat on the sand. If he could summon a Cerberus, it would be a great success as it's above the ranks of the Third Hell. But regardless of which demon he summons, he'll gain a huge advantage. With that, Kangwu concentrated as he begins casting his ability. A massive amount of demonic energy coalesced in Kangwu's body. He struggled to concentrate as much energy as he can to maximize the ability. A massive portal was beginning to take form above his head as a crack in the fabric of reality started to materialize. With the final push, Kangwu persisted. The sky opened in majestic colors as he successfully created a crack to complete the summon. Because of his myriad demon palace, he was notified that he has created a deeper crack. All Kang Wu saw was a bright green light above, so far, all the gates he's seen had a blue shoe. Another notification informed him that due to the Gaia system malfunction, 
He just contacted the other world. A dimensional gate to the continent of Eleanor has been opened. Kangwu hoped that nothing's wrong as he's unfamiliar with all these notifications. That's when Kangwu can finally heave a sigh of relief as the summoning has succeeded. He tried hard to open his eyes to the bright green light, and he was confused at what he's seeing in front of him. The demon that he just summoned is a gargantuan and bloodied s rank dragon named Echidna, the hatchling daughter of the demon dragon Kargath. She is now successfully registered as Kangwu's summoned demon. That's a legendary pull if I ever saw one. Kangwu stared incredulously at the gigantic figure of a dragon in front of him, but there was something evidently wrong with the state of the majestic beast. She was injured and bloodied as she crashed down from the crack. That's when Kangwu started hearing strange and foreign voices following his summoning. He looked up to see the source of these unfamiliar voices. A dwarf, a woman garbed in a mage's cloak, an elven archer, a heavily armored paladin with a massive shield, and a swordsman with a noble aura came out from the same portal he had just created. The strange group continued conversing in their own language as Kangwu stood at the back, confused by the development of this bizarre event. Who are these people, and what in the world are they so stressed about? Kangwu noted that their attire wasn't quite what he was used to seeing in Korea. These guys actually looked like they had popped out of a genuine fantasy world. Imagine being so OP that you can summon a whole different anime. He needed to understand what they were saying and what was happening. So he started gathering demonic energy once again. There was a power that allowed Kangwu to communicate with those who did not speak the same language. The authority of communication, the authority of Google Translate, is too strong. A demonic phantom materialized as Kangwu activated his convenient skill, and he started to understand what the group in front of him was saying. The swordsman named Reynolds seemed agitated as the elven girl tried to calm him down. The elven archer continued, stating that the dragon was about to die, so they didn't need to worry about it anymore. Randall heaved a sigh of relief at the thought that the dragon would not be able to harm anyone anymore. That's when Kangwu interjected and asked the group of strangers who they were. The noble swordsman asked if Kangwu was alright after the dragon's descent and proudly introduced himself as Reynold von Arnon, the third prince of the Arnon Empire. Reynold also asked Kangwu who he was and Kangwu became even more confused. He had never heard of the continent of Eleanor or the Arnon Empire. And now that he was getting a better look, he noticed the elf and the dwarf. This only reaffirmed Kangwu's hypothesis that this group might actually come from another world. Maybe they're Lord of the Rings cosplayers. The demonic dragon that he had just summoned continued to struggle for breath. It was clear that she was on her last legs. Kangwu was really confused by this chain of events, but he approached the dragon while manifesting demonic energy in his hands. No matter what happened, he would not allow the demon he had just summoned to die easily. With a powerful touch, he activated the authority of resurrection on his summon. Remarkable power started to flow throughout the body of the dragon, and wounds and bruises rapidly started to heal as if they didn't exist in the first place. That's his most broken power so far. Seeing this sight, Reynold angrily shouted at the man in front of him, healing and resurrecting the dragon they had just fought tooth and nail to slay. That's when the dragon asked Kangwu if he was her master. She thanked Kangwu for treating her, and he just shrugged it off like it was a given. The dragon, Echidna, apologized for showing up injured and incapacitated after her summoning. Kangwu was surprised that they were already communicating directly through thoughts. It was a sign that she had already acknowledged him as the true master. Kangwu calmed her down, reaffirming that everything was okay. As he observed the injuries sustained by his new companion, Reynolds' sword was already near his neck, with every weapon of the party locked onto him. Reynolds was furious as he realized that this man was the demon dragon's master. Kang Wu calmly asked the noble why they were trying to kill Echidna. Reynold hatefully responded that this creature was an evil demon dragon. He insisted that this beast was the cause of the disastrous drought and plague. Countless citizens of the empire had lost their lives because of this demon dragon and its magic. Echidna sincerely denied these allegations, and Kang Wu backed up her words. Kang Wu tried to reason with the prince, as she really had the power to cause an atmospheric phenomenon like a drought. Her existence would be closer to that of a god and they wouldn't even be able to touch her, let alone defeat her. There would be no way she would be wounded to the point that she was gasping for life like this. Did Kangwu just make a reasonable argument? As if he didn't hear Kangwu, Reynold made up his mind that Echidna was simply a vile beast. Kangwu already knew that this guy would be bothersome as he wasn't listening to reason anymore. Reynold confidently vowed to slay Echidna in order to save the suffering citizens of the Empire. And the whole party took up their positions. Kangwu hated stubborn fools like this guy people who only cared about their own justice and shut their eyes and ears to those who opposed them. Same brother, same. So Kangwu gathered a massive amount of demonic energy in his hands and promptly activated the authority of explosion. 
The whole party was sent flying back with the immense power of Kang Wu's sudden attack. Perhaps Reynold and his party were right. Maybe Echidna did start a drought and a plague to destroy the Arnon Empire. So what? Kang Wu did not care. He vowed that regardless of what Echidna may have done, she was now his familiar. And he had absolutely no intention of giving up on this familiar that he had just summoned. Reynold tried to insult and curse Kang Wu for being demonic. But Kang Wu simply replied that he genuinely was a real one, a real demon. That's a clapback. Reynolds' hatred reached its peak as he locked onto Kang Wu like he was his mortal enemy. He pledged to the suffering citizens of the Arnon Empire that he, Reynold von Arnon, would vanquish Kang Wu no matter what. His party had mixed reactions to this solemn vow. The paladin even reassured him that they had already defeated a dragon. So there was no way they wouldn't be able to defeat a mere demon. Kang Wu found this valiant act seriously ridiculous. He thought that this group might just be tripping or something. Suddenly, Echidna tried to warn him about this group. Reynold closed the distance and brandished his blade toward Kang Wu with killing intent. Kang Wu promptly responded with his demonic energy, creating a massive explosion that separated them and created a safe distance. Kang Wu had taken out his authority of the blade, concluding that Reynolds' attack just now was not something he could simply block. It was a good thing he had the gargoyle armor equipped. He needed to take this fight somewhere else. With a powerful stomp of his foot, he once again activated the authority of explosion. The party was sent flying into the air as Kang Wu raised the ground itself with his explosive power. He swiftly followed this up with an adaptation skill for the authority of explosion. Multiple circular eyes of explosion started to appear mid-air around the whole party. Kang Wu activated the heat wave downpour as the circular eyes rained down on the group, resembling an explosive meteor shower. The paladin tried his best to deflect the erratic attack as he activated his iron wall skill. He might have effectively blocked the meteors from the front, but multiple meteors were already on their way from his rear. He looked back and briefly saw the meteors inches away from him before he was engulfed by a massive explosion. Reynold desperately called out to the paladin named Hans. He should have invested for two shields. But before they could even process what happened to Hans, Kang Wu was already within striking distance of Reynold with his authority of the blade drawn. The prince did not expect Kang Wu to be this fast. Kang Wu chased after the noble using the debris mid-air as platforms. They landed on the ground as Kang Wu suddenly noticed a gust quickly forming on Reynold's blade. He proudly brandished his sword and shouted his technique, Arnon's Swordsmanship, Chapter 1, Blade Storm. A mighty gust engulfed Kang Wu as the technique landed. Kang Wu didn't waste a second and activated the authority of Iron Wall, effectively defending against Reynold's impressive attack. He landed a kick on the prince, sending him flying a few meters back. He couldn't help but wonder why his recent opponents had been shouting their skill names in the middle of the fight. Though who's grateful for that? Free info was always welcome. Reynold had already recovered and was already in Kang Wu's face as he tried to cut him with his blade of light. Kang Wu was light on his feet as he gracefully dodged the full powered attack to the side. Reynold was equally persistent and angry as he quickly redirected his attacks toward the untouchable Kang Wu. He once again let out a massive swing with a powerful gust, but Kang Wu was already privy to this combination. So he nonchalantly prepared for the impact. Reynolds' sword swung down to the ground, and a massive explosion of dust obscured the view. But Kang Wu was already hopping away out of the damage area. He admitted that Reynolds was truly strong. If he didn't have his fifth awakening, it would have been dangerous. The prince gloated about how strong his techniques were. But Kang Wu had already found his weakness. He was too honest. Kang Wu charged toward Reynolds as he shouted, Blade Slash, loudly. The noble hero readied himself for the Blade Slash by raising his sword for defense. But instead of a slash, a kick to the side of Reynolds' leg was unleashed. A sharp pain attacked Reynolds' system. He fell from the classic and got his kneecap broken. Ouch! He shivered in pain and in disbelief as Kang Wu clearly shouted Blade Slash but kicked him instead. Kang Wu responded with his classic malicious smile as he insulted Reynolds for being extremely stupid. Foul play and trash talk. That's our boy. The party couldn't help but worry for their shivering prince. Reynolds warned them to run away. He knew they couldn't win like this. Kang Wu was too strong. Yun Kang Wu himself knew that running away was the group's only option. As soon as he took away the prince's leg, it was over. The mage called out to Reynold, insisting that they couldn't leave him behind. Reynold continued to plead with his party to flee. He even valiantly declared that the Arnon Empire was now in their hands. Kang Wu delivered another kick as he insulted the prince for his disgraceful state. Kang Wu looked at Reynold sprawled on the ground and decided to finish the job. To him, all battles progressed this way, no sympathy. No mercy, no anger, only fighting and killing for survival. In hell, emotions were considered a luxury. 
He got the hellish dog in him. As Kamu prepared to drive his blade towards Reynold, the mage pleaded and positioned herself in front of the prince. She begged Kamu to take her instead of Reynold. If he died, everything would be lost. Reynold was touched by the actions of this woman named Rena. She cried for the hope of the Arnon citizens and the man she loved. In such unfortunate timing, she confessed her feelings. She vowed to do anything Kang Wu wanted just to spare the prince's life. Kang Wu simply responded with a playful rejection. He mocked everything Rena had just said. He didn't care if the prince died, this whole thing had nothing to do with him. Kang Wu asked the terrified party if he looked like he cared even a tiny bit. The shivering prince versus the Giga Chad Demon King. They were the ones who started this in the first place. He knew he wouldn't have been spared if he were in their shoes. He lectured them, saying that if they raised their weapons to kill, they should also be prepared to die. Kang Wu mocked them with disgust on his face, telling them to take their emotions to a soap opera. Reynold and Rena couldn't believe the words coming out of Kang Wu's mouth. They called him dirty and nasty, but wasn't teaming up on someone usually considered nasty and using fiends in a fight was common knowledge. Kang Wu was already fed up with this ridiculous party as he raised his blade. He reassured them that he would send them off painlessly with one blow, call them one stab man. But suddenly, he was interrupted by notifications confirming that other beings had crossed over the gate, so the Gaia system would be dealing with the foreign intruders. The entire Arnon party started glitching out as if they were being transported elsewhere, surprising Kang Wu. He quickly realized what was happening and mustered his fastest speed. He didn't want to let them escape. His eyes were fixated on those expensive-looking pieces of equipment. They were supposed to be his trophies. Since they were from another world, it wouldn't cause him any trouble if he eliminated them. He didn't want to let go of such a lucky find. But he was too late. The Gaia system successfully expelled the foreign invaders. The loot got disconnected. Kang Wu's blade struck nothing but the ground. He couldn't believe that he had come so close without any hitches. But once again, the Gaia system had ruined his plans. Considering these modifications, Kang Wu panicked as he scanned the area for what he had originally come for. He let out a sigh of relief as he looked down from the cliff and saw his familiar echidna still there. Gracefully, he jumped off the cliff, wondering once again what in the world the Gaia system was. Perhaps it was a defensive barrier meant to block foreign invaders. He recalled encountering the malfunctioning Gaia system when he was crossing over to Earth. He thought that the system might still be malfunctioning to this day. Kangu wondered if it had something to do with the demons from hell that had been appearing recently. The monsters had started to appear around two to three weeks ago. When Kangu thought about the time frame, something crossed his mind. The demonic monsters had appeared around the same time as his crossover. No matter how you looked at it, he was in the middle of all these events. All he had wanted was to escape hell and enjoy some kimchi stew. He panicked, not knowing how to untangle this web of happenings. That's when Echidna called out to him asking if the party that had injured her had retreated. Kang Wu confirmed, and his familiar thanked him. He had no reason to dwell on something he didn't have the answers to, so he pushed the thought of the Gaia system to the back of his mind for now. He instructed Echidna to stay put as he continued the healing process. The dragon continued to sincerely thank him for taking care of her. Since Echidna was a gigantic dragon, Kang Wu asked her if she could control her size at all. She promptly complied with her master's inquiry. Additionally, Kang Wu asked her about the continent of Eleanor. According to Echidna, it was a completely different world that revolved around the Arnon Empire. They used swords and magic, and it was a world that had elves, monsters, and dragons like her. They got that generic fantasy continent on lock. Echidna had already transformed into her admirable miniature form as Kang Wu and she exited the gate, now en route to somewhere else in his car. Kang Wu wondered if all the monsters, aside from the demons, came from the continent of Eleanor. This theory seemed plausible. The adorable miniature Echidna interrupted his thoughts, asking him where they were going. He responded that they were going home to a residence. Echidna was unfamiliar with the word residence, though she thought it might be Kang Wu's nest. Kang Wu didn't mind the visual of him and Sol on nesting together. It's just like me for real. Echidna was delighted that Kang Wu was inviting her to his nest. She sincerely thanked her new master, as it had been a while since she had visited someone else's nest. It turned out that the dragon had been alone for a long time. She had originally lived with her father as a small, helpless dragon until he disappeared. Since then, she had only read books in the lair by herself. She felt lonely on her own. Then suddenly, someone came into her home, and that was Reynold. She trembled and cried in Kang Wu's lap as she swore to her master that she really hadn't done anything. She hadn't caused the drought or the plague. She kept telling the party that it wasn't her, but they didn't believe her. The tiny dragon meekly asked Kang Wu if he believed her. 
We believe you, little dragon. Kaimu recognized this trembling and gaze. He knew this state all too well. He had been the exact same. He thought back to his earliest memories, growing up in an orphanage. It had been a luxury to even hope to meet his parents, but he didn't care who they were, as long as they could love him. All he had wanted was to be cared for and have his existence validated. Right in the fields. He'd remember telling Reynold and his party to take their emotions to a soap opera, but here he was. He turned to Echidna and solemnly vowed that even if the rest of the world condemned her, he would be there to believe in her. Kang Wu wiped away the tears of his newfound familiar as he stared at the adorable dragon tenderly. Echidna repeated the name O Kang Wu and promised to never forget it. A few moments later, Sola could be seen having a cuteness overload while hugging the adorable miniature dragon, Echidna. Kang Wu sat across the table, munching on kimchi stew as usual. He hadn't expected Sola to be so openly approving of him having a monster familiar. Sola just couldn't resist Echidna's cuteness. She swore that anything cute could do no wrong. She's speaking nothing but facts. Echidna tried her best to get out of Sola's grasp as she clung to Kang Wu like a scared child. It turned out that Sola and the rest of the party had been progressing and leveling up quickly. They should soon be able to have their third awakenings and gain access to C-rank gates. Sola thanked Kang Wu for introducing her to such a great party and for providing significant guidance. She continued, saying that if it weren't for Kang Wu, she couldn't even dream of having a life like the one she had now. The two shared a genuine moment of appreciation for each other at the dining table. Kang Wu wondered if this was what it was like to be loved. It certainly wasn't a bad feeling at all. Sola capped off the night by asking Kang Wu if Echidna could sleep with her tonight. A jealous Kang Wu complied. We see Kang Wu miserably waking up from his sleep as the sun peeks through his window. With bags under his eyes, he wonders why he feels more tired instead of rested today. This is just us every single morning. He came to the kitchen where the beautiful Sola greeted him good morning as she carried the newly cooked breakfast. She noted that Kang Wu woke up later than usual today. He feels strangely lethargic this morning, worrying Sola that he might be sick. With a stretch, Kang Wu reaffirmed that he's fine. That's when someone unfamiliar asked Kang Wu if he slept well. Kang Wu sensed that something is off at this dining table. He was shocked at the sight of a child with white hair and a single horn. Sola was serving the human form of Echidna's cereal for breakfast. It seems like Echidna is capable of more than just changing her size. She can also alter her appearance. But Echidna herself is not sure. All she recalls is feeling a strange sensation while she was sleeping last night. When she woke up, her appearance had already changed to that of a human child. Kang Wu is pretty sure that it has something to do with the fact that he feels tired right now. He fears that her powers were sealed like his. It would be troublesome if she can't change back. Dragon nerfs? So, he asked his familiar if she can turn back to her original form. It shouldn't have confirmed in a lively manner as she got up from her seat and a green aura started emanating from her. The adorable dragon child focused her intent on transforming back to her original form. Kang Wu was dumbfounded that this child is so eager to prove herself. He realized that he made a mistake by asking, as Echidna's wings started to come out and the table and the whole apartment began to shake with the power of Echidna's transformation. She began roaring like a demonic beast and completely ruined the place before she was stopped. Solal's apartment is so prone to damages. First her brother, now Echidna. A few moments later, the three sat in the living room surrounded by wrecked furniture and walls. Echidna was crying as she sincerely apologized for causing Sola and Kangwu trouble. Sola comforted her, saying it's alright since she didn't know any better. It seems like Echidna didn't have any problems with transforming. Sola gently advised the child not to transform at home next time. Kangwu knows that she needs to get used to human life. It seems like this dragon was influenced by him when she became his familiar. Echidna adorably asked Sola if she should bring a boulder to fix up their nest. She's too cute. It seems like she has no problems using the human language either. When it comes to appearance, her human form is better if he must take her to places with him. Sala changed the subject by suggesting they go shopping to get some clothes while the repairman comes by and fixes the place. The clothes from her childhood are too old and do not fit Echidna well. She wants to go to a big department store nearby. When asked if Kangwu wants to tag along, Echidna was elated and shining with anticipation as she urged her master to join them shopping. Unfortunately, it might be a bit tricky for Kangwu. It turns out that he's not going for a hunt today. But he can't join them at the department store either. He needs to go somewhere else. We see the massive headquarters of the Red Rose Guild. And Kangwu's new car is parked outside. He's in a meeting room, briefing Yanju about everything that happened inside the S-rank gate. From summoning a dragon as a familiar to the Eleanor party and even the Gaia system. 
Yanju recounts all of this as Kang will happily stares at his phone. Bro just casually dropping insane lore like it's nothing. Yanju even knows that Echidna has turned into a human, and Kangwu was asking for an ID for her. Kang was surprised that the guild leader is taking in all this information well. Even the influential Yanju has no idea what in the world the Gaia system is. Kang was still on his phone, texting Sala, as she sends pictures of Echidna with her adorable new wardrobe. Yanju still cannot believe that Kang Wu summoned a dragon as a familiar, she really cannot grasp Kang Wu's identity. At some point, Yanju just accepted the fact that she offered her hand to a wild card. As expected of the powerful guild, Yanju will take care of the ID for Echidna. After that is settled, Kang Wu proceeds to cheerfully ask for another favor. As he states what he needs, someone enters the door. Kang Wu instantly recognizes this imposing voice. It's the Huarang Corps commander, Bek Huayan. She needs to talk to Yanju about something. Huayan apologizes for intruding when she sees Kang Wu sitting across from the Red Rose Guild leader. She asks if this is the rookie that the Red Rose has been sponsoring as Kang Wu's mind reels, thinking if he has done anything wrong recently. Yanju clarifies that Kang Wu is not a member of the Guild, but they're in a cooperative relationship. Bek Huayan formally introduces herself, and Kang Wu does the same. He thinks that it might be problematic to have the Red Rose behind him now. Wei-in recalls that this was the guy that she personally inspected right outside a C-rank gate a few days ago. Yanju immediately assumes the worst when Wei-in recognizes Kang Wu. She thinks that he might have beaten up a Huarang Corps officer or something. Wei-in defends Kang Wu, as she has the impression that he is a polite and righteous young man from their brief interaction. Yanju cannot believe that these adjectives are coming out of the dignified commander's mouth. He's in boys. Yanju can't take it anymore and asks Kang Wu to get to the point of his favor. Kang Wu promptly asks her for an official S-rank entrance pass. This favor flabbergasts both Yanju and Huayan. Yanju feels a headache coming on upon hearing that this guy wants to truly hunt in an S-rank gate this time around. Kang Wu reassures her that it might be dangerous by himself, but he has a familiar now. New pet, new gate. She seriously asks him if he knows what he's getting into and what appears in the Suwon S-rank gate. Kang Wu confidently answers that he knows what he's doing. The ferocious wyverns, the stalwart mountain giants, the savage giant ogres, and the most fearsome of them all. The El Cuero. Yanju warns that even if Kang Wu were to hunt in the gate, he must not go near the lake for any reason at all. Kang Wu reassures her once again that he'll be fine as Bek Huayun is shocked and confused by the conversation happening in front of her. The mention of an S-rank gate and Kang Wu together is incredulous to her. She knows that this guy was hunting a C-rank gate just a few weeks ago. Yanju interjects that there was just a complicated situation, but Kang Wu's abilities can be trusted. He has that Red Rose approval stamp. Huayan contemplates if Kang Wu has been hiding his identity all along. But even if that's the case, even national rankers avoid hunting at the S rank gate. Kang Wu is pleased with the attention as Huayan praises him for being quite a player. With that, Kang Wu prepares to take his leave. Yanju confirms to him that he'll be able to hunt at the S rank gate starting tomorrow. She once again sincerely wishes Kang Wu to be careful. Even if she's aware that Kang Wu is extraordinary, it's still an extremely dangerous place. She's a good leader. Kang Wu promises to keep it in mind as he walks away from the meeting room, leaving Huayan and Yanju. The two powerful women get right into business as soon as Kang Wu steps out. Yanju asks Huayan if the government has finally caught the tail of the demonic order. Huayan disappointingly answers that it is not the case. But there is something for them to be hopeful for. This piques the guild leader's interest. It turns out that one of their members has infiltrated the Demonic Order, which is surprising. And it turns out that this undercover agent will be providing them with a video clip with compelling evidence at a contact point. That cult looks a tad bit familiar. It's not an easy situation, so they had to arrange a contact point with the agent. When asked where, Huayan reveals that it will be tomorrow at Suwon, Waso Station. This place catches Yanju's attention. It's near the s rank gate that Okangwu wants to hunt at. Coincidence? I guess we'll see. The adorable Echidna beamed with joy as she showed off her new outfit to Kang Wu. He praised his familiar like a proud dad, and Echidna couldn't stop smiling around the apartment. She thanks Sola for the outfit after learning that her master liked it. Kang Wu and Echidna finished their preparations, putting on their shoes together in anticipation of the hunt. Sola reminded them to be careful. They're like a happy family here. Let's hope nothing bad happens. Kang Wu reminded Echidna not to transform without his permission. Sala observed this scene and couldn't help but feel a little sad. She wished she could join them in the hunt. As if reading her mind, Kang Wu asked Sola if she was planning to hunt with the Taesu party that day too. 
It turned out they had made plans. Kang Wu told her that he would join them on one of these days, and Echidna eagerly chimed in. Hearing Kang Wu and Echidna express their excitement about hunting with her and the party, Sola smiled genuinely, looking forward to the hunt. Kang Wu acknowledged that Sola had enough battle experience, but he wanted to help her grow further. With that, Kang Wu and Echidna bid farewell and headed for the S rank gate. Inside the Suwon S rank gate, Kang Wu oriented Echidna on three important things to remember. Firstly, she should avoid going near the lake due to a dangerous monster. Secondly, after the monster was lured out, she should refrain from directly engaging and instead provide assistance. Lastly, Kang Wu prohibited Echidna from transforming into her original form to avoid drawing attention. Echidna listened enthusiastically and agreed to all the instructions. With the guidelines established, Kang Wu activated the omniscient power of the authority of observation, summoning a massive phantom with an all-seeing eye. His demonic energy spread throughout the gate, scouting for monsters. Google Maps looks super strange here. Finally, he detected a sign of his first target, the giant ogre. Wanting to start slowly, Kang Wu activated the authority of temptation. The sweet aroma of his demonic energy permeated the vast plains, pleasing even Echidna. Kang Wu reminded Echidna to prepare for combat. Standing atop a tall rock, Kang Wu began channeling the power of the demon Baphomet greatly increasing his strength by activating the authority of Thousand. Surrounded by a savage red aura, Kang Wu rushed towards the monster in his sights. The giant ogre was within striking distance, and they engaged in a contest of pure strength. They exchanged concentrated punches, each meeting the other's strike. Their strengths seemed equal as they held their ground, and the surrounding area absorbed the impact. Unstoppable force meets a movable object. However, being an S-rank monster, the attack that usually one-shot Kang Wu's opponents failed to work this time. In fact, it didn't even budge the giant ogre after he struck with the authority of Thousand, but Kang Wu wasn't helpless in front of the beast. He redirected the giant ogre's fist, concealing himself in the debris, only to re-emerge in less than a second, wielding the sharpness of the authority of the Dark Spear at close range. The giant ogre was impaled from the jaw to its head, but to Kang Wu's surprise, it gritted its fangs and swiftly grabbed him in mid-air. Fortunately, Echidna saw this and promptly provided support by activating her Dark Storm spell. Multiple dark magical blades cut into the giant ogre's body, causing it to roar in pain. Kang Wu seized the opportunity to break free from its massive grasp. Praising Echidna, he activated the authority of thunder and lightning, summoning a condensed electric ball in his hand. This is just Kakashi and his Chidori. Kang Wu mercilessly unleashed this powerful spell towards the womb he made with the Dark Spear, the giant ogre let out its final howl as Kang Wu's thunder and lightning cooked it from the inside. After a while, Kang Wu received notification of his victory over the s rank monster, the giant ogre, increasing his level by one. It was said that only parties with players over level 65 hunted in this gate, and the XP gained was truly equivalent to the difficulty. Echidna hurriedly ran to Kang Wu's side, asking if she had done well. Kang Wu praised her for effectively stunning the ogre. Even Echidna herself was surprised by the power of her spell. She had truly grown stronger since being summoned by Kang Wu. If she was already this strong in her human form, Kang Wu believed they could attempt to drive Hunt when she transformed into her original form. Suddenly, Echidna caught a whiff of something delicious. With an ear-piercing screech, the sky was suddenly filled with a staggering number of ferocious wyverns targeting them. These wyverns must have been attracted by the battle against the giant ogre. Kang Wu quickly lifted Echidna like a princess and instructed her to hold on tight. They needed to retreat upon realizing the overwhelming numbers. The authority of speed was a surface transport skill, so it wouldn't be as effective in escaping the flying wyverns. In that case, Kang Wu ran and jumped to the edge of a cliff, activating the authority of sky. Six beautifully sinister wings sprouted from his back. He pushed himself to the limit, soaring through the sky, but the wyverns quickly closed in with their incredible speed. Looking back, Kang Wu saw a group of hungry s rank monsters eager to reach their prey. However, he knew losing them wouldn't be a problem as one wyvern flew past, grazing Echidna's new skirt. Time seemed to freeze for the little dragon as she witnessed the fabric tear midair. Overwhelmed with anger, she started to transform. It was at this moment, the wyverns knew, they messed up. All she could think about was Kang Wu complimenting her outfit, and now a wyvern had damaged it. With a powerful roar, a massive white claw instantly dispatched one wyvern. Echidna, now in her original form, burned with rage as she regarded the ferocious wyverns as if they're tiny flying lizards. The wyverns sensed the danger and squirmed in fear. 
Echidna struck, taking down two wyverns with a single bite. She followed up by grabbing another two as if they were toys. Kaimu was speechless as he watched his familiar go on a rampage in mid-air. Another wyvern fell near him as Echidna struck with her sharp claw. Consecutive notifications bombarded Kangwu, informing him that his familiar had defeated an S-rank wyvern multiple times. He couldn't believe that this was the same Echidna who had nearly died fighting Reynold and his party. She was much stronger than Kangwu had anticipated. As wyvern blood spurted everywhere, a thought haunted Kangwu. His familiar might be stronger than him. That's a free-level booster. A few moments later, after the battle, Echidna was once again back in her human form as she woke up in her master's arms. They were still inside the gate after the wyvern's slaughter. Echidna had no strength left in her body after going all out just a few minutes ago. Kangwu thought that this was the natural consequence of using up too much strength in her original form. She had lost consciousness the moment she transformed back to her smaller form. It was fortunate that Kangwu was there to catch her as she fell. Echidna remembered how her dress was torn by a wyvern, and she started to cry once again. Kangwu gently reassured her that it was okay, and they could always buy another one. But Echidna was reluctant to let go of the matter, so Kangwu used his stern voice and stared at her as he reminded her not to transform out of the blue like this in the future. He seriously stated that he did not like those who could not control their anger and lose their rationality. Scared, Echidna hurriedly apologized, promising never to do it again as she pleaded with Kangwu not to abandon her. Kangwu was quick to reassure Echidna that he would never abandon her. This was the first time they had battled together. He gently reminded her to just not do it again next time. She's just too precious. Just don't make her mad. Kangwu immediately felt a little guilty as he might have been too hard on her. He comforted Echidna, saying they would go back and buy more clothes immediately. He might have been too hard, but Kangwu needed to be decisive. Losing rationality during a battle was a huge problem. But today, the outcome was remarkably profitable. He went from level 41 to level 49 in one go. That's a speedrun. Kangwu knew that Echidna would be strong in her original form, but wiping out the wyverns by herself was beyond his expectations. Because of that, even his demonic energy had decreased significantly. He concluded that Echidna was able to transform into a human form and become stronger than ever because she absorbed Kangwu's demonic energy after becoming his familiar. The more she used his demonic energy, the greater power she could wield. Therefore, as Kangwu became stronger, Echidna can grow stronger alongside him. Kangwu was like a giant battery for this dragon, although overdoing it did take a toll on her small body. Suddenly, Kangwu was alerted by the familiar sound of rushing monsters approaching them. There was a pair of giant ogres. Kangwu thought he would head back for the day, but now he had to take care of two S-rank monsters without Echidna's support. He readied himself to pounce, thinking he was about to get more workout. However, a muscular guy wearing a tropical shirt and a hooded man wielding a bloodthirsty dagger had already taken care of the business in one shot each. Kangwu stared at both mysterious figures, clueless as to what had led him to this situation. The guy wearing a tropical shirt carefully approached Kangwu, asking if he was alright. Staring at these two men, even the clueless Kangwu recognized them immediately. The guild master of the specialized bandit guild, Anori, Cha Min Hayuk, and the guild master of Han Nul and the number one ranker in Korea, Baek kang -yen. kang Kangwu could not believe the coincidence of running into two of the most powerful people in the country together. Rank one guy gives off chill vibes, doesn't he? The two assessed that Kangwu didn't have a party with him, and he looked like a newbie who had come in for the first time after the level restriction had been lifted. The loud and outgoing Baek kang -yen got close to Kangwu and proposed to escort him back to the entrance safely. He remarked that Kangwu's comrade looked tired too, as he kidnapped peacefully dozed off against a tree. Kangwu insisted that the two of them could take care of themselves. Kangwu asked them to go by themselves as they were probably extremely busy. But the carefree Kang Yim continued to worry about the dangers of the gate for Kangwu. Shea Min Hai Yuk criticized Kang Yim for being such a busybody with strangers. The number one ranker continued to try to convince Kangwu to go with them, desperately trying to assure Kangwu that he wasn't a bad guy at all. In the background, Cha Min Hayuk was already masterfully harvesting magic stones from the corpses of the giant ogres, while Kangwu tried his best to turn down the offers of the persistent Kang Yun. Bet Kang Yun finally relented, and they ultimately went their separate ways. Before leaving, Cha Min Hayuk left Kangwu with a meaningful stare. Is this edgy emo boy looking for a fight? A few minutes later, Echidna slowly opened her tired eyes as Kangwu woke her up. They were outside the gate now. He wanted to take his adorable familiar shopping before it got any darker outside. 
Kan Wu reflected upon what a chaotic day it had been with everything that happened with Echidna and the two top rankers. He looked up the fastest way to get to the department store on his phone, and it led them to a dark and abandoned alleyway. Right from the get-go, Kang Wu already felt that something seemed to be off. Nothing good happens in dark alleyways in this manhwa. He just dismissed it as maybe there weren't many people around because they were close to a scary s rank gate. Kang Wu was focused on walking when Echidna suddenly called out to him. She ominously whispered to Kang Wu that she could smell blood coming from a distance as she pointed in the direction of the smell. She was sure that it was the scent of human blood. In a different time, we see a person who had successfully managed to infiltrate the demonic order by disguising himself as a believer. From what he had seen inside, he knew that the cult possessed a sense of cruelty far beyond their expectations. He managed to get a clip of valuable evidence, but radio waves prevented him from sending out any information. He strained himself trying to contact headquarters, but he felt like the order was on to him. And that's when he was caught. The beaten and bloodied spy desperately tried to flee as fast as he could. He thought about whether this was truly the end of the line for him, but he could not give up. With the evidence in his hands, he could not afford to stop no matter what. He vowed to get this memory card to Beck Huayan. He tripped and fell as his body started to give up on him. His spirits were still alive. He could not stop here. He needed one more step. He needed to get to the gate where the Huarang corpse were. That's when the Kang Wu and Echidna duo turned a corner, lit by the dragon's nose. The empty eyes of the spy stared at them, and with his final bit of energy, he handed Kang Wu the memory card. He just kept repeating the word please until he collapsed on the ground, cold and lifeless. Rest in peace, spy guy. Kang Wu tried to call out to the guy sprawled out on the ground with no response. He had absolutely no idea as to what was on this memory card. It's probably the only copy of GTA 6. Kang Wu remained still, wondering what in the world had just happened in this dark alley and what was on the memory card he held in his hand. He decided to find out by using the omniscient power of the Authority of Observation. He activated the spell throughout the body of the man lying on the ground. It turned out that this man had already reached his sixth awakening. He was a skilled player. Since only people who had reached their seventh awakening could normally enter the s rank gate, Kang Wu concluded that this man didn't come from the gate. The only clue he had to this bizarre development was the memory card handed to him. So, he immediately examined its contents after inserting it into his phone. The card contained a single video file with a suspicious file name. I have a very bad feeling about this file name, man. Kang Wu opened the clip, and it was like thunder struck him when he laid eyes on the video. Even the Demon King was left speechless by what he saw. Shivering with realization, Kang Wu realized it was something he knew all too well. It was corn. I knew something was up. Kang Wu couldn't believe that the man had given him this with such determination and spirit. He didn't even seem like the type to watch this kind of stuff. Kang Wu entertained the thought that he might be missing something. So, he decided to pay closer attention to the video, but it only flustered him even more. For the first time in 10,000 years, he found it enjoyable to watch something like this. At that moment, nothing else mattered to Kang Wu. Get this man out of that alleyway. However, he was interrupted by Echidna the dragon, pulling him back to reality. He calmed himself down, excusing himself by saying that he was just watching crucial evidence. Who's up watching some crucial evidence tonight? That's when something caught Kang Wu's attention from the depths of the dark alleyway. There was a group of demonic order cultists wearing black and red cloaks with menacing masks. They quickly took positions in front of Kang Wu and the lifeless spy. Kang Wu became even more confused as he had no idea who these figures were. One of the cultists, wearing a star-studded mask, angrily admonished Kang Wu for watching the contents of the memory card. Flustered, Kang Wu fumbled with his words. The masked figures in front of him could tell that he had just watched something he wasn't supposed to. The masked man sternly declared that since Kang Wu had seen the video, they couldn't let him live. The whole group started drawing their blades. Kang Wu contemplated whether watching adult videos was really such a grave sin. Kang Wu remained clueless and embarrassed as the cloaked group accused him of either feigning ignorance or not understanding the value of the clip. Finally regaining his composure, Kang Wu pocketed his phone. He didn't know what kind of situation he was in but he could tell that this group was trying to steal the clip back. A different side of Kang Wu emerged as he realized this group was trying to steal the first corn video he had watched in 10,000 years. He resolved to protect the clip no matter what happened. He couldn't let this group take it from him. Do it for the culture king. One masked figure scoffed at Kang Wu for finally showing his true colors. They decided that there was no need for further words at this point. Every single masked cultist charged at Kang Wu, their sharp blades drawn with the intent to kill. 
Kangu wasted no time and activated the authority of the Iron Wall on his upper body. He landed a punch, enhanced with the armor of the Iron Wall, on the chest of one cultist. But he wasn't done yet. He simultaneously activated the authority of speed, and swiftly moved past multiple opponents, ultimately kicking and planting one into the alleyway wall. The man with the star-studded mask, known as the Cardinal, ordered everyone to release their true power. The members were surprised by this command and hesitated to follow. The Cardinal warned every member that if they continued like this, they would all die at the hands of this unknown man. They might not know where Kangwoo came from, but they knew he was a true monster. Suddenly, Kangwoo sensed something extremely familiar. Echidna also sensed it from the cultists. It was demonic energy. Kangwoo finally connected the dots and realized that these masked figures were from the demonic order. They were emanating a chaotic form of demonic energy as they transformed their bodies into demons. Kangwoo knew their sanity was slipping and that there was no use in questioning them. Echidna offered her help, but Kangwoo reassured her not to worry. He knew he was the best man to deal with these demonic fools. Kangwoo activated his blade, and the deranged and strengthened group of masked cultists charged at him without fear. Kangwoo welcomed their charge with his blade ready. One member got close to Kangwoo but was met with a clean slash, splitting him in half. Because they possessed demonic regenerative abilities, Kangwoo knew he had to hit them with the appropriate amount of force. It's a battle of damage versus region. Another one fell to his blade with a masterful stab to the chest. As one more approached within striking distance, Kangwoo delivered a critical stab to their face. Two more masked madmen surrounded him with blinding speed, but his counterattacks were 100% accurate. He stabbed and twisted his blade inside every demonic foe. The masked figure known as the Cardinal washed in horror, as they couldn't seem to touch the mysterious man. The once fearless demonic figures started feeling scared and began running away from Kangwoo. Kangwoo slowly approached them like a deaf god incarnate. He playfully declared that it was too late to run now. His finger transformed into a demonic form, activating the Terra Blade. The flea in demonic order was slaughtered by a hail of blades coming from every direction within the dark and narrow alleyway. They screamed in agony and dread as they were wiped out. Effortlessly, Kangwoo coldly walked away from the bloody massacre. He once again turned his attention to the file. No matter how he looked at it, it was just an adult video. He had no clue as to why the demonic order was targeting it. How about giving the people the sauce? Once again engrossed in the video, Kangwoo wondered if it was worth it for the cultists. Suddenly, familiar voices could be heard from above. Chaeyeonju and Baek Hwayeon were hurrying toward Kangwoo's location. As Yeonju descended, Kangwoo immediately panicked, fearing she might have seen him watching the video clip. The classic panic. Yeonju landed and questioned what in the world Kangwoo was doing in this dark alley where the signal from the spy was coming from. Baek Hwayeon stood above, equally confused about Kangwoo's presence. Her confusion turned to fury as she saw the familiar figure of her agent sprawled out on the ground. She immediately asked Kang Wu if he happened to see a memory card containing a video clip there. Kang Wu promptly took out the memory card and presented it to the guild leader and the commander. Yanju demanded the card as it contains something important for them right now. Yanju emphasized the urgency, stating that she needed to use it immediately. What did she just say? Kang Wu, knowing what was inside the memory card, once again became flustered with Yanju's words. Kang Wu hesitated to give Yan Ju the memory card, but the guild leader continuously bugged him to hand it over. Eventually, Kang Wu relented and gave it to her, his cheeks visibly blushing. He's about to get caught in 4K. In his mind, he knew that Che Yan Ju wasn't merely discussing what he had just watched. He was certain there was more to it. Yan Ju finished preparing the card and turned toward Kang Wu. Unaware of the underlying situation, Yan Ju continued, stating that since things had turned out this way, she invited Kangwoo to watch it with her because it was something he would eventually need to know. At that moment, Kangwoo felt a sensation he hadn't experienced in his 10,000 years of life. Bro turned into a Jojo character. In his mind, regardless of the secret it held, the situation had become somewhat complicated. Oblivious to this, Yanju asked Wei-un about their agent's condition, only to receive confirmation of his passing. Wei-un closed the man's lifeless eyes and questioned Kangwoo about what had transpired. However, Kangwoo himself was uncertain about what had just happened. Recapping the events, Kangwoo remembered that as soon as he received the memory card, masked cultists from the demonic order started attacking him. Apart from that, his involvement in this incident had been nothing more than a coincidence. While Huiyun was about to invite Kangwoo to watch the video together, Yanju was already blushing in embarrassment, staring at her phone's screen. She screamed at Kangwoo for letting her watch the file, 
accusing him of switching the files. Kang Wu meekly responded that he had indeed given her the original card. Meanwhile, Beck Wei Yun calmly watched the clip and concluded that it was a fake video. The real content could only be revealed through video decryption of the headquarters. Yan Zhu was furious to be subjected to such a deceptive cover-up. Wei Yun explained that using such videos for cover-ups made sense and even the headquarters recommended this approach. They even use animal documentaries, but adult videos had the best effect. Finally understanding the situation, Kang Wu realized that the original video was connected to the Demonic Order, and Yan Zhu and Hui Yun were supposed to receive it. However, something had gone wrong. Yan Zhu directed her anger towards Kang Wu for not saying anything despite having watched it before her. He reasoned that Yan Zhu had been too eager to use the video right away. The tiny echidna jumped into action, stuttering in her words as she tried to save Kang Wu from Yan Zhu's bullying. She's a good dragon. Kang Wu introduced the angry echidna as his familiar, whom he had mentioned to Yan Zhu before. Yan Zhu couldn't help but notice that Kang Wu's familiar looked just like a kid. In her mind, Kang Wu's familiar should be a crazy looking beast that matched his style. Interrupting them, Hui Yun stated that they needed to check the video at the headquarters as soon as possible. So, they headed to the Suwan Station Huarang Court headquarters to decrypt the video. Hui Yun quickly took charge of her soldiers, receiving a rundown of the day's incidents, or rather, the lack thereof. She took the stage and announced that Agent Kang Dong Hoon had passed away in the line of duty, shocking the battalion. She swiftly followed up with an inspiring speech, ensuring that the agent's death had not been in vain. She efficiently delegated all the necessary tasks without any fuss. Kang Wu couldn't help but think that Beck Wei Yun was truly born to be a soldier. She ordered the decoding of the fake video and the preparation of an investigation room. The soldiers promptly followed her instructions. Additionally, she requested an immediate conversation with someone known as General Chang Yun Jae. Unfortunately, the general was currently on an overseas trip in Japan, investigating an SS rank gate. General Chang Yun Jae was Beck Hui Yun's superior and the highest authority in Hua Rang First Corps. It was said that he was so powerful that no one in the nation, apart from the number one Beck Kang Yun, could face him. Hui Yun believed that if the general were present, the agent's life might have been saved. With everything taken care of, they headed to the investigation room as Hui Yun dismissed her soldiers. The real video from the memory card was now being projected and watched by everyone in the investigation room. The cardinal could be seen approached by a cultist, Apparently, the preparations for the summoning were almost complete. If they acted quickly, they would finish within three weeks. The Cardinal was pleased with how smoothly things were going and asked if they had received any sponsorships this time. Imagine if they were sponsored by Burger King or something. The follower confirmed that a big guild had just provided them with B-rank sacrifices. He continued, saying that it wouldn't be long until their wishes were fulfilled. If they succeeded this time, the Order would surely reward them with something even greater. However, the Cardinal halted the members' elation, stating that this was merely the first step and slacking off the small accomplishments was forbidden. They still had a long way to go, and they couldn't achieve anything with such a mindset. This Cardinal needs to learn how to chill out. The member fell to his knees to apologize and vowed to correct his mistakes. They needed to remain silent until all the preparations were complete. There was nothing worse than letting unsubstantial words cloud their minds. With their business concluded, the Cardinal suddenly looked directly at the camera. He knew there was a rat in the room. That's where the real video clip on the memory card ended. Straight out of a horror movie. Kaimu was now certain that this crimson masked man was recruiting players for the Demonic Order. Being a cardinal, he was sure that there was more than one of them based on their operations. They also mentioned the summoning and a big guild. Kaimu deduced three things from the video. Firstly, there was undoubtedly someone with greater authority than the cardinal with the star-studded crimson mask. Secondly, they were preparing to summon something on Earth. And lastly, a big guild was sponsoring their operation. He voiced the necessity to investigate the big guilds immediately. Since they had caught the spy, they would do anything to remain under the radar and hide their plans for the summoning. Investigating the main order would be extremely difficult. Their only option was to find out which big guild was sponsoring them. The Red Rose Guild was exempt from this investigation, as they were leading it with the government. Hui Yun praised Kang Wu for his sharp wit, and Kang Wu was already starting to let it get to his head. However, investigating the big guilds would be challenging, as even the government would struggle to scrutinize these massive entities. Using force to investigate them would undoubtedly cause unnecessary friction. But Kang Wu knew there was a way. When asked what it was, Kang Wu simply answered that they could bait them. The classic gamer moves. Kang Wu suggested that the order targeted players with high ranks as offerings. Yanju interjected, mentioning that she had lost many rookies in her guild for that reason. 
Kang Wu promptly apologized for touching on a sensitive topic, but they continued. He proposed that the focus of the plan should be the rookies, players who were low-level but possessed high-ranked special abilities. Recently, there had been more chaos players, and missing person cases had also spiked. The plan was to start a rumor, a rumor that there was a talented player in a low-rank gate. They could even manipulate the rumor to say that the rookie was S-rank or higher, or they could use the name of the Red Rose Guild, claiming they were trying to recruit this promising player. The Order would be afraid of losing such a player and would act immediately. Wei Yim praised the idea but expressed concern that the Order might play it safe and not take the bait after being infiltrated by a spy. Kang Wu confidently stated that they would still move. When asked how he knew, he simply responded that it was because they were the Demonic Order. He knew all too well that these people couldn't control their hunger for power. Speaking from experience, he continued that the closer these people got to becoming a demon, the hungrier they became for power. There was no way they could resist temptation. And even if the order turned out to be cautious, they wouldn't be able to completely cover their tracks. Both Gui Yan and Yan Zhu became convinced by Kang Wu's plan, and the only question on their minds was who they would use as bait, as every promising rookie they knew was already quite famous or part of a big guild. Yanju protested that she wouldn't risk another one of her members for this. She had no intention of sending her guild members unless it was for direct battle. Kang Wu agreed, as they needed to preserve their combat power. Regarding the bait, Kang Wu already had someone in his twisted mind who was perfect for the role. Is he thinking about what we're thinking about? We see a familiar young man walking down the street in the middle of the night. When he arrives home, he finds his sickly mother lying on a floor bed in a tiny place. His eyes shone with a mixture of hate and determination. It was Kim Si Hoon. Ain't no way he's using the hero as bait. The morning sun lights up a small room where Kim Si Hoon's sickly mother lies down and rests. Si Vum has been diligently checking in and taking care of his sick mother whenever he can. Outside of this tiny place, a voice can be heard from a distance. It was Kang Wu, sneaking around from the top of a different house, spying with his telescope. The fully committed spy, Kang Wu, couldn't help but be touched by what he's seeing. He has followed and observed Kim Si Hoon nursing his sick mother every night. He's convinced that this guy should really be the main character. He's just the perfect hero for real. Their plan has been going better than expected. The videos they've been spreading have garnered massive amounts of attention. It's been a week since they started the bait plan, and the rumors about Kim Si Hoon have been spreading like wildfire. It's not an immediate attention grabber, but it's gaining traction at a decent speed. Even people on the street are spreading it through word of mouth. The only one on their side who can manipulate the public to this extent is none other than the guy he has seen in the Red Rose Guild before, the team leader of the personnel management team, the Sly Park Yunwu. This guy is the one controlling your TikTok page. Baek Huyen is too straightforward and Cha Yan Ju would just give orders. Park Yunwu is the brains of the operation. Suddenly, Kim Si Hoon got out of the house and started moving. It's time for Kang Wu to get moving alongside him too. At the Mok Dong C rank gate, Kang Wu's rookie party has enthusiastically gathered around to prepare for their hunt. Among the bustling player crowd, a suspicious figure wearing a heavy helmet can be seen lurking around. That's a Dark Souls armor. Sola seemed to be down in the dumps, worrying the whole party. It turns out that Kang Wu hasn't come home in over a week. They've been in contact with each other, texting and calling, but he always seems to be out somewhere doing God knows what. The party tried to cheer up their healer. They know that if it's Kang Wu, he must have his reasons for this absence. Since it's been a week, he might be coming home soon. Sola worries that he might just be sick of the food she cooks for him. The gloomy Sola tried to rack her brain if that was the reason Kang Wu doesn't want to go home anymore. She even seriously entertained the idea that maybe he's found another girl. Yoon Bi reassured her that cannot be the case. If anything, it might be the opposite reason. She continued that Kang Wu is in the prime of his youth. Perhaps he finds it hard to suppress himself when he's under the same roof as the beautiful Sola. Stephen stepped up and intervened in the conversation before it gets any wilder. He explained that unlike them, Kang Wu is a high-ranking player, and he has his reasons. He reassured Sola that he understands her anxiety, but the only thing they can do right now is to train harder and become stronger so they can join Kang Wu. This sentiment lifted Sola's spirits once again as she steals herself to do her best in leveling up. With newfound determination, the party headed into the C rank gate. The suspicious figure wearing the heavy helmet was revealed to be Kang Wu himself. He looks at his party that's already clearing C rank gates. Everyone has already had their third awakenings. Though it isn't quite up to his standards, it's still a magnificent pace. With a pained expression, he lamented not seeing Solo for a whole week now. It can't be helped because of his work. 
But to see her down in the dumps hurts his heart. And it's not just Sola. Echidna has also been staying in the apartment, being taken care of by Sola's mother. She's having an even harder time as she's dependent on Kangwoo. Go home to your kid, bro. He hasn't been eating or sleeping properly. All he wants is for this mission to be over. Inside the gate, a menacing troll is brandishing its club towards a massive shield. The shield-bearing Taesu tanked the club's swing effectively. The troll might be ridiculously strong, but all he must do is fulfill his role. He lifted his shield and struck down on the ground. A quake was generated that staggered the troll on its feet. Sivim took his opportunity to charge in and do his thing. Sala casted a perfectly timed boost of the charging swordsman as Sihun activated his spell. The phantom of a ferocious blue dragon manifested in his blade as he cut down the staggered troll. This was his hidden dragon sword technique chapter 2, the flying dragon strike one. This guy has the bible of dragon sword techniques. The troll survived but was heavily wounded as it tried to grab Sihun with its last ounce of life. That's when Yunbi swiftly finished the job with a vicious lightning spear spell. The troll let out its death roar as it fell completely lifeless. They gathered around the troll's corpse to make sure it was eliminated. Yunbi cautiously warned the party that they can never let their guards down, even if they're only fighting a single monster. Back when they were hunting lizardmen, they could take on five at a time with no problem at all. But when it comes to trolls, they're already in immense danger when they encounter a group of three. They can't believe that Kangwoo hunts these monsters by himself. Sometimes we forget that Kangwoo is just built different. Sivam reminded them that it's only been a month since they started, and they've already come a long way. Taesu praised Sihun for being the linchpin of their progress. He had no idea that this young man would become such an important cornerstone for their party. Yunbi even remarked that he looks like a shaman protagonist. With that, they collected the monster's magic stone and started moving once again. They even harvested the troll's blood to sell his recovery potion ingredients. Kamu was spying on the party from a distance all along. He watched them hunt like a proud father as they have come a long way since last time. Thanks to his instructions, their movements became more precise, and their plays were flawless. The party members can now recognize their roles and move accordingly. Taesu effectively tanks and dishes out crowd control. Sikum is a ferocious damage dealer as always. Sola not only heals effectively but also buffs when necessary, and Yunbi is an efficient assistant damage dealer and protector. Kangwu thinks that he doesn't even need to help them nowadays. The party even caught on to the rumors that Sivam has been becoming quite a celebrity recently. Kangwu stood up as he knows that the plan's about to start any time now. It's already been a whole week. He doesn't believe that the order will leave Sivam alone like this. But Kangwu was also starting to doubt that maybe they're too cautious to make a move. But deep in his heart, he knows the greed from his time at the depths of hell. They would not be able to resist this bait that Kangwu has been nurturing. With that in mind, he decided to look for them himself. He activated the authority of observation throughout the whole desert. He has a gut feeling that the order is coming. That's when he scouted two players plowing through hordes of trolls like nothing. Their levels are high enough to instantly slay trolls. And yet they're not even collecting magic stones. The nail in the coffin is that they're heading in Sikum's direction. Kangwu rejoices finally, they have taken the bait. Time to reel in his week-long fishing trip. Another hapless troll succumbed to the relentless onslaught of the party. Taesu showered Sihum with praise for successfully completing the task without Yunbi's assistance this time. In a playful banter, Yunbi jokingly speculated that she might lose her job at this rate. Amid their high spirits, Sihum's attention was drawn to something as he urgently warned Sola about a troll lurking just a few meters behind her. Swiftly assuming battle formation, they braced themselves as the troll charged toward them. However, their attack strategy was abruptly interrupted when the troll was swiftly cleaved in half before their eyes. Suddenly, an arrogant voice pierced through the air, and Sihun recognized it all too well. It belonged to Kim Younghoon, accompanied by his imposing bodyguard. The party instantly recognized the man before them as the Vice Guild leader of the esteemed Mir Guild, one of the top five guilds in the nation. He was none other than the privileged son of Kim Jaehyun, the owner of Mir Electronics, a man who had been born with the shiniest silver spoon in South Korea. As a player, Kim Younghoon possessed average talent unlike his father who was a top ranker. However, leveraging his father's wealth and influence, he managed to surpass others. He's a pay-to-win whale in a free-to-play game. When Sihun inquired about the reason for Young Hoon's presence, his brother casually replied that he was there for hunting. The tension between them was palpable, and the party could sense the malevolence lingering in their words. To the party's astonishment, Young Hoon revealed that they were, in fact, brothers. Yet, he couldn't help but wear a smug grin as he emphasized that their brotherhood was far from ordinary. 
given Sihun's supposedly cheap bloodline. Sihun's anger surged, prompting him to draw his sword and curse his repulsive brother. Young Hoon goaded him, encouraging him to strike if he dared. Young Hoon mentioned the rumors surrounding Sihun's recent awakening and supposed S rank ability. He expressed surprise at his brother's unexpected rise in rank. When Sihun questioned his brother's connection to the rumor, the answer he received was horrifying. Yang Hoon revealed his intention to use Sihun as a sacrificial offering, along with the rest of the party, who he deemed to be decent. He reveled in the fact that he had stumbled upon a gold mine of sacrifices. The party was unsettled as they pieced together the puzzle. Yang Hoon was a chaos player. Taesu immediately urged Sola to position herself behind him, and she quickly complied. Yang Hoon fixated his gaze on the beautiful Sola, asserting that she wouldn't be used as an offering. As he licked his lips, his mind filled with other sinister plans. This man needs to be locked up or sent to hell. His final provocation pushed Sihun to the edge, and he unsheathed his sword to confront his detestable brother. However, Yum Hoon effortlessly squatted him away with his own blade, as if it were child's play. Sihun recoiled, suspicious of the impossibility of Yum Hoon's counterattack at such close range despite the level gap between them. Instructing his bodyguard to stand down, Yum Hoon activated the absolute defensive mode. He charged at his brother like a wild hyena laughing and taunting Sihun for his earlier overconfidence. Now, raining down blows, Yang Hoon forced Sihun into retreat, goading him to attack once more. It was in that moment that Sihun successfully parried a single strike and wasted no time launching a counterattack. With a swift slash, Sihun's blade descended, but to his astonishment. Yang Hoon once again countered at unimaginable speed in such close proximity. Yang Hoon struck Sihun with a powerful kick to the stomach sending him hurtling toward the rocky terrain of the desert. Through this exchange, Sihun finally comprehended the truth. The sword technique was not Yang Hoon's doing, it was the sword itself, moving him instead of the other way around. He's so rich that he has literal cheat codes turned on. Kim Yang Hoon's special equipment, the absolute defensive system, was a technological marvel incorporating all the expertise and resources of mere electronics. It detected opponents' movements and automatically defended its user. This dude got AI installed in his equipment. Yang Hoon continued his berating, asserting that vermin should behave as such, and he wanted Si Hoon to crawl on the ground. Raising his sword, he prepared to incapacitate his wounded brother. However, his strike was intercepted by Taesu's trusty shield, as the dependable tank swiftly came to Si Hoon's aid. Yang Hoon scorned the trembling Taesu for daring to face him with inferior equipment. Unaware of the true relationship between the two brothers, Taesu vowed that as long as he was alive and breathing, Yang Hoon wouldn't have free reign to do as he pleased. Bolstered by his determination, Taesu charged forward with his shield, forcefully bulldozing Young Hoon in front of him. Pushing himself to his physical limits, he soon realized that there was no response from his opponent. Young Hoon arrogantly questioned Taesu's actions while an impenetrable shield enveloped his entire body. He belittled Taesu for confronting him with such inferior equipment. Taesu was no match against the shield from Young Hoon's absolute defense suit type ability. In response to Taesu's charge, Young Hoon activated another ability of his suit. Demonic energy surged forth, causing a brilliant light to scatter in every direction as the ironclad giant was sent hurtling into the air. Yang Hoon remarked that he would have dealt with Su eventually, had he not interfered while he was dealing with his little brother. As he voiced his sentiment, Yang Hoon's gaze shifted forward, and he was taken aback by what he saw. Sihun was already preparing his next strike, gathering unique energy into his blade while Sola devoted herself to buffing Sihun with all her might. Finally, the hero unleashed his ability, the Hidden Dragon Sword Technique Chapter 5, Advent of the Wind Dragon. A resplendent phantom of a divine beast materialized within the strike as Sihun poured every ounce of his being into it. Prepare to tank a literal dragon, rich boy. As the Wind Dragon's advent was released by Sihun, his brother couldn't help but feel a sense of impending dread. Young Boon swiftly raised his sword, activating the absolute defensive system. The clash of unstoppable offense and absolute defense was a sight to behold. With a heroic surge of strength, the young man unleashed a powerful slash, while his older brother fought with all his might to defend against the formidable strike. In a sudden turn of events, Sihun managed to slip through the impenetrable absolute defensive system. Panic washed over Young Hoon's formerly arrogant face. With all his remaining strength, Sihun brought down his sword, gasping for breath, struggling to hold his blade upright. Sihun's attack left Young Hoon unscathed. He had activated his absolute defensive suit just in time, nullifying his brother's all-out slash. Mocking Sihun for having inferior blood, 
Young Hu kicked the unconscious Tae Su lying motionless beside him. Despite the circumstances, he begrudgingly admired his brother's unwavering determination. Memories flooded Young Hu's mind of their days in school, where Si Hoon excelled academically, athletically, and in every physical aspect. No matter how much effort Young Hoon exerted, he could never catch up to his brother's abilities. This dude lived on the shadow of his younger brother. He clearly didn't win the genetic lottery. Now, even as a player, Si Hoon surpassed him with regards to raw talent. Lifting his sword, Young Hoon tried to convince himself that these things didn't truly matter. Pointing his blade at his brother, he declared that as long as he possessed enough power and wealth to control others, Si Hoon's talent meant nothing. He could always trample him. No need to get stronger if you can always make it rain. With that resolve, Young Hoon activated one of his system's abilities. The replication process commenced, completing the copy of Si Hoon's Hidden Dragon Sword Technique Chapter 5, The Advent of the Wind Dragon. A manic laugh escaped his lips as he charged at his brother, intending to kill him with Si Hoon's own skill. Oh no, his AI did not pass the plagiarism check at all. Exhausted, Si Hoon raised his blade defensively, realizing he couldn't withstand this type of attack in his current state. The sheer force of the imitated ability sent him flying, crashing against the rocky terrain with a resounding impact. Concerned party members urgently called out to their swordsmen, while Young Hoon reveled in the damage he had inflicted. Young Hoon gloated, asserting that this was Si Hoon's limit, the difference in power between them. Saul rushed to assist the unconscious Si Hoon, casting a healing spell. Yubi joined the fray, preparing a lightning spell in case Young Hoon attacked again. The lightning spear descended, but it failed to crack Young Hoon's seemingly impenetrable bubble shield from the absolute defensive system. He delighted in seeing his brother lying unconscious amidst the debris. He firmly believed that regardless of Si Hoon's struggles and efforts, certain things in the world could never be surpassed. This man is too confident with his money. In this dire situation, Sola couldn't fully heal Si Hoon, so she provided him with first aid instead. Urging him to rise quickly, she offered support to Yoon Bi. Si Hoon's mind raced with thoughts. Though he had managed to survive, he felt utterly drained, wondering if this was truly the end for him. Yoon Bi and Sola continued their futile attempts to deter the impervious Young Hoon. While Si Hoon pondered his near death experience, he vowed to avenge the scoundrels who had abandoned him and his mother, but now he couldn't even protect the people who had become precious to him, let alone pursue his revenge. He blamed himself for being too weak, lacking power time and time again. Then something awakened within him, a voice asking if he desired strength. Get that power up, son. From a distance, a hooded figure observed the ongoing battle. Kang Wu himself. He had spotted the party's opponent, confirming that this was the person Sung Su of the Mir Guild had told him about. The guild associated with the demonic order was, indeed, the Mir Guild. His week-long mission was finally unfolding. Kang Wu hadn't expected Si Hoon and Young Hoon to be related, let alone brothers. However, he did recall their striking resemblance. He could hardly believe that his subordinate was the son of a concubine of the Mir Guild leader. MCs always have an interesting background. Having just finished contacting the necessary people for his plan, Kang Wu prepared to take action. However, he was taken aback by the unfolding scene on the battlefield. Steve Hoon emanated a mysterious energy, as he fervently shouted his desire for strength to defeat his enemies. Raising his sword high, a colossal phantom dragon materialized behind him. This was the strength to protect those dear to him. Kang Wu was dumbfounded witnessing this development, reading the notifications about his subordinate's power up. Kim Si Hoon had embraced the power of the Heavenly God, acquiring a significant boost in response to the dire circumstances. This only strengthened Kang Wu's conviction his subordinate should just become the main character of this story. Your marked subordinate is upstaging you, bro. Empowered, Si Hoon charged at his brother with unwavering might with a massive dragon phantom emerging behind him. Young Hoon struggled to defend himself, unable to withstand his brother's relentless and ferocious attacks. It was as if Sivum was a rampaging dragon himself, losing all control, and driven solely by the desire to annihilate his opponent. His strikes were so powerful, that they both soared into the sky from the sheer impact alone. Yam Hoon refused to believe that his supposedly lower-level brother could overpower him with such fervor and intensity. Sivum's blade managed to penetrate through Yam Hoon's once impenetrable defense, causing blood to splatter from his shoulder. For the first time in this battle, genuine dread gripped him. Rich Boy got rattled as soon as he sees first blood. His cherished absolute defensive system had unexpectedly been breached. Clinging to disbelief, he activated the Hidden Dragon Sword Technique Chapter 5, Advent of the Wind Dragon once more. 
Sivan responded promptly with his newly acquired ability, the Cloud Dragon Sword Technique Chapter 3, Cloud Dragon's Rampant Dance. He became a dragon incarnate as he ceaselessly attacked his brother. The clash of replicated and newly acquired skills reverberated. Sivan's relentless assault began to slowly overwhelm his brother. Yumhun gradually realized he was being pushed to the back foo with each exchange of blows. While he possessed superior strength and speed on paper, he couldn't keep up with the unstoppable and lightning-fast onslaught. As another critical strike nearly decided the battle, he contemplated his options. Another wound opened on his other shoulder as his sword strike pierced through his supposed absolute defense once again. You must change the name of your equipment at this point, bro. Realizing his injuries were mounting rapidly, Young Hoon knew he had to create distance from the rampaging hero. Sensing his brother's vulnerability, Sivan aimed to finish the job then and there. A fatal slash came dangerously close to Young Hoon's face as he failed to activate his defenses in time. For a moment, he accepted his impending defeat. But to his surprise, his imposing bodyguard intervened, wielding a massive mechanical axe to block Sihun's seemingly final strike. Tag teams in a one versus one? That's a violation. With a powerful counterattack, the bodyguard sent Sihun hurtling away. Instead of showing gratitude, Yum Hoon reprimanded his loyal protector, Chun Myung Ho, for not intervening sooner. Sihun suffered a critical hit, sustaining a severe internal injury. Overexerting himself with his newfound power earlier had taken its toll. As he gazed at the towering figure of Chun Myung Ho, he contemplated whether he could stand up to him. Approaching with confidence, Myung Ho coerced Si Hoon into admitting that he would never surpass the Vice Guild Master. He issued a threat that if Si Hoon followed them, without resistance, the situation would end with him losing only one arm. Kang Wu will probably give you his middle finger for threatening his subordinate's arm. Steven responded with hostility to such a ridiculous threat, but it only resulted in another heavy strike to his chest. Myung Ho pummeled the young man with his mechanical axe, exerting all his weight and force, savagely bringing Sihun to the ground. The loyal guard's goal was to make him submit and admit his inferiority to the Vice Guild Master. That's Employee of the Month material right there. Sihun endured the beating as his body began to give up on him. He had no strength left in his battered and bruised frame. Lying motionless on the floor, he felt the imposing guard raise his mechanical axe once more. The guard declared that the weak only have the right to suffer. Hearing these words, Sivum's past flashed in his mind. He had denied this truth for far too long. He thought back to the night when his mother apologized for giving birth to him. Tears streaming down her face outside the luxurious home of the mere patriarch. Even as a young child, he never wanted to see his beloved mother humiliate herself like that. Instead, he wished to express his gratitude. We're submitting the Mir Guild Leader for the Worst Dad Award category. But ultimately, he couldn't defy his fate. Tears welled up in his eyes as he accepted his destiny of defeat. All he could do was apologize to everyone for dragging them into his mess and for failing to protect them, just as his mother had done on that miserable night. The rest of the party also struggled to hold on. Taesu remained unconscious while Sola desperately tried to heal him. Yunbi had run out of mana and couldn't land a single attack on the enemies. Just as Myung Ho raised his axe to end the battle, and as Si Hoon resigned himself to his fate, a familiar carefree voice echoed across the battlefield. Let him cook, just let him cook. Kang Wu emerged, wielding his blade, effortlessly blocking and chipping away at Myung Ho's mechanical axe. He echoed Myung Ho's earlier sentiment, acknowledging that the weak have the right to suffer. Kang Wu agreed with this sentiment, wholeheartedly. Parrying the giant axe, he responded with a wide swing kick sending the guard flying like a ragdoll. He proclaimed that from now on, he would allow them to experience their rights to the fullest. Kang Wu was a big supporter of inhumane rights. The hero on the brink of losing consciousness couldn't help but wonder how Kang Wu had arrived at that exact moment. Aware that he couldn't reveal the truth about monitoring the situation until the demonic order attempted to capture him, Kang Wu coolly replied that he would explain later. Immediately, he ordered the entire party to take the injured members to safety and provide treatment. The loyal guard, now back on his feet, questioned Kang Wu if he was with the Huarang course. Kang Wu casually retorted that he wouldn't have come alone if he were from the Huarang course. Growing tired of the small talk, Kang Wu gestured for the guard to cease his chatter and engage in battle. Myung Ho, once indifferent, was incensed by Kang Wu's disregard for him. He activated the energy surrounding his mechanical axe, striking towards Kang Wu calling out his arrogance. However, Kang Wu's response was brief. The guard couldn't believe his eyes at what he witnessed. Kang Wu smiled brightly as he gripped the blade of the formidable axe with such force that it crumpled like paper. He repeated that the only right the weak have is to suffer. 
The giant exerted all of his strength on the axe, but he couldn't budge Kan Wu's hand an inch. He could only wonder who this devilishly powerful figure before him truly was. Yam Hoon emerged from behind a rock, no longer hiding. He ordered his loyal subordinate to activate the demonic energy. Hesitant for a moment, the guard realized that he might truly die in this battle if he didn't give it his all. The bratty vice guild leader made it clear that this was an absolute order. He dropped his axe, accepting the command with a calm expression, displaying his loyalty as a subordinate. Respect to the loyalty, you just got unlucky with the wrong boss brother. Demonic energy poured out of his massive body. Kang Wu found amusement witnessing the guard's transformation into something grotesque. With two horns, sharp teeth, and flesh wings, the guard fully embraced his demonic form. Yum Hoon, twisted in his desires, laughed as winning became the only thing that mattered to him. He ordered the demonic Myung Ho to kill the man interfering with his plan, believing that he would always come out on top. Kang Wu recognized that the hideous creature before him resembled a demon more than anyone else he had seen transform. Activating the authority of Iron Wall concentrated in his fist, he added the authority of Thousand, releasing a concentrated accumulation of power with his armored punch to the mutilated monster's stomach. A single strike caved in and disrupted the insides of the demonic Myon Ho. The bratty vice guild leader watched the strike in horror, trembling and paling. The man before him seemed more like a demon than his own transformed subordinate lying lifeless on the ground. Another one-punch elimination. He's coming for Saitama's title. He couldn't help but think that Kamu might be a ranker. Fear consumed him, urging him to run away from such a terrifying opponent. He knew he needed to contact his father. Desperately running, his mind focused on one thing only. He retrieved a glowing communication orb and immediately contacted the Mier guild leader. He's trying to get bailed out by daddy once again. But the demon king was already upon him. Fear gripped him as the man effortlessly appeared behind him. Kang Wu forcefully pushed the pathetic young master to the ground, his face meeting the dirt. He swiftly stomped on the young master's head as the brat started to ask who he was. Kang Wu was tired of people asking that question every single time. Maybe you should wear a name tag from now on, bro. He questioned if this was what they taught in the demonic order. Calling out to the communication orb in Young Hoon's hand, Kang Wu knew the young master was contacting his father, Kim Jae Hyun. In that moment, as the brat stumbled over his words, trying to escape the situation, Kang Wu grimly reassured him that it was all right. He could contact his father as much as he wanted. In his dark office, the powerful Kim Jae Hyun accepted the call from the communication orb. He was met with an unfamiliar and upbeat voice asking if he was the guardian of Kim Young Hoon when he inquired about the identity of the person on the other end. Kang Wu simply responded that he was the one holding his son hostage. Desperate pleas from his son could be heard in the background of the call. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, anger surged within him. Kang Wu continued to taunt the guild master while holding Young Hoon with the chains from the authority of restraint. He warned the guild master that his son's condition was dire. When asked for his demands, he replied that if the guild leader wanted to save his scoundrel of a son, he would have to come to the Mokdong C-rank gate immediately. He just wants to get some face-to-face -face time. The leader asked if he had to come alone. Kang Wu laughed hysterically at the question. He knew people like the guild leader wouldn't come alone even if he demanded it. So, he urged him to stop plotting foolish schemes and come well prepared. The guild leader couldn't help but think that the man he was speaking to was insane. Kang Wu retorted that he was trying to be considerate, so the guild leader could come at him however he wanted. In a fit of anger, the guild leader warned Kang Wu that he better not think he would survive after pulling such a stunt, especially as a man affiliated with a group cooperating with the government. He boasted that he was the untouchable Kim Jae Hyun. Name dropping yourself is so cringe, bro. Kang Wu responded that he had no ties to the government at all. When an increasingly furious Jae Hyun asked if Kang Wu was alone, he jokingly replied that he was currently single. Jae Yoon had reached his limit with Kang Wu's taunting as he stood up in anger. It seemed like this guy had no idea who he was and how powerful he was, daring to pull off a stunt like this. Kang Wu ridiculed the guild leader, mocking him for not meaning to know any of that. He turned the question around, asking Jae Yoon if he knew who he was. He taunted that if Jae Yoon didn't know who he was dealing with, then he needed a sense of reality beaten into him. Kang Wu cracked the communication orb by forcefully smashing it against the once arrogant Yum Hoon. The beaten and bloody young master couldn't help but cry at the misfortune that had befallen him. On the other end of the line, the livid guild leader had grown tired of Kang Wu's provocations. Kang Wu promptly gave him a 20-minute ultimatum to show up, warning him that if he failed to do so, he would leave it up to his imagination what consequences awaited him and his son. 
Unaware of Kangwu's identity or his motives, the guild leader was past the point of being swayed by ransom attempts or disturbances. He sternly cautioned Kangwu that it was too late for him. His imposing energy, coupled with his fury, permeated the air as he threatened to find and mercilessly eliminate Kangwu. Smugly, Kangwu wished him luck with his pursuit and abruptly ended the call by smashing Yeon Hoon's face, causing the communication orb to shatter completely. That's a brutal way to hang up the phone, man. With Kim Jae Yoon's side dealt with, Kangwu could now move on to the next stage of his plan. The shivering and sniveling vice guild master pleaded with Kangwu to save him, promising to request any amount of money from his father on Kangwu's behalf. Kangwu disregarded the pathetic plea and dismissed the vice guild master. While he appreciated money, it wasn't what he wanted at that moment. When pressed about his true desires, Kangwu responded sincerely, expressing his wish for peace and prosperity for Earth and his beloved Kimchi Stu. Yum Hoon. Frustrated with Kangwu's answer, demanded to know his true intentions. Kangwu grew tired of Young Hoon's continuous bickering and stated that he needed to prepare for a meeting with his father. This statement sparked a glimmer of hope in his mind. Regardless of Kangwu's motives, he believed that everything would be fine once he saw his father. Activating his demonic energy, Kangwu expressed his delight at the father's love for his son. He unleashed the authority of fear, summoning the horrifying phantom from nightmares once again. He reveled in the ease with which he could manipulate people who loved others. Moments later, Kangwu, accompanied by Young Hoon and his party members, finally exited the gate, as he warned Tae Su and the rest of the team not to push too hard. The frantic Chai Yan Ju made her appearance. Yan Ju, along with Baek Huyen, had been searching for Kangwu after he contacted her. They had gathered all the troops they could muster, and Kangwu nonchalantly laughed off their concern, explaining that he needed to prepare some things. Kangwu's party was surprised to see that Chai Yanju, the guild leader of the Red Rose, and Baek Weiyun of the Huarang Corps were addressing Kangwu in such a casual manner. Kangwu explained that their relationship was not exactly favorable when asked how he knew these two influential figures. Kangwu's just clouded like that. Yanju stepped forward and inquired about the people surrounding Kangwu. Sola introduced herself politely, and Yanju scrutinized her from head to toe, feeling slightly annoyed by the innocent girl. She's jelly jealous. Yanju asked about Sola's relationship with Kangwu, and Sola turned the question back on her, questioning why Yanju was speaking to Kangwu as if they were close. Kangwu intervened, diffusing the tension and reminding everyone that introductions could wait as they had more pressing matters at hand. He instructed his party to find a safe place for the time being, and they complied, leaving Sola feeling somewhat left out. Baek Huyen joined the conversation and inquired about the bait. She referred to the object Kangwu had been driving on the ground. Kangwu confirmed that it was indeed the vice guild leader, Yun Hoon, whom he was using as leverage. Kangwu lifted the bloodied and beaten Yun Hoon, stating that he was more or less alive. Everyone in the delegation found it hard to believe that the haughty Kim Yun Hoon had been taken hostage. The Mier guild leader would not sit idly by. Yanju sighed, resigning herself to Kangwu's plan. She knew that confronting the powerful guild leader of Mier head on was inevitable. However, she hadn't expected it to happen at that very moment. With little time to gather their forces, facing the powerhouse with their limited numbers would be challenging. Hui and questioned whether they were acting too hastily, but Kang Wu reassured her confidently. For him, there was no one easier to defeat than someone who charges forward blindly, driven by their loss of rationality. He guaranteed their success, emphasizing the infinite love a father has for his son. Yanju argued that Kim Jae-yoon wouldn't lose his rationality even if his son was held hostage before him. Doubts about the plan started to emerge. Kang Wu simply urged them to wait and see. Suddenly, a fleet of luxurious vehicles arrived at the scene. The small number of troops Yanju and Huiyan had mustered prepared themselves for the imminent clash. Kim Jae-yoon stepped out of his car, realizing that Yanju and Huiyan were behind the plan. He mocked them for daring to face him with such a small force and questioned whether they believed they would end well after pulling off this hostage stunt. Releasing his immense energy, Jae Yoon exerted pressure on everyone present and demanded to know who he had been speaking to earlier. Kang Woo responded casually, catching the guild leader's attention. He waved in the formidable old man, commenting that he looked even better in person. The fury within Jae Yoon could no longer be contained. As he prepared to launch into a speech, Kang Wu tossed the battered son to his father, taunting them and stating that there was no need to thank him. Did he just give the hostage up from the get-go? The guards swiftly caught their young master as Jae Yoon grew increasingly bewildered by this unexpected turn of events. Even Yan Ju and Hui found themselves confused as Kang Wu had just returned their only advantage in this situation. 
Kang would reassure them that there was nothing wrong aside from a few injuries and that he hadn't attached anything dubious. Jae Yoon couldn't help but feel that this was all part of a larger scheme. Kang Woo assured him that he simply wanted the father and son to reunite since Jae Yoon had probably been worried sick. He urged the skeptical Jae Yoon to greet his son, who was likely very concerned about him. As soon as the father called out to his son before him, a sinister smile appeared on Kang Woo's face. Jae Yoon hastily tried to ascertain if his son was alright, but he quickly realized that something had gone horribly wrong. He shook his son, imploring him to say something, anything at all. His beloved son, whom he cherished above all else, looked at him with horror-stricken eyes and asked who he was. Completely clueless and terrified, Jae Yoon's world seemed to crumble as he heard his son ask who he was. The pieces started to come together, and he began to comprehend the ordeal his son had endured. Did Kang would just scare him so bad that he contracted amnesia? He held Young Hoon tightly, trying to remind him that he was his father. Young Hoon struggled to break free from Jae Yoon's grasp, still confused about the identity of the man insisting he was his father. Panic stricken, he pleaded to be released by the guards. Kang Wu watched with delight as his plan unfolded, wearing his signature demonic smile. Jae Yoon finally snapped, consumed by rage as he cursed Kang Wu contemptuously. He gathered energy throughout his entire body, disregarding the guild members around him. While Kang Wu stood unperturbed as if nothing impressive was happening, Yanju took charge, ordering everyone to step back, especially Kang Wu. Jae Yoon's wrath reached its peak as the members of Mier tried their best to calm their leader down. He couldn't accept what Kang Wu had done to his precious son. In a split second, he rushed forward without regard for anything. Yanju swiftly activated her own power, preparing for the clash with another ranker. She equipped an intricate arm brace as she tracked Jae Yoon's lightning fast movements. She took the initiative and charged forward, matching the speed of the other guild leader. Jae Yoon immediately activated his ninth awakening special ability, his S rank steel fortification. Yanju confronted this unstoppable force with an ability of her own, wielding her legendary armament, the Bloodthirsty Chain. The two guild leaders of the top ranked guilds in the nation engaged in an all out battle, utilizing their strongest cards right from the start. The clash between the two formidable titans ignited, as Yanju wielded her blood red legendary chains and Jae Yoon emanated pure strength energy. His golden aura erupted while he vehemently demanded her removal from his path. An explosion ensued when fist and chains collided. Instantly, most of her chains were obliterated, yet she remained unscathed, preparing a counterattack from below. With unwavering determination in her eyes, the chain seemed infinite, swiftly ensnaring Jae Yoon's imposing frame mid attack. The Mir guild leader found himself bound by the legendary chains, his rampage halted. This further enraged Jae Yoon, already furious. He strained every muscle, using raw strength to break free from the blood red chains, even at the cost of self injury. His struggle proved effective as he shattered the bindings, seemingly unfazed by the challenge. This man is too angry for crowd control. Yanju began to panic, realizing how effortlessly he escaped her shackles. Jae Yoon forcefully activated yet another destructive ability, Despair, attempting to strike Yanju. However, his blows only met the earth as Yanju expertly evaded, leaving devastation in their wake. Loading up for another assault while Yanju hovered amidst the debris, Jae Yoon thirsted to forcefully remove her from his path. Fortunately, the valiant Huayan came to her rescue, charging at Jae Yoon in the blink of an eye with her sword poised for a powerful strike. Her eyes exuded the aura of a battle goddess as she unleashed her whirlwind. A wide and mighty swing twisted the air, enveloping Jae Yoon in a stormy spell. As the whirlwind cleared, he emerged with his once fancy clothes torn, bearing visible wind-inflicted cuts all over his body. Jae Yoon appeared as someone who had lost control of the battle, his anger further stoked by the sight of two powerful women teaming up to impede his progress toward Kang Wu. The Demon King silently stood in the background wearing a taunting smile aimed at the Mir guild leader. Jae Yoon's energy soared to new heights as his golden aura pierced the sky. Abandoning all techniques, he relied solely on sheer strength, raising his arms for a brutal strike. As his energy struck the ground, the forceful shockwave sent Huayun tumbling from her position. He followed through and exerted his energy to the limit, propelling her helplessly through the air. Seizing the opportunity created by his destructive force, he charged forward, targeting Yanju. She readied her legendary chains for round two. Jae Yoon had long lost his patience. His sole desire was to mow down anyone standing in his way to reach his target. Yanju pushed her powers to the utmost limit, activating the chain spear. Countless sharp spears materialized, 
piercing the raging Jae Yoon. The mystical spears tore through his flesh, momentarily halting his rampage. Yet, the wild, golden energy within Jae Yoon proved too erratic to be completely subdued. He endured the strikes and retaliated, sending Yanju flying as the legendary chains dematerialized. This old timer has the best bruiser build in the game. Yanju was taken aback by the man's sheer brute force, charging through her defenses with no tricks or abilities. However, she refused to let this be the end of their exchange, summoning another batch of blood red chains. Landing behind the formidable figure of the Mier Guild leader, her chains swiftly entwined him, chain spears anchoring through his flesh to reinforce the binding this time. She exerted every ounce of her strength to resist Jae Yoon's primal force as he attempted to drag her and her chains along in his charge. Yanju remained determined and optimistic, recognizing that despite Kim Jae Yoon's immense power, he was still just a rancor like her. She knew she had to continue inflicting damage. Yanju understood that the damage she had inflicted so far would not be easily shrugged off by this man. However, the furious old man regarded these chains as mere petty tricks in the face of his raw force. Meanwhile, Wei-in, struggling to recover from the impact she had endured, realized that all they needed was a single critical hit. Jae Yoon resembled a war deity, struggling to break free from the chains that bound him. Yanju could hardly believe her eyes as she witnessed the chains gradually snapping one by one. He was too enraged and too powerful to be restrained by a legendary armament. They must nerf this man immediately. With each chain spear extracted from his body by hand, Jae Yoon fixed his gaze on the source of all these events, Kang Wu, who met his gaze with a smug expression, seemingly undeterred by the mere guild leader's display of strength. With his goal temptingly close, Jae Yoon embarked on his final charge. He had relinquished all reason, blindly propelling himself forward, just as Kang Wu had planned. The beast of a man raised his fist for the most savage punch yet, only to be halted by a blade penetrating his stomach. The damage was swift, causing his organs to crumble beneath the sword's impact. Baek Hwayun seized the long-awaited opportunity and delivered a critical strike from behind. She heaved a sigh of relief, certain that this would conclude the battle. The Mir Guild members lamented the sight of their leader, gravely stabbed in the back, while Yeom Hoon remained a disoriented mess in their grasp. Finally, Hwayun withdrew her blade, delivering the blow that would bring an end to the conflict. Jae Yoon strained to remain on his feet, yet even this proved to be an arduous challenge in his current condition. Despite being gravely wounded, he stood upright, trembling in pain. Wei-in and Yanju watched as he took a few staggering steps forward. Walking unsteadily, coughing in agony, he gave his all to reach the man he despised most at that very moment, Kang Wu. A feeble punch, devoid of any strength, aimed to strike the motionless demon king. But before he could even reach Kang Wu, he crumbled to his knees, his injuries finally overcoming him. Kang Wu, with a mocking smile, seized the Mir guild leader by his hair and posed a rhetorical question asking if Jae Yoon finally recognized who he truly was after all that had transpired. Destroying a rancored guild leader without moving a single inch? That's a flex. A few hours later, the Huarang court headquarters, Yan Ju and Kang Wu found themselves engaged in a conversation fraught with tension. Yan Ju demanded an explanation from Kang Wu about what he had done to Kim Young Hoon. Nonchalantly, he admitted to tweaking the scoundrel's memories as if it were a trivial matter. With a touch of arrogance, Kang Wu boasted about his diverse talents when questioned about his terrifying abilities. Yan Ju insisted that mere talent couldn't explain such powers and urged him to be honest. This time, he addressed her sincerely, using her name. He explained that she didn't need to know and understand everything about him. Their connection was simply an exchange of assistance. She helped him, and he returned the favor. He's a businessman through and through. The only thing that truly mattered was eradicating the malevolent organization that had inflicted so much damage on the guild leader. Kang was skillfully appealed to Yan Ju's anger, using it as a compelling reason to continue their cooperation. Extending his hand as a symbol of their renewed partnership, Kang Wu suggested they shake on it. In her thoughts, Yan Ju knew that she shouldn't have allowed the dangerous beast known as O Kang Wu to grow under her care. However, it was too late for regrets. She was in too deep, so she reached out her hand and they sealed their renewed arrangement with a firm handshake. And just like that, the leader of the Red Rose Guild forged a deal with the literal devil. Once a formidable figure, Kim Jae Yoon now found himself imprisoned at the Huarang Corp base camp. Various magical talismans sealed his immense powers as he faced interrogation. He faced a barrage of questions about his involvement with the demonic order. When did it all begin? What is a summon? Who is the mysterious figure behind the Crimson Mask? To these inquiries, he simply responded with a mocking grin. 
Baekhwayan's patience was wearing thin as the wily old man guarded his secrets closely. Kim Jae-yoon was no longer the CEO of Mir Electronics or the guild leader of Mir Guild. Now, he was nothing more than a criminal connected to the deranged cult. No company, no guild, no hose, no drip. When asked if he would spill his guts in the room, he insulted the Hwarang corpse, labeling them as mere dogs of the government. They were loyal mutts, obeying their master's commands. He challenged them to think about how many members of the assembly and the government were connected to him. He proclaimed himself as the puppeteer, holding their lives in his hands. Before he could unleash another insult at Huayun, a crimson chain struck him, once again. The legendary armament swiftly coiled around his neck, choking him. It was now Yanju's turn to interrogate him. The already injured old man struggled to breathe within the confines of his restraints. Yanju, driven by her hot-headedness, couldn't help but unleash her anger on the man responsible for the loss of her guild members' lives. Huayun hurriedly tried to calm her down aware that they couldn't afford to let the old man die. Jae Yoon laughed defiantly at his captors, warning them of their impending defeat. They couldn't fathom the true scale of the demonic order and its grand plans. As Yeonju's temper reached its peak, Kang Woo intervened, praising the two women for their interrogation skills and suggesting they step back for now. Let the master interrogator cook. It was his turn to face Kim Jae Yoon. The old man glared at him with contempt and anger. He warned Kang Wu that his intervention wouldn't change anything. He vowed never to tell Kang Wu anything. However, Kang Wu begged to differ. He insisted that eventually, Jae Yoon would have to tell him everything. Just as Jae Yoon was about to vehemently reject this idea, he casually mentioned that he could restore Young Hoon. Those words struck a chord deep within the heart of the caring father. Kang Wu presented Jae Yoon with an offer that he couldn't refuse. He proposed to restore his beloved son to his former self. The devil's temptation proved too hard to resist as Kang Wu urged Kim Jae Yoon to divulge all he knew about the demonic order. Almost as if he had gone truly insane, the old man began to laugh at this unexpected turn of events. He giggled like a child as Kang Wu finally broke his psyche. Even Yan Ju and Huayan watched this interaction with bated breath. Kim Jae Yoon vehemently cursed the cruel Kang Wu, wishing for him to descend into the depths of hell, no matter what. Kang Wu listened to this fiery curse. Thoroughly amused and coy, for he had already experienced that and more. Jae Yoon began to divulge everything he knew about the demonic order in a calm manner. It turned out that he had encountered a man eight months ago, confirmed to be the one behind the crimson mask. However, he remained unaware of the true identity lurking beneath that sinister cover. Taking note of this revelation, Kang Wu urged him to continue speaking. Jae Yoon confessed that he had received an offer to provide resources to the order for their ceremony. In return, they promised to transform him into a devil. Yanju listened in disbelief as Jae Yoon admitted to accepting such an outrageous deal. But the old man countered, claiming she spoke from ignorance, unaware of the true nature of devils. According to Jae Yoon, devils live eternally, as long as their necks remain intact and their hearts didn't explode. They could exist indefinitely without aging, their minds preserved while desires intensified. Huayim questioned why he believed in eternal life from such a dubious source. Jae Yoon revealed that it was because the demonic order had existed for over a thousand years, a revelation that caught everyone off guard. He continued, disclosing that their history stretched even further back. They had been silently expanding their forces and influence, hiding in the shadows all over the world. However, they had only recently become active. The Illuminati confirmed. Kang Wu contemplated this new information, realizing that the group's origins predated his initial assumptions. He understood that uprooting them would prove more challenging than he initially thought. Jae Yoon confessed to kidnapping players in pursuit of eternal life. Yan Ju berated him, considering him crazy for resorting to such insane measures just to claim to his own existence. The old man laughed at her sentiment and her lack of understanding. He explained that the physical body of a devil retained the mind while amplifying desires. This ensured a perpetual thirst for life, eternal youth, and unwavering vitality. He believed it to be the greatest existence. Rich people are always on the eternal life grind. Yanju refused to entertain the nonsensical ideas he championed. However, Kim Jae Yoon remained certain of the possibility. He was not one to gamble on uncertainties. Now they could understand how the demonic order was effectively recruiting members left and right. In Kang Wu's mind, he knew it was all nonsense. Living with an insatiable, burning desire wasn't pleasurable at all. He had experienced firsthand the agonizing torment that it brought, worse than anything else in the world. Now he realized that the scoundrels had no real understanding of the devils either. 
Jae Yoon continued his confession, revealing that he had supplied the order with sacrifices and allowed some of his guild members to accept demonic energy during the ceremonies. He explained that demonic energy was akin to mana but drawn from the depths of hell. When asked if he had embraced it himself, he admitted that he hadn't yet. According to the Crimson Mask, further preparations were required for his complete transformation into a devil. If he were to accept demonic energy immediately, he might turn into a mindless monster. He had only allowed his guild members to undergo the ceremony to gain instant power, using them as disposable pawns. When asked about the order's intended summoning, he confessed it was a demon. He didn't know the specifics of the summoning or its location. But the order believed that the weakening dimensional wall approximately a month ago had made it possible. Kang would listen to this revelation, his body covered in a cold sweat. Jae Yoon's words left him in a state of shock, as he realized that everything that was happening was a consequence of his actions. He reminisced about the day he crossed over to Earth, a pivotal moment when the demonic order's rise commenced, due to his unintended breaking of the Gaia system. Kang Wu couldn't hide his overwhelming guilt as he absorbed Jae Yoon's confessions. Searching for a glimmer of hope, he inquired about the status of the weakened dimensional wall, only to receive a resolute response from the old man. It was steadily deteriorating. The dire prospect of demons and monsters uniting, accompanied by the people from the continent of Eleanor, infiltrating Earth loomed large in Kang Wu's mind. Despite his internal turmoil, he tried to maintain a composed demeanor outwardly. His go-to coping mechanism kicked in. He chose not to fret over issues beyond his control. Instead, he resolved to prioritize dealing with the demonic order. Seeking information from Jae Yoon, he inquired about the national headquarters of the order and the possible whereabouts of the enigmatic Crimson Masked Man. Unfortunately, all the old man knew was that the location he was aware of might be irrelevant, as the order could have relocated elsewhere by now. It was plausible that they had already completed their preparations for the summoning ritual. Perplexed by the Order's motive to target Sihun when their preparations seemed complete, Jae Yoon had no answers to offer. Yanju found this ridiculous. In response, Jae Yoon simply stated that their organization operated on a performance-based system. This revelation triggered a realization in Kang Wu's mind. It indicated that there wasn't just one guild, like Mier, colluding with the Demonic Order. The scope of their involvement extended much further. In a dimly lit chamber, Crimson Masked Cultist reported the events concerning Kim Jae-yoon to a revered figure known as the Cardinal, his face adorned with a star-studded crimson mask. The Cardinal expressed disappointment in the Mir guild leader, expecting him to be of greater use, only to witness his swift defeat. The Cultists reassured him that they had enough support from other guilds, minimizing any delays in their grand scheme. Within the Cardinal's thoughts, the involvement of Jae-yoon, leading to his downfall, seemed incomprehensible. He attributed it to the influence of the man depicted in the orb recordings, Oh Kang Wu. Casually, he inquired about the progress of their plan. They confirmed the readiness of a demonic crystal containing suppressed demonic energy, possessing enough power to amplify the Cardinal's abilities and execute their plan. That looks like a juicy XP boost. Aware that the higher ups of the demonic order expected them to handle the task independently, the Cardinal urged his subordinates to expedite their plan, specifically mentioning the initiation of El Cuero. Outside the Huarang headquarters, the three collaborators convened. It seemed they were back at square one, requiring further investigation into other guilds. Nonetheless, the wealth of results and information they obtained marked a significant step in the right direction. Huayan relayed the news that the government intended to reward Kang Wu for the mission's success. They acknowledged his role in effectively dealing with the Mir guild, promising a reward. Kang Wu would half-jokingly expressed his hope that it wouldn't be a meaningless trophy or plaque but Hui Yin reassured him, dismissing any such concerns. She promised to contact him soon with details about the reward. Encouraging him to maintain high expectations, Hui Yin's unwavering enthusiasm suggested that the reward held considerable significance, even in the eyes of the usually stoic Beck Hui Yin. After concluding his business at Huarang Court Headquarters, Kang Wu hurriedly returned home to their apartment. As he stepped through the door, he was greeted by a concerned Sola and an eager Echidna. Echidna's eyes welled up with tears, having missed Kang Wu's presence since he began tailing Sihun for the mission. Apologetically, Kang Wu consoled his teary-eyed familiar, admitting that he had been absent for far too long. Feeling responsible for leaving her alone, Echidna even believed it was her fault, promising to behave better to prevent Kang Wu from leaving her again. With a reassuring embrace, Kang Wu insisted that it wasn't her fault at all, assuring her that he would never abandon her. However, he couldn't shake the guilt of leaving his young companion alone for an extended period. 
She had recently overcome her loneliness, and yet failed to provide her with constant care for a whole week. This reunion is too precious. Cradling his familiar in his arms, Kangwu reassured Sola that everything had been taken care of. He also apologized for not providing a more detailed explanation earlier. Understanding Kangwu's care and concern, she assured him that it didn't bother her. She firmly believed that he genuinely cared for them, rushing off any inconvenience cause. Kangwu was deeply touched by her profound understanding and support. Uncertain whether Kangwu had eaten at such a late hour, Sola took the initiative and prepared his favorite kimchi stew eliciting an even brighter smile from him. Observing the mouth-watering meal before him, Kangu couldn't help but reaffirm that Sola was truly an angel in his life. This is a ship that I would fight for. The following day, Kangu and the rest of the party gathered around Sihun's hospital bed, where he was recuperating. Kangu explained that as soon as he heard the rumors surrounding Sihun, he began monitoring him, anticipating the involvement of the demonic order. Curious about the origin of those rumors, Sihun asked, but Kangwu cleverly reasoned that the player's world was relatively small and with genuinely talented individuals in their party. Rumors were bound to surface. Internally, Kangwu justified his response, believing he hadn't completely lied to them. Sola, however, questioned why he hadn't informed them beforehand. Her pain expression conveyed her concerns that Kangwu was keeping secrets, which she understood were meant to protect them. Still, she feared they were growing distant due to his increasing secrecy. Sincerely apologizing for causing worry to Sola and the entire party, Kangwu took full responsibility for his actions. He acknowledged that she had every right to voice her feelings. Deep in his heart, he considered Sola as family, and he had let her down. He earnestly declared that he couldn't guarantee such incidents wouldn't happen again, but he would do his utmost to alleviate their worries. Sola mumbled something under her breath, catching Kangwu's attention. With determination, she requested him to speak to her more casually, just as he did with Che Yanju. Surprised by her sensitivity to such small details, Kangwu hadn't expected her to be bothered by it. On the other side of the bed, the rest of the team observed their interaction, treating it as if they were witnessing an Oscar-worthy romantic comedy movie. They're just like me, for real. Timidly, their fingers brushed and Kangwu timidly addressed Sola in a more casual manner. Blushing, she insisted that she felt more comfortable with this approach. Growing impatient with their exchange, Ikidna positioned herself between them, playfully urging Kangwu to peel a fruit that was already peeled. Returning to the main topic, Sihun apologized for interrupting the moment, as he got something to ask Kangwu. He inquired about the fate of the father and son duo. Kangwu casually stated that they would be condemned to rot in jail for the rest of their lives, guaranteeing that there was no possibility of their release. Their actions were unforgivable, regardless of any amount of money they could offer. The Mir Electronics Company had also been shaken, due to this incident. While unintentional, Kangwu confessed that he was aware of Sihun's and his mother's debt problem, resulting from Kim Jae-yoon's interference, assuring Sihun that they would be adequately compensated. He added that he would use his influence to arrange for his mother's transfer to an advanced facility. Sihun's spirit soared upon hearing this. The weight on his shoulders seemed to dissipate, and tears welled up as he wholeheartedly thanked Kangwu. Witnessing Kangwu's actions, the other party members were deeply moved. Sihun gratefully regarded Kangwu as his personal savior. He expressed that meeting Kangwu had been the luckiest moment of his life. Like Taesu, he pledged to serve Kangwu as his honorary older brother. Sihun's heartfelt vulnerability only intensified Kangwu's guilt for his previous actions. Witnessing Sihun's unwavering conviction, Kangwu found himself at a loss for words. Since he was intent on treating Kangwu as an older brother, Kangwu would just address him casually as well. With that in mind, he mustered the courage to reveal something he had been hiding from everyone all this time something that he could finally share with utmost sincerity. As rumors had suggested, his first awakening had unlocked a special ability, one of extraordinary caliber known as the Descendant of the Martial Arts God, an awe-inspiring SSS rank power. Though limited by his current low level, it held the promise of accessing the incredible abilities of the Martial God, Chun Tae Wan. The party was taken aback by this revelation, coming from their own swordsman. Kang Wu, however, remained unperturbed. Having known about this, since their very first hunt. Steven proceeded to share that his awakening message as a player differed from everyone else's. It informed him that, due to a malfunction in the Gaia system, he had been chosen as the protector. This statement piqued Kang Wu's interest, as even the accomplished ranker Cha Yan Ju had never heard of the Gaia system. When asked about the date of his awakening, Steven simply responded, May 22nd. Sola noted that this was also the day she and Kang Wu had met inside the gate. 
Now Sir admits Sihun's awakening was the cause of the Gaia system malfunction that day. Kang Wu realized that Sihun might hold the key to restoring the system if the Protector had appeared to rectify his own actions. So Kang Wu is the virus and Sihun is McAfee. Yun Bi praised him as the hero of the world, but he modestly cringed at the designation. Kang Wu had already been convinced that Sihun, his subordinate, was the main character of his own story. However, this newfound information made it clear that Sihun held far greater importance than Kang Wu had initially imagined. In his twisted mind, this further affirmed that making Sihun his subordinate had been a wise decision. Rising to his feet, Kang Wu advised Sihun to rest until fully recovered, announcing his departure from the group. But Sihun, filled with eagerness, grabbed Kang Wu's shirt, seemingly reluctant to see him go. Kang Wu, not wanting to disturb Sihun's rest, remained confused of the unfolding events at that very moment. With sincerity in his eyes, the handsome young man pleaded for Kang Wu to stay just a little longer. Are we changing to a vastly different genre? An inkling of the situation began to form in Kang Wu's mind. Even Echidna expressed her desire to accompany him if he were to leave. It was said that subordinates and familiars naturally gravitated toward their masters. However, Kang Wu couldn't shake off the uneasiness he felt regarding Sihun. His fight-or-flight response kicked in as he swiftly decided to leave the hospital, jumping through the balcony of the highest floor, eager to escape from something he wanted no part in. Once again, they found themselves at the S-rank gate, embarking on another arduous battle. Ferocious giant ogres snarled and charged, fixated on their target. Today, it was Echidna's turn to face these savage beasts. With a swift motion, she cast her formidable Dark Storm spell. The dark magical winds sliced through the ogre's bodies like an onslaught of powerful blades. Following his familiar's devastating initiation, Kangwu appeared out of nowhere, wielding the authority of the Iron Axe, an imposing battle axe with an ominous hue and razor-sharp edges. Infusing his already formidable weapon with an additional power, Kangwu coated the blade of his massive battle axe with the cold essence of the authority of Frost. This deadly combination granted him the powerful S-rank skill, Leviathan. In a sweeping motion, he unleashed his Leviathan, slashing both giant ogres simultaneously. Massive wounds opened on the monster's stomachs, emanating a demonic chill that coursed through their colossal bodies. Kangwu and Echidna swiftly shattered the frozen ogres, earning valuable experience points and raising Kangwu's level by one, wiping the sweat from his brow. He grumbled about the demanding the grind really is. Having reached level 50, Kangwu unlocked his sixth awakening filling him with anticipation to unveil his newly acquired special ability. However, the ability's name and rank were shrouded in mystery, marked only by question marks. It was stated that the ability would only be fully revealed upon reaching the realm of extreme demonic delay. Dejected by yet another ability he couldn't utilize, Kang Wu felt a sense of hopelessness. He had no clue about the conditions required for extreme demonic delay, leaving him unsure of how to proceed. The clueless Echidna was quick to approach her master, as she worries that the disappointed Kangwu might be too tired from the fight. With a bitter laugh, Kangwu reassured his familiar that he was fine. Just then, a communication orb in his pocket illuminated, indicating Sala's call from outside the gate. Sala updated Kangwu on the progress of their move, mentioning that they were almost done, and he could come home. In a grand high-rise apartment complex, the trio found themselves inside their new unit. Sola couldn't help but feel a bit out of place in such luxurious surroundings, while the Echidna reveled in the newfound spaciousness, delighted with her new nest. Kangwu assured Sola that he wouldn't want to live in such a vast apartment alone, emphasizing that they were family. Timidly, Sola once again expressed her reservations about accepting such extravagance from Kangwu. He reasoned that the Red Rose Guild was covering all the expenses, so she needn't worry. However, the mention of the Red Rose Guild immediately brought Yanju to Sola's mind, leaving her feeling gloomy. She couldn't fathom how Chai Yanju could afford to lavish such luxuries on Kangwu so effortlessly, fueling her frustration. The gap in her level at this aspect was undeniable. As Echidna inquired about their plans for the following day, Kangwu revealed that they had no scheduled activities and were free. Sola's interest was piqued. Shyly, Echidna proposed doing something together. Considering that Kangwu has free time, he agreed, glad to finally have the opportunity to enjoy leisurely activities with his lively little dragon. Sola chimed in, expressing her desire to join them as well. The next day dawned, and the trio set off for the mall. Sola dressed Echidna in adorable clothes and costumes, relishing their joyous moments together. They took numerous pictures, capturing their precious memories. Kangwu couldn't help but smile, watching the endearing bond between Sola and Echidna grow stronger. 
He was initially worried that Echidna would shy away from other people and only depend on him. But with Sola around, she's adapting to human life with no problem. His free day unexpectedly turned into an exhausting ordeal. Little did he know that accompanying them on a shopping trip meant assuming the role of their designated bag carrier, a laborious task he hadn't anticipated. Bro is more exhausted from carrying bags than from fighting demons. Kang Wu, laden with shopping bags all over his body, gazed upwards and beheld a sight resembling heaven itself. Unbelievably, within the mall's food court, he discovered the freedom to indulge in any culinary delight his heart desired. Sola found Kang Wu's childlike wonder endearing, as if he were a kid stepping into a food court for the very first time. She explained that while it may not be an extraordinary place, it still offered a diverse array of delectable dishes. Kang Wu's eyes widened at the sight of every imaginable type of food being prepared, instantly captivating him with the brilliance of the food court. If this is an ad for a food court, it's working. Amidst the whirlwind of recent events, Kang Wu had almost forgotten the purpose behind his return to Earth. All he desired was to immerse himself in endless play and savor every mouth-watering delicacy possible. With great enthusiasm, he proceeded to order everything on the menu, from item number 1 to 168, even going so far as to add 10 bowls of kimchi stew from each establishment serving the dish. Sola struggled to remain in Kang Wu's overwhelming excitement. Finally, their orders arrived, presenting an impressive spread of culinary delights before the trio. Kang Wu resembled a ravenous dog, eagerly preparing to embark on a feast of epic proportions. Naturally, he began with his favorite, the kimchi stew. Taking the first bite, he quickly realized that it didn't quite match the exquisite flavor of Sola's home-cooked version. However, what a lack in quality, made up for in sheer variety. In a burst of culinary experimentation, he grabbed a slice of pizza and dunked it into the kimchi stew like a madman. To his surprise, the combination proved even more delicious than anticipated. Loki kind of wanted to try this. This discovery spurred Kang Wu to explore further flavor combinations on the table. Sola had made a wise decision to shield the young, impressionable echidna from witnessing Kang Wu's indiscriminate mixing and matching. She couldn't allow the child to witness such a culinary travesty. Kang Wu savored a spoonful of his self-created medley, reveling in the delightful amalgamation of flavors. At that moment, a voice of enthusiasm resonated from afar, expressing admiration for Kang Wu's adventurous eating at the food court. The voice belonged to none other than Korea's top-ranked player, the leader of Han No Guild, Baek Kang Yun. He greeted Kang Wu with genuine warmth, as if they were long-lost brothers reunited. When asked about the unexpected presence of such a prominent figure in a ramen mall food court, Baek Kang Yun skillfully redirected the conversation, urging Kang Wu to speak casually. He stated that he had good news to share and encouraged them to converse comfortably. According to what he had heard, Kang Wu was considered a rookie associated with the Red Rose Guild. Kang Wu corrected him, mentioning that he didn't belong to the guild entirely, they were merely cooperating. With this clarification, the conversation became much easier. Bet Kang Yun looked Kang Wu straight in the eye, addressing him sincerely as a brother. The nation's top ranked player earnestly extended an invitation for Kang Wu to join his guild. He boldly offered a sum of 5 billion won, along with a car and a house. He promised to provide Kang Wu with everything he currently possessed and more. To sweeten the deal, he even proposed an executive position from the get-go. Casually opening a can of soda, Kang Wu calmly replied that while he had high expectations, the offer fell short. Kang Yun was taken aback by Kang Wu's audacity, but his interest was further piqued. He burst into laughter, amused that such a lavish offer failed to sway the rookie. Directly confronting Kang Wu, he inquired about the conditions that would satisfy him. However, Kang Wu had no intention of working under anyone at the moment, regardless of the terms laid before him. That's when the Han Nol Guild leader presented a counteroffer. If Kang Wu joined their guild, he would bestow upon him a single legendary equipment free of charge. Legendary equipment were exceptionally rare items that could not be simply purchased with money. Such equipment was forged from materials obtained exclusively from boss monsters in s rank gates or higher. Furthermore, once the bond between the equipment and its owner was established, no one else could use it. Legendary armaments often rejected potential owners due to the demanding requirements for the bond to form, making them difficult to obtain even with tremendous effort. Most importantly, these armaments maximize all the user's stats. With this incredibly generous offer, Kang Yeon was pleased to observe Kang Wu's growing interest. While Kang Wu found the offer tempting, he ultimately refused, as the equipment's inability to enhance his demonic energy rendered it meaningless to him. 
Kang Yun simply laughed it off as he had anticipated such a response. He rose to take his leave, sliding his contact card towards Kang Wu, just in case he changed his mind. Before departing, he playfully mixed another dish into Kang Wu's already unrecognizable meal, claiming that it embodied the true essence of flavor. The Hanno Guild leader cheerfully bid them farewell, while Sola did her best to shield Echidna from witnessing such appalling food etiquette. Kang Wu stared at his plate, unable to shake off his intrigue toward the enigmatic figure known as Beck Kang Yen. He does have immaculate bro vibes. A few hours later, at the headquarters of the Huarang Corps, Yan Ju and Kang Wu found themselves engaged in another conversation. Kang Wu shared his encounter with the top ranked player, and Yan Ju couldn't fathom why he would turn down a once in a lifetime opportunity. Kang Wu simply didn't wish to be under someone's command at the moment. Yan Ju struggled to comprehend just how unconventional Kang Wu's thinking was. Continuing the discussion, Kang Wu inquired if she had any insider information about the top ranked Beck Kang Yun. Given their frequent interactions as leaders of top guilds, she naturally possessed some knowledge. She stated that based on Kang Yun's demeanor alone, he was a wild card. However, Kang Wu yearned for juicier rumors about the renowned ranker. Yan Ju recollected a time when Kang Yun had become enraged. It happened during the World Ranker evaluations, where he was anticipated to become the first potential world ranker in the country. Yet, he suffered a tragic defeat at the hands of another ranker, and was subsequently disqualified. When asked who had bested Kang Yun, she revealed that it was a Japanese ranker named Fujimoto Ryoma, the owner of the mythical weapon known as Suzano's Eye. Following that defeat, the media's opinion of Korea's number one player had become less favorable. As far as Yanju knew, that was the sole rumor surrounding him. Kang Wu pondered whether he would face any backlash for rejecting Kang Yun's offer, but Yanju assured him that the man was not the type to hold grudges. If anything, Kang Yun would simply laugh it off. Finally, the duo arrived at their destination, where they were warmly greeted by a smiling Wei Yun. She invited them into a secure facility, explaining that during their investigation of the Mir Guild, they had stumbled upon an item yet to establish a bond with anyone. Wei Yun had fought against resistance from higher ups to secure this item, knowing it would be the perfect reward. Kang Wu's eyes landed on the Black Pearl Coat, a legendary ranked piece of equipment with exceptional defensive stats. It possessed a remarkable special function called Kraken's Wrath, a skill that doubled all stats for one minute with a two-hour cooldown. This stylish trench coat exuded both battle readiness and fashion. This is the much-awaited drip upgrade. Wei Yin and Yanju privately discussed their doubts regarding the skill's effectiveness, but they acknowledged that if a player with inherent stats wore it, the story would be different. Kang Wu found himself twistedly in love at first sight with this perfect item that just landed on his lap. Yanju didn't expect that Kang Wu was an inherent stat user, but considering his monstrous growth, it's nothing strange. Out of all the legendary equipment out there, this is the best of the best when it comes to inherent stat users. He truly loves this beautiful equipment. He thanked Wei Yun sincerely as he promised to continue actively uprooting the demonic order. She's also glad that the legendary equipment has met the right owner. He didn't waste a second as he equipped the coat. The dapper-looking Kang Wu was notified that the imprinting ceremony for the Black Pearl Coat has started. It quickly recognized him as a suitable player as his stats were scanned to optimize the coat's status effects. It identified his inherent demonic energy and increased it by five. The imprinting ceremony was completed without a fuss as Kang Wu felt a new surge of massive strength in his body. The drip is secured. When asked how it feels, he greedily asked if he could have 10 more of this armament. It turns out that legendary equipment has a 5 item cap, anything more than that will be invalidated. Kang Wu was extremely pleased with the massive loot that he just scored. He's all smiles in front of the two ladies. Yanju then proposed to check just how much stronger he has gotten. With a serious expression, she challenged Kang Wu to a fight. Hui and brought them to a state of the art combat room boasting that it would not budge under normal battle circumstances as it was especially built to withstand that. The two calmly took their positions as Yanju wonders just how powerful Kang Wu truly is. She thought back to his battle with his commander-in-chief and she knew that his strength was not just a matter of monstrous growth. She knows that he has something special that surpasses levels and stats. She needs to use this opportunity to identify what that is. Kang Wu was pleased with this arrangement as Yan Ju is the perfect partner to test out how strong he has truly become. And he's also curious as to how much this three-way alliance will provide for him. They readied their stance and as soon as Kuei signaled the start, Kang Wu charged ruthlessly with his fist ready to land the first blow. Yan Ju unsurprisingly dodged to the side in a skillful manner. She swiftly readied her own fist for a brutal counterattack, 
but Kang was simply dodged just like how she did. She lets out a stealthy knee strike coming from below, but he caught it with both hands effectively. Yanju unleashed another punch aimed squarely at Kang Wu's face, but it was met with a cross block. They are starting this battle with a contest of close combat skills. This type of battle is annoying Kang Wu. With a quick slit to the side, he readies a punch that barely grazed the guild leader's face. But the punch was a feint, and his true target was her hat. He pulled down her signature hat as he remarks that this will only get in their way. Yanju angrily responded with a punch as she activates the legendary bloodthirsty chains. It seems like she's not fooling around with her strikes now. She remarked that since he's not a regular player, regular combat does not suit him. The bloodthirsty chains were proving to be quite tricky to handle for Kangwu. She brandished it forcefully and swiped through the reinforced walls. She's like a psychopath waving the destructive chains around as Kangwu watched her strikes carefully. State of the art walls, by the way. With a downward swing of the shackles, Kangwu was pushed back as he activated the authority of Sky to counteract the force. Without hesitation, he activated his newfound equipment's special ability, the Krokhem's Wrath, increasing his demonic energy by five. The unfazed Yanju materialized even more chains as she charged towards the powered up Kangwu. He calmly assessed her rampaging attacks as Hui was beginning to freak out with regards to this supposed spar. Kangwu flew close to the walls as Yanju chased him, with countless missing chain stabs. He deactivated the authority of the sky falling into the ground, only to turn it on again to bait out a wide chain swing. She hurriedly tried to gather defenses as the in flight Kangwu rushed towards her relentlessly this time around. With much more potent demonic energy, he slid amongst the sharp chains of the powerful Rancor. When he got inside his striking distance, he activated the authority of explosion in point-blank range. A massive detonation sent Yanju and her chains away. The burst cleared out and she expects Kangwu to charge, but he was already behind her. With a resounding clap, he commanded the authority of sound. The whole compound shook in his booming ability. Yanju and even the referee Huiyin felt as if their eardrums were about to burst with how loud the clap was. He didn't let the chance go to waste as he rushed for the final strike at the stunned Yanju. He called out to the authority of Thousand as he resembled a demonic god, with how concentrated his demonic energy is. To ensure victory, he even activated the authority of destruction in the same fist. Yanju knew that she could not dodge this time around. She needs to do everything in her power to defend from the monstrous strike that Kangwu has just loaded. When Kangwu's strike got close to her, she resigned herself as she's aware that there's no way in hell she can defend against such mighty force. Kangwu just unleashed his skill, destroying the sky. To everyone's surprise, he redirected his fists in the last second. Yanju's chains dematerialize as she falls with her legs weak. Kangwu just punched a gargantuan hold behind Yanju. She's looking at a genuine monster in the form of a man. With the conclusion of their intense duel, the reign of the Krukhen's wrath also came to an end. Kang Wu experienced an exhilaration he hadn't felt in ages, finally comprehending the obsession people had with legendary rank equipment. To think that he could defeat one of the top rankers in the nation in under a minute, both he and Yan Zhu could hardly believe it. Extending his hand to the defeated Yan Zhu, Kang Wu attributed his victory to his newfound legendary equipment. As she accepted his hand, rising to her feet, an entertaining thought crossed her mind. Perhaps Kang Wu was more than human. He playfully dismissed the notion, reminding her to be grateful they were not enemies. Engrossed in their post-battle banter, their amusement was abruptly interrupted by the stern Huiyin, who scolded them for obliterating the outrageously expensive sparring room. In an instant, millions of dollars of civilian taxes went up in smoke. That was an expensive punch. Embarrassed and nervous, the duo faced the magnitude of the destruction they had caused. Huiyin continued to chastise them as if they were unruly children unable to contain their hyper-energy. Huiyin reported the damages to her superiors, while Kangwu and Yanju shifted the blame onto each other for the wreckage. Absolute brother-sister energy from these two. Already pondering how he could scrape together the funds to repay the damages, Kangwu contemplated the idea of hunting and selling high-ranking monster mana stones. However, he quickly dismissed it as too time-consuming. That's when a brilliant idea struck him legendary rank ingredients from formidable monsters. Proposing a simple plan to the two ladies, Kang Wu suggested they embark on a hunt for El Cuero. He was referring to the boss monster of the s rank gate, a creature of immense power. However, this boss mob was no ordinary adversary. Residing in the lake of Suwon's s rank gate, El Cuero had eluded capture by every player thus far. Its aquatic habitat made close-range attacks nearly impossible, and its exceptional magic resistance and skillful underwater hiding made long-range assaults a daunting challenge. 
subjugating that was widely regarded as an insurmountable feat. It's a monster hunter arc, not only was successfully hunting it bordering on the impossible, but the monster also didn't guarantee dropping legendary loot. Kangwu argued that luck could be on their side for that part. Moreover, the quest held significance beyond monetary gain. It could potentially unlock his level restriction. As players advanced in levels, they encountered two formidable walls, the ultimate effort at level 59 and the ultimate talent at level 89. The common method to break through these bottlenecks was to defeat a powerful boss monster and push beyond one's limits. Deeply considering Kangwu's proposal, Yanju, who had also reached her ultimate talent wall, realized that her level 89 had just been defeated by Kangwu's level 59. Deciding to join the mission, she emphasized that the two of them alone wouldn't stand a chance. Kangwu confidently declared that he already had a plan in mind. All they needed was a skilled close-range class to execute it, prompting Huiyun to proudly volunteer herself for the hunt. Since she was the one who had brought them to this point, she felt partly responsible for the situation. Curious about Kangwu's plan and the necessity of a close-range damage dealer against El Cuero, Weyun couldn't help but inquire. Thus, the party consisting of the three of them, along with Echidna, will embark on the hunt. Kangwu mused that another close-range class would solidify his plan further, prompting Weyun to call out to him. Realizing they required an additional combatant with close-range prowess, she knew someone perfect for the job. Inside the beautiful s rank gate, the serene backdrop provided a stark contrast to Kangwu, wielding the authority of Blade and slashing through a giant ogre with a kidnap providing support from behind. Kangwu's masterful movements left the giant ogres utterly bewildered. As he dispatched another foe, he finally reached level 59. As expected, he received a notification that his progress was now restricted. Having heard tales of talented players bypassing this restriction, he couldn't help but feel a tinge of disappointment that he hadn't managed the same feat. Sometimes he's just not that guy. It was at this moment that Yan Ju and Hui An arrived at his hunting grounds, assuring them that he hadn't exerted much strength while grinding giant ogres. Kang Wu put their worries to rest. Hui An formally introduced the final member of their hunting party, a lively, blonde man named Gu Yunmo, the captain of Huarang Squad's second unit. Casually introducing himself, Kang Wu assessed the captain. It became apparent that Yunmo was on par with Hui An in terms of strength, employing a dual sword fighting style. This man might just fit the plan perfectly. He was impressed by Kangwu's ability to dispatch giant ogres effortlessly, despite being a rookie. He also inquired why a young girl like Echidna ventured into such perilous territory. In response, Kangwu introduced the timid Echidna as his summoned familiar. Wei-An assured Yunmo that she would fill him in on Kangwu's story later, but for now, all he needed to know was that Kangwu and Yanju possessed comparable strength. The revelation hit Yunmo like a bolt of lightning. Learning that a player who had awakened only two months ago was as formidable as one of the nation's top rankers, he observed Kangwu and Huiyan's casual conversation, his emotions becoming increasingly complicated. Taking Kangwu aside, he approached him with a bashful question, inquiring about the nature of his relationship with Beck Huiyan. Kangwu assured him that it was nothing special. It was evident to everyone that the spirited young man harbored an immense crush on the ice-cold Huiyan. I ship this. Yanju, eager to get back to business, urged them to assume their positions as El Cuero would soon make its appearance. Kangwu responded that they need not move, as they were already in the designated spot. However, they were currently in the territory of the Rock Giants. While these monsters were docile, it appeared they couldn't utilize them as bait. Ironically, these colossal creatures formed the cornerstone of their entire plan. And so, Kangwu commenced his briefing. Enormous nautical chains, anchored at the end, coiled around the sandy beach of the vast lake. With these prepared chains, Kangwu's signal to initiate the plan was imminent. Are they going full pirate mode? Partially submerged in the lake, gathering demonic energy, he prepared to execute the world's first El Cuero hunt. Stomping on the water's surface, Kangwu unleashed the authority of sound waves. The sonic force reverberated throughout the lake, reaching a sinister figure lurking in its depths. For a moment, the lake fell into tranquility, interrupted by a colossal wave surging upward, shattering its peace. Kangwu knew that the monster was coming. The sinister figure, charging at blinding speed, emerged from the depths. 